What do you do when the sun turns wrong? When light, which once represented life, joy, and warmth, becomes a symbol of death and destruction? Do you hide inside? Shutter the windows, keep out the light by any means necessary? Do you retreat underground, where the sun's rays cannot penetrate, burrowing into the dark and the cold? Do you simply give yourself to it, accepting that there is no escaping something so vast, so far reaching as sunlight itself, and allow yourself to be lost in the end of all things? We've covered this possibility before, SCP-001, When Day Breaks, or SD Locke's proposal. It's difficult to know what any given person might do in such harrowing circumstances. After all, we have always learned to love the light and fear the darkness. It turns our very understanding of reality upside down to have that paradigm shifted, the dark becoming safety and the light becoming death. The source of all life on Earth, of all warmth, transforming in an instant from the sun as we know it to an Apollyon-class SCP that melts all living organisms that cross into its gaze. But what about a being that has always feared the light, something that prioritizes solitude and never ever wants to be seen? How might it live out those darkened days? Today we're taking a look at what happens when Daybreak meets a familiar face, even if a constantly hidden one. SCP-096 SCP-096, or the Shy Guy, is something of a celebrity around here. It is a humanoid creature with long distended arms, pale skin, and a jaw that can open four times wider than an ordinary human's. There is only one thing above all else that this entity desires, for no one to see its face. When someone views its face, it flies into an uncontrollable rage and seems to have no other option but to destroy the person who has seen it. So, it is unlikely that a creature so intent on solitude would be in much danger from the transformed sun. In fact, it might even be a positive thing, and for some time it was. With so many human beings gone, reduced to gelatinous masses with no desire but to slither around in the ghoulish sunlight and merge with one another, there were fewer people to observe his face than ever. He could stay inside and know with almost complete certainty that no one would come to bother him. No one was coming to look at him, and there were no more visitors, researchers poking and prodding that might sneak a look at his face. And so he stayed there, in the room that had served as his containment unit before the world turned upside down. The masses of flesh that once were humans did not concern him, as they never looked at his face. All he did was stay in his room and never go outside. The outside frightened him terribly, though he was not concerned with the deadly sunlight or the possibility of it melting him as it had so many others. He was much more afraid that someone, some unlikely survivor clinging to their original life, might look at him, that they might see his face. That was simply too distressing to risk. He would much rather stay alone in his old cell, weeping softly in the shadows. One day, though we couldn't say how many days after the end of things it had been, he was weeping alone in his former cell. The days blurred together, spent the same way, and time had lost much of its meaning. Through the echoing sound of his sobs and the sloshing sounds of the creatures outside, a woman's voice cut through. It was faint but he could make out what she was saying. She was calling out for help, asking if anyone had any food or fresh water. The sound was getting louder, closer, accompanied by the disconcerting thump of her footsteps. She was coming down the hall, as much as it could be called a hall anymore. She was coming towards his room to disrupt his miserable peace. He heard her steps cross the threshold of his room, and her voice broke into a terrified scream. No doubt at the unexpected sight of a pale, naked creature weeping in the corner of what she expected to be an empty room. Startled by the first loud sound he'd heard in a long time, in a world that had mostly been silent since the initial outpouring of agonized screams had faded into the soft slap of flesh and slime on the ground, he turned around. He shouldn't. Ordinarily, he wouldn't. But he couldn't stop himself. There he saw a woman. Wide eyes filled with tears, face streaked with dirt, a small child next to her holding her hand and clinging to her leg. Just as he saw the woman, 
She saw him. She saw his face. Anger boiled over inside of him, and he let out a scream, wild, primal, and filled with inhuman rage. She could not be looking at him, seeing his face. He couldn't let her. The woman ran with the child in tow, panicked by the wild roar and the sight of him standing upright before her. The anger faded as she left his sight, making her way down the hall into the stairs. But then he remembered. She had seen his face. He could not let her leave. It was time to do something he never thought he'd have to do again. Hunt. His heightened senses picked up the sound of muffled footsteps coming up through the floor below him. She was downstairs just beneath the floor where he was standing. His instincts kicked in, and his body moved almost of its own accord. He lifted his long, long arms above his head and drove his hands down into the floor. It was weakened by the ravages of the elements and time, and crumbled under his unnatural strength. He dug his claws into the plaster, tearing it apart and cracking it into pieces. He pushed his claws in deeper and deeper until he could feel them breaking through the other side. He pulled the floor apart until the hole was wide enough to fit through, then dropped down to the room below. He spotted the woman's back, fleeing through the door just as he landed. She was getting away. He tore after her, ripping through concrete and steel, destroying everything in his path in a mad dash for the object of his rage. He had to catch her. She could not be allowed to leave. She looked over her shoulder at him, her face a mask of pure terror. She knew, just as he knew, that there was no escape in sight. In his single-minded obsession and her desperation to escape from him, neither of them noticed that she had run so far and so carelessly that she was now outside the building. She had crossed from the shadows into the harsh light of the sun. The woman's eyes widened in grim understanding of her fate. He could only watch helplessly as her body began to succumb to the vicious rays. Almost instantly, she began to melt. As it was closest to the sun, her head was the first to go. Her nose drooped like hot wax, dripping as it went until it slumped off her face and landed on the ground with a sickening splash. Her eyes were next, popping out of their sockets and hanging loose and limp on her cheeks and dangling from sinewy strands. She tried in vain to stuff them back into place, but they squished in her hands like overripe fruit. She attempted to run into the comparative safety of the ruined building, but her feet were already beginning to spread out onto the street, melting into a sticky red smear on the pavement. Her legs crumbled beneath her, and she collapsed to the ground, her face leaving a trail of gelatinous flesh as it landed. She tried uselessly to drag herself along the ground back into the darkness, but her arms were melting into the dirt, mixing with it into a horrible red mud. She let out a last scream of agony, but the sound turned to a thick gurgle as her lips fused together and her mouth melted into nothingness. He watched it all, sobbing and roaring in frustration. She was gone, and he would never get the satisfaction of ending her. The infernal sun had stolen her from him. Now, she was nothing but a wet shadow, like the rest of the humans had become long ago. He heard the sound of a soft sob behind him, a tiny human voice. He turned, looking for the source. There was the little girl. He had almost forgotten about her. She was calling out for her mother and crying, and she was looking right at him, right at his face. He waited for the anger to overtake him, but instead, there was nothing. Why wasn't he angry? She was looking at his face, so why? Then he realized. Her eyes were on him, but she did not see him. She was blind. She approached the creature, her arms outstretched following the sound of his crying. She touched his hand with her own tiny fingers, so small and fragile, and asked, Mommy? Then he felt something he had never felt before tenderness, care, a desire to protect this tiny, innocent being. It was the first time he had ever felt warm, ever felt anything but sadness, anger, or fear. Overcome with this softness, he wrapped his arms around the child and hugged her close. She hugged him back tightly, and the room went quiet as they both stopped crying. From that day on, they became a family of sorts. They lived together and he took care of her, 
She didn't know what he looked like and had no idea he might be something to fear. To her, he was safety. He was home. For the first time in his long, awful life, he felt like a human instead of a monster. He would scavenge food for her, bring her fresh water, lay down stolen blankets and pillows so she would have a soft place to rest. He even found her a ratty, worn teddy bear amongst the rubble and gave it to her as a gift. She clutched it to her chest and thanked him, and for once his tears were those of joy. In this cursed world, they had found something like happiness in one another. He knew he would protect her, no matter what. Then one day, everything changed. The creature and the little girl were playing in the abandoned site, making up little games together, when he took a break to look out at the window and monitor their surroundings. Outside, the evil red sun waited. When he turned back, the little girl was gone. One of the shadowy creatures, once human, was imitating his voice to lure her away. He could hear it in the distance, and her tiny footsteps following it. He chased after her, the only thing he had ever loved, and saw her just as she stepped out into the light. She screamed as one of her arms began to melt in the light, and he knew what he had to do. He grabbed her and pulled her back inside, using his body to shield her from the horrible rays. As he wept over her, his tears stopped her body from melting any further, but his body continued to fall apart. It was too late for him. He ran as far as he could. Once he transformed, he did not want to end up hurting the girl. He ran until his legs melted away and he could not run anymore. He had reached the shoreline and stared out at the ocean, unable to move anymore. He screamed a final time in agony, in heartbreak, in mourning for the happiness he had finally found and now would lose. But at least he knew, as his eyes melted away and he was nearly gone, that the girl would be safe. And then he was gone and the world was quiet. Think back to your childhood and ask yourself, what was the most pain you've ever felt while growing up? As we develop, our understanding of pain evolves according to our different experiences. The older we get, the injuries we suffered as children, like a scraped knee or a bee sting, rarely cause us the same level of distress as they used to. Of course, when you are young and unfamiliar with sensations of pain, what you really need in that moment straight after you've fallen off your bike or tripped playing soccer is someone to pick you back up and give your sore spot a kiss. Perhaps you even need a bowl of warm soup to comfort you. Luckily for you, SCP-348 is exactly that. While many of the anomalies held in containment by the SCP Foundation have earned the Euclid or infamous Keter class designations, SCP-348 is one of the few considered to be safe, both in the sense it poses no containment risk and in that it wouldn't hurt a fly. It is neither an ancient eldritch abomination from another dimension spreading its influence in our world through mimetic stimuli, nor is it a recording of a basketball game in which all the players and spectators are trapped inside. It isn't an indestructible limb-generating reptile or a towering winged being wielding a flaming sword and guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. To put it simply, SCP-348 is a bull, a white ceramic bull, the kind you would find almost anywhere in the world. It may even look indistinguishable from the one in your kitchen cabinet. Of course, SCP-348 is hardly as ordinary as it outwardly appears to be, and it certainly isn't the only inanimate object that the Foundation keeps safely stored away. The key thing that differentiates SCP-348 from most other anomalies is how genuinely harmless it is. Its anomalous properties do not cause injury to any individual that interacts with it, nor does this bowl have any adverse effects on the world around it. SCP-348 cannot bend or reshape reality. It does not cause the person eating from it to have premonitions of their own death, and using it certainly does not manifest a contract-making entity at the opposite side of the table. So what makes this bowl in any way anomalous? What about it categorizes it as an SCP and not just a harmless piece of fine crockery? Well, why don't we start with how SCP-348 was first discovered? Some time ago, the SCP Foundation was made aware of rumors surrounding a child living in an unknown part of the world. According to the intelligence gathered by the Foundation, this child seemed to possess some sort of healing ability 
or at least this is what rumors suggested. Upon further investigation, the source of these so-called remarkable recovery abilities wasn't the child, but appeared to come from a small ceramic bowl, which we now know as SCP-348. This is not to say that the bowl has any inherently supernatural healing properties, and it doesn't impart any regenerative power to those that eat from it either. It does heal in a certain sense, but not in the way you're probably imagining. When the SCP Foundation recovered SCP-348, there were no markings on it indicating where the bowl came from or who it was manufactured by. The only visually distinct details worthy of note were flowery patterns that appeared to be hand-painted around both the inside and outside of SCP-348. The ceramic surface also bore the Chinese letters Shang Xinyi, which translates to the phrase, thinking of you. The child that first discovered it found the ceramic bowl in the attic of their home. The child's parents were both full-time workers and seemed to be somewhat neglectful of their child, although they refused to comment on this. But according to the findings of the SCP Foundation, the child had come to rely on SCP-348. Deciding to further investigate the anomalous properties of SCP-348, the Foundation began testing it. Given that the child who first discovered the bowl had relied upon it, Tests involve Foundation researchers presenting certain children to SCP-348 and observing the results. So was this bowl haunted? Perhaps harboring some malicious spirit or entity that sought to corrupt these children, maybe even healing them in order to somehow use them as a vessel to break into our world? No. And while it may have not healed in any overt or expected way, it did heal in at least a metaphorical sense. If presented with an injured child sporting any form of minor ailment such as a cut or a runny nose, SCP-348 fills with warm soup. And yes, that's right, we said soup. What kind, you may ask? Well, that seems to vary. Sometimes it is tomato soup, other times it might be chicken noodle soup. While the ingredients used in the soups are often different, there are notable consistencies to how SCP-348 heals. If anyone between the ages of 4 years old and 18 years old sits down in front of the blue flowered bowl, then SCP-348 will fill with soup. Numerous young test subjects brought in by the Foundation to eat from this particular bowl of soup have reported that they enjoyed their meal, usually finishing the entire bowl when permitted to by research staff. Many of the injured children that were tested have stated that the soup they eat from SCP-348 reminds them of their parents' cooking. These children have expressed contentment and feelings of comfort after acquiring their various cuts and bruises. Some even claim that even though they were in a room all alone, they didn't feel lonely when they were eating the soup. And all the anomalous properties don't end after a child finishes the soup. Usually, although not always, the bowl will leave the child a message, often some brief words of reassurance or comfort. These messages materialize on the inside rim of the bowl and seem to be specifically tailored to the subject that has just eaten. The words will not only be written in the child's first language, but are often linked to the child's home life or relationship with their parents. Messages that appear on SCP-348 usually fade over time, normally disappearing after a few hours or when the bowl refills with more soup. One test of SCP-348 saw a little girl, age 8 and suffering from a sore throat, brought before the bowl. According to a background screening made by research personnel, the girl lived with her biological parents and apparently had a good relationship with both her mother and her father. When SCP-348 filled with soup for her, the girl took almost half an hour to finish eating and afterwards reported that she felt her sore throat get better as she ate. By the end of the meal, this test subject remarked that she felt completely normal. In this instance, no message appeared within the bowl. Another child was brought in to continue the testing of SCP-348, this time a boy of 10. Unlike the previous test, this boy was not on good terms with his parents and often argued with them. At the time of testing, the boy had sustained several minor bruises, the result of a small accident that occurred while the boy had been out riding his bike. Much like the little girl, this subject ate the soup that SCP-348 presented him with. This time though, the bowl offered a message to the boy. The lettering found on the ceramic surface of SCP-348 simply read, Don't forget to brush. Messages also appeared when an 11-year-old boy with a slight cold ate soup from the bowl. This child had been adopted by a foster family, and after eating from SCP-348, he saw the message, 
I'm glad you're happy up here. Another young test subject, a boy age six, had a similar experience. In this instance, the child had several scrapes and scratches from playing with his friends. His parents had divorced, and he was living with his mother at the time of testing. This time, SCP-348's message to this boy read, I'm sorry, son. A seven-year-old girl suffering from a cough was brought in before SCP-348. She had lost her father to a traffic accident some time before testing commenced, and received the message, I love you, after finishing her soup. Further testing conducted by the Foundation revealed that anyone over the age of 18 years who attempted to eat soup from SCP-348 experienced things slightly differently. Unlike the children, older subjects mostly displayed a disinterest in finishing their meal. A common complaint among those over 18 was that the soup was missing something. However, in a few isolated cases, testing SCP-348 on older candidates still revealed messages, although the words seemed to be faded, not the clear hand-painted blue that appeared when the children had finished their soup. One woman aged 30 who was suffering from a headache sat down in front of SCP-348. Much like it had done before, the bowl filled with soup and the woman ate. As with some of the younger subjects, a key aspect of this woman's background seemed to be what triggered the message to appear. Specifically, she admitted to being on bad terms with her mother and father. The woman explained that she had opted to live on her own, isolating herself from her family. In fact, she even described having rejected an offer her father made to her many years earlier, refusing some career training that he was willing to give in order to help her secure a job. When she finished the soup, one word appeared in the bowl. Why? Another woman, who was 40 years old, was also brought in for the SCP-348 testing. Much like the previous subject, she had moved away from home and became estranged from her parents over the years. But unlike the previous test, this woman had taken it upon herself to not only send money to her parents, but also arrange senior care for both as well. Prior to testing, her father had died peacefully of natural causes after spending his last days in the care that this woman had paid for. As the woman ate the soup from the bowl, she remarked about its apparently bitter taste, but also described her meal as fulfilling. After she had finished, the words thank you appeared within SCP-348. One other adult subject that produced a noticeable result from SCP-348 was a 40-year-old male. The results of this test appeared to be the most distinctly different from any previous adult or child. By now, researchers working for the SCP Foundation had determined that familial history seemed to play an important role in the outcome of any interaction with SCP-348, and this individual was certainly different to most. The man in question had murdered his father roughly a year before the testing took place. He began the test with SCP-348 while afflicted with aches in his back. After one taste of the soup that appeared in the bowl before him, the murderer was immediately repulsed. He complained about the taste, refusing to eat any more from SCP-348. Shortly after, the man began to experience severe stomach pain. The potentially poisonous soup was disposed of, but SCP-348 immediately filled with salt water, which took three hours to disappear from the bowl. Despite conducting numerous tests with subjects of all ages and ailments, the SCP Foundation researchers have so far been unable to determine the origins of the messages that sometimes appear in SCP-348. Some have theorized because of the family histories of some children and adults tested that the words somehow come from the father of whoever eats the soup. Since even when a subject's father is alive or present in their life, the message seems to convey feelings that their father has or would have. Other researchers claim that this is just the purpose of SCP-348, to provide comfort to small children dealing with pain, both inside and out. After all, isn't providing comfort what a good bowl of soup, anomalous or not, is best at? They'd spend hours making the costume. The two young boys, let's call them Johnny and Max, had always been on the creative side. Sometimes they got teased for it at school, but they didn't care. As long as they had each other, they could handle anything. They were best friends. Maybe one day they'd build great things together out of concrete and steel, but for now they worked with cardboard. Prior projects had included building a rocket out of cardboard in Johnny's backyard, like the kind that put a man on the moon. They'd also made a box for it like no other, more a box castle really. 
the kind that would stand for a hundred years. As long as it didn't rain, of course. But all of that felt like nothing compared to the tunnel monster. To these two young friends, it was a thing of beauty. A fully articulated cardboard monster costume meticulously cobbled together from boxes, masking tape, cardboard tubes for arms and legs, and a little twine to bring it all together. Frankenstein, Dracula, Freddy Krueger. Those silver screen phonies were nothing compared to the tunnel monster. They even cut out eye holes in the head and drew the scariest snarling mouth that they could write below. The making was over, and now they were ready to play. Johnny and Max took the costume down to one of their favorite places in town, the abandoned Brechter construction site. To many would seem like a strange and dangerous place for two young children to play, but for Johnny and Max, it was perfect. After all, they were the age where they had more imagination than sense. Max would be the one wearing the costume. Johnny helped him put it on piece by piece, using extra masking tape and twine where necessary to fasten all the pieces together. Little by little, Max became the tunnel monster. The transformation was complete, and it was finally time for the games to begin. Johnny ran, wielding a stick as a defensive weapon while Max gave chase. He could feel his own hot breath within the cardboard mask. It was oddly exhilarating. He gave a monstrous roar and charged after his friend, chasing him into the child-sized pipes of an unfinished water drainage system. It was more fun than anything they could have imagined. Max really got into his role. He lunged forwards, grabbing Johnny with his cardboard gauntlets and tried to drag him back into the tunnel, all while giving low, guttural growls. Johnny laughed and swatted at Max with his stick like a knight wielding a sword. They ran and crawled through the tunnels, the best of friends having the best of times, making the kind of memories that would last forever. And in that sense, they were right. Something they made that day would echo on forever, but it wouldn't be something they would look back upon fondly. If they weren't so busy running through the tunnels, Max and Johnny might have noticed that something was amiss. They might have seen that, even though it was only 3 p.m. on a summer's day, the sky was beginning to darken. It may not have saved them, but it might have given them time to prepare for what was coming. Max was still chasing Johnny down a pipe, still fully in character as the tunnel monster, his arms extended to grab his fleeing friend while Johnny tripped. Max stopped to help him up, but something was wrong. When Max helped Johnny stand up, Johnny instinctually pushed him away, as though it wasn't actually his friend anymore. Max stumbled backwards in shock and horror. He could feel something changing beneath the cardboard. He suddenly was in pain. This terrible pain. Like he was being pulled apart and put back together. He started to scream. It was a horrible sound like nails on a chalkboard. Johnny had to hold his ears as the screaming got louder and louder, but Max couldn't stop. He was hurting too much to stop. Johnny was crying. He didn't know what was happening, only that his friend was in terrible pain and that there was seemingly nothing he could do to stop it. Even Max didn't know much more than that, but he thought it might have something to do with the suit. It felt like it was full of fire ants crawling and biting. It felt like his body was full of fire ants. He needed to take the suit off before it got any worse, but he couldn't. The suit wouldn't come off. He reached for the cardboard mask and tried to tug it off his head, but it wouldn't budge. He felt like he was tugging at the skin of his own face. He could suddenly feel everything that brushed against the cardboard, like it was connected to his nerve endings. The fear and the panic got worse and he kept screaming. It was a deafening, ear-splitting scream. He didn't know it, but anything electrical within a 200 meter radius was dying. TVs shut off, radios fizzled out, cars stopped running. Nobody who didn't work for the SCP Foundation would ever know why. It wasn't even 3.30 p.m., but the sky above looked black as midnight. Max was afraid, but all he could do was cling to the familiar. He lunged forwards and grabbed Johnny, pulling him into his trembling embrace. Is he still Max now? No, he doesn't think so anymore. He's something else entirely. As he held his friend, Max tried to dig his fingers into the mask and tear it off. They pierced through the cardboard, tearing holes into it. It was agonizing, but the mask stayed put. There was no escape. He closed his eyes just for a moment. Maybe it was a bad dream. Maybe he could make it disappear, but it didn't disappear. Only he did. Max was no more. There was only 
the Tunnel Monster. When Johnny woke up, he was disoriented and afraid. He was in complete darkness, but he could feel the old metal of a rusty railroad track beneath his feet. He didn't remember how he got there, and he didn't remember Max either. Not his face, or even his name. But that's alright, Max didn't remember him either. When the terrified Johnny eventually found his way out of the old railway tunnel he'd somehow found himself in, he was rescued by emergency services and treated for dehydration. Because of the incredibly strange circumstances of his disappearance and reappearance over 4,000 kilometers away, it was only natural for the SCP Foundation to check in. But seeing as Johnny had no memory of where he was or who he was with prior to his mysterious teleportation, all they ever did was investigate the tunnel he'd appear in. Of course, they didn't find a thing. The case was closed shortly afterwards, written off as a kind of one-off spatial anomaly. Johnny was given amnestic treatment and reintegrated back into his normal life. He would never remember his encounter with the tunnel monster, but many would for decades and decades to come. There would be stories and scattered witness accounts from all kinds of people. Maintenance workers doing electrical repairs on subway tunnels, sewer workers cleaning up blockages in pipes, road workers fixing the asphalt in underpasses. The challenge with being an SCP Foundation field agent is often separating the genuine leads from the urban legends and spooky stories. But the details here were all too similar and specific. After all, it would be such a strange thing to make up. A moldy old pile of cardboard boxes getting up and running towards you. But stranger still, these incidents and encounters were occurring all over the United States, with the only commonalities being that all of them happened in tunnels or tunnel-like structures. The Foundation didn't know if they were dealing with one entity or many. Another peculiar factor they observed was that sometimes people who had encounters with the tunnel monster then themselves appear in tunnels extremely far away from the ones in which they first encountered it. As far as the Foundation was aware, besides transporting them vast distances, it never actually harmed any of its victims. But according to one Boston sewer worker, Gus Zagrelia, when the tunnel monster laid its cardboard hand on him, he felt the most profound sense of paranoia and dread. He described it as feeling like a thousand eyes in the dark, watching you die. Then he blinked and he woke up in an Arizona viaduct roughly six hours later. Everyone who reported a similar experience with the tunnel monster was detained, debriefed, and given amnestics by the Foundation. Eventually, they gathered enough data on prior encounters to accurately predict the next tunnel that the tunnel monster would manifest inside. A new mobile task force was formed to secure the creature, MTF New 4, also known as the Box Cutters. What they didn't expect was that when they finally engaged the beast was that it was no larger than a human child. It wasn't some huge tunnel-dwelling nightmare even after all these decades. The tunnel monster was little more than a frightened, lonely little boy. He growled, attempting and failing to come off as intimidating to these hardcore MTF members, and referred to himself as the tunnel monster. When they didn't react with fear and surprise like the others, he became subdued. They were able to peacefully apprehend him and take him back to Site-54 for testing and containment. Preliminary x-rays found that the cardboard costume hadn't just fused with the boy, it had completely transformed him. On the inside, he was filled with crude cardboard copies of all the major internal organs, with his blood vessels and nerve endings made out of colored pieces of string. They couldn't find any information on who the boy was, if he had ever been a boy at all and he was given the designation SCP-3663. In order to find out more, one of the leading researchers on the SCP-3663 case, Researcher Doyle, decided to conduct an interview with the Tunnel Monster. It had been the only interview with the creature to date, due to the emotional distress it caused the creature. When asked about its identity, it replied with only the Tunnel Monster. When asked why it attacked and teleported people to different locations, the creature replied, The Tunnel Monster captures people. That's me. I'm the Tunnel Monster. I capture people and take them into the tunnels where I live. In the tunnels. The pipes. I'm the Tunnel Monster. As the interview progressed, the Tunnel Monster became increasingly upset until it began weeping through its cardboard face finally culminating with its crying out between sobs, Please, I don't want to play anymore. 
SCP-3663 only feels comfortable in tunnels, and will teleport away in distress if confined anywhere else. As such, its containment chamber is technically the maintenance tunnels underneath Site-54, where it seems to have made a home for itself. Occasionally, if it experiences fear, damage, or stress, it may de-manifest and appear in tunnels elsewhere. At that point, the box cutters are deployed to collect 3663 once again and bring him back to Site-54. So far, there has only been one major containment breach with SCP-3663, but it was a little more deadly than you might expect for a boy-sized creature made of cardboard. The tunnel monster escaped from the Site-54 tunnels and began wailing in pain. It went positively berserk, attacking surrounding staff and trashing parts of the facility. Anyone who heard the wails of the tunnel monster reported becoming extremely psychologically disturbed by them. During this four-hour rampage, the monster also tried multiple times to destroy itself with various implements, but was unsuccessful. After SCP-3663 was recontained, two deceased members of personnel were recovered from the scene. Autopsy showed the cause of death was a buildup of paper residue and wood pulp in all of their major blood vessels, as well as sinuses, ear tubes, and the majority of the digestive and respiratory systems. A number of other staff members were found to have been affected to a lesser degree, but are expected to make full recoveries. What triggered this explosive and deadly outburst? Not even the tunnel monster itself knew the answer to this question. But we do. At exactly the same time, a 79-year-old man passed away from natural causes after what seemed like a thoroughly unremarkable life. That man's name was Johnny. A man is sitting in a chair inside a containment cell at the SCP Foundation. The man is dressed normally, and he isn't trying to escape or attack the researchers who are observing him. The only thing that makes this man different from you or I is that he ages right in front of us, going from a teenager to an old man in a matter of minutes. At first glance, SCP-1007 looks very normal, just a corpse lying in a standard coffin. Well, the corpse of an old man in a coffin being kept locked up in a containment chamber is normal when compared to some of the other strange anomalies that are found in the SCP Foundation's archives. Inside the coffin with SCP-1007 is a small metal key, and this is quite literally the key to seeing what makes this anomaly so special. On SCP-1007's back, between his shoulder blades, is a small keyhole. X-ray scans of 1007 have shown that the keyhole is just an empty socket. It's unconnected to anything. There's no internal clockwork mechanisms or other machinery that should be able to be activated by a key. When the metal key that is kept in SCP-1007's coffin, classified as SCP-1007-1, is inserted into the keyhole on 1007's back and turned, something truly incredible happens. As the key is turned, SCP-1007 undergoes a change unlike anything the SCP Foundation has seen before. With each turn of the key, the subject's physical age is reversed by one full year. Foundation researchers are able to watch 1007 age in reverse in real time. Even any decay that had set in on the corpse is completely reversed and disappears as the key is wound and 1007 gets younger and younger. As the key is turned, 1007 will continue to de-age, physically compacting and shrinking down until it appears to have the form of a newborn human child. It's unknown where the physical mass of 1007's body goes to, since this should defy the laws of physics. But those laws we assume to be a bedrock of our universe's reality are often more of a suggestion when it comes to anomalies the SCP Foundation deals with. Once SCP-1007 reaches the newborn baby stage, it will suddenly reactivate, coming to life immediately, regardless of how long it has been dead and lying in its coffin. Once 1007 is brought back to life, he will go through the entire human life cycle within a 75-minute period. Experiencing what looks to be approximately one year of normal human growth and development for every minute that passes. That means that in the course of about 16 minutes, researchers will see SCP-1007 change from a crying infant to a fully grown teenager. As you can imagine, the subject has reported feeling excruciating pain during these first few minutes, as his bones rapidly lengthen and expand, and his muscles develop and change shape dramatically. 
SCP-1007 is able to watch with his young eyes as his bones move and set themselves into place, lengthening and widening in seconds during growth spurts that normally take months or years. After about five minutes, provided his legs have grown to the same length at the same time, he's usually able to prop himself up and stand. At around 10 minutes, the pain really starts. The bones crack and ache as they grow at their fastest for the whole cycle. Hair will also grow on his face and body, and he can't help but feel some amount of shame and embarrassment at what's happening to him in front of the Foundation researchers, who are taking copious notes. By 20 minutes, he can hardly think due to the pain. At this point, he usually lies down and curls into a ball, whispering to himself that it will all be over soon, that the pain won't last forever. After another 10 minutes, he's right. The pain has almost stopped completely by the 30-minute mark, but now, as wrinkles and stretch marks start to set in, a different kind of pain reveals itself, as SCP-1007 realizes that he must watch himself die. 40 minutes in, and he starts to reflect on his past, the life he was forced to lead as a kind of sideshow freak. More on that later, though. The physical decay happens faster now, warts and moles and other marks of age appearing on his skin. After 50 minutes, he is aware that over half of his life has passed, and he is reaching the end. His hair starts to fall out as do his teeth, which he's never actually been able to use as he's never tasted food. As the 60-minute mark comes and goes, he begins to feel grateful for the coming end, with the escape from pain and the rest it would bring. His body has become very wrinkled by this point and is covered with age spots. His eyes begin to cloud, severely limiting his ability to see, and his hearing gets weaker and weaker until he can't comprehend anything the researchers say. At 75 minutes, it's all over. SCP-1007's body expires and he dies once again. He will remain as a corpse until the metal key is inserted into his back and the whole process starts once again. Just as there appears to be no explanation for where the mass of SCP-1007's body goes as the key is wound during the reversal process, so too is there no explanation for where the energy needed for his rapid growth comes from. This process should violate the first law of thermodynamics, and Foundation researchers are very curious about the underlying process. The one constant that remains on SCP-1007's body is a small tattoo on his right calf, where the words Mr. Life and Mr. Death from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment appear. This matches up with entry number 11 on document SCP-909, which lists a total of 20 Little Misters. SCP-1007 was recovered by Task Force Tau-6 during a raid on a mansion in California, along with several other anomalous creatures and objects. The owner of the mansion claimed that he acquired SCP-1007 at an auction hosted by Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited. Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited is a club based in London, England, that is famed for collecting and selling what it would describe as rare and obscure objects. Unfortunately, this often includes various anomalies that should be under the care of the SCP Foundation and the club's mission to provide its members with exclusive, expensive, and rare experiences means that they're often in conflict with the Foundation, and they have even been responsible for several containment breaches. Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited continues to be a very secretive organization, and the name of the director and a list of its members have so far been very difficult to obtain. At the auction they hosted where SCP-1007 was offered for sale, there were apparently, along with Mr. Life and Death, at least four other misters for sale, though the identity of the other buyers and which little misters they may have purchased is still under investigation. The fact that SCP-1007 has the name Mr. Life and Mr. Death seems to imply that he may have originally been part of a set, though this counterpart little mister has yet to be recovered or even identified. In interviews with SCP-1007, he has given his own personal theory that he embodies both names, and the designation is a reference to the way he alternates between life and death. However, the possibility still remains though that he may have a twin of sorts, and the Foundation continues to investigate its possible identity and location. SCP-1007's brief 75-minute life followed by a death that lasts until he is rewound by his special key means that he is easily contained and has been classified as safe. He is only to be activated during routine testing, and after experiencing death, 
he is to be placed back into his coffin along with the key. In keeping with current regulations for all anomalies that have been designated as misters, SCP-1007 is to be contained in Hall 8 of Site-13 for additional observation and study. Some of the anomalies the SCP Foundation deals with are dangerous, with the most powerful able to end all life and even reality as we know it. Others pose no threat at all and seem content to simply exist. Still others are something else entirely. SCP-4999 is a humanoid entity, though its appearance seems to fluctuate between manifestations, with the only unchanging detail being that it always is dressed in dark formal wear. Originally thought by many to be an urban legend, local tales of SCP-4999 are what initially tipped the Foundation off to its existence, and further research indicates that there are accounts that may be referring to the appearances of 4999 throughout recorded history. Strangest of all, though, is the consistency with which it appears, or rather, the consistent situations and types of people it appears to. From the data available, it seems that SCP-4999 only appears to people in a very specific type of need, as you'll see in the case of a subject named Alex Hereford and the fateful night he experienced. The road was slippery, and Alex was driving too fast. He knew this, of course, but it's a different matter altogether to know a thing and to care about it. Rain hammered on the front windshield, the weak headlights of his 2005 Honda Civic barely punching into the thick black night ahead of him. Winding through the mountainside, the road was mostly empty, save for the very occasional twin beams of light blazing past him due to his high speed. It was hard to hear the honking of angry horns over the heavy pounding of the rain. Then it happened. In a way, Alex knew it was inevitable. His tread-worn wheels finally lost contact with the ground, thick layer of rainwater between them and asphalt betraying his speeding vehicle's grip on the road and sending it careening out of control. He had expected fear, but instead felt nothing, really. A slight sense of anticipation, like wincing right before a punch lands in that childhood game of hitting each other on the arm. It wasn't that the world had slowed down, but perhaps his brain was simply working at a much greater velocity now, recognizing its own impending death. His speed of thought seemed magnified to the point of slowing his perception down. He heard of soldiers in war zones experiencing the same phenomenon, as they felt sure that in the next few seconds, they'd be dead. Alex wondered, would he smash into a tree, go off a cliff's edge? He could hardly see the forest or the terrain beyond in the thick rain and the dark of the mountain. Though he traveled this road a million times before, he had no idea where he actually was tonight. He supposed it wouldn't really matter, which it was. As usual, his thoughts turned to her, or rather, they had simply run their course and returned to the one place they always did. It wasn't like there were many other people to think about in Alex's mostly empty life. There was, and always had been, since the moment he'd met her. Mostly just her. But even Alex's heightened state of mind couldn't delay the inevitable for long. It would be a cliff after all, Alex thought curiously, catching a glimpse of town lights far away and below. The car spun 180 degrees out into empty air, then came crashing down with a horrible roar of shattered glass and tearing metal as it tumbled down the hillside. Even over the torrential downpour, the noise of Alex's crash was significant, had anyone been around to hear it. Finally, after over a hundred feet down a steep incline, the car smashed into a single thick oak tree, bringing the disaster to an end. As if on cue, the rain began to let up, slowly at first, then all of a sudden in that peculiar way that northwest torrential downpours tend to do, as if the sky had at last finished emptying itself all at once. Inside the shattered vehicle, Alex was, incredibly, alive, at least for the time being. The airbag deployment had spared his face the worst of it, and the sturdy aluminum frame of the vehicle had given its all in protecting Alex's body from the downhill crash. But even postmodern vehicle engineering had its limits. His breath came in slow, ragged gasps, difficult at first, but gradually steady. Not an improvement in his condition, but rather his body dedicating the rapidly dwindling resources at its disposal into keeping vital functions going as long as possible. Opening his eyes, Alex was surprised to find himself right side up, less surprised to look down at the shattered mess his limbs and lower body had become. Gradually, Alex's thoughts cleared, his sense of self returning after the bone-jarring drop down the steep incline, 
and sudden stop at the end. Looking to his right, he could see the trunk of the tree that had stopped his out-of-control tumble. Despite himself, Alex laughed, a weak, gurgling chuckle. So, it was the cliff and a tree after all. He focused on breathing, letting the waves of pain wash over him until his brain eventually canceled them out by injecting his broken body with adrenaline and chemicals. Everything was quiet and still after the crash and the rain, but to his surprise, he could hear something. It was faint at first, just a soft crunch of footsteps on gravel, but the sound grew louder and louder until at last, it came to a stop outside Alex's window. With every ounce of effort, Alex turned his head towards the sound. A rescuer? No, impossible. Nobody was up on this mountain, and nobody could possibly have reached him here so quickly, even if there had been. He supposed he should have been surprised, yet almost from the moment that his eyes fell on the tall, handsome figure with the casual yet fashionably cut black suit, Alex accepted him for what he was. There was no shock, no confusion. For the second time tonight, just a calm sense of acceptance. The man, probably somewhere in his mid-thirties, leaned down to peer in through the window. He said nothing as he casually observed the extent of Alex's injuries. Satisfied, he laid a hand on Alex's shoulder. The grip was firm, but not painfully so. Just strong enough to communicate, I am here with you. Things will be all right. After a slight squeeze, the figure reached inside his jacket and produced a pack of cigarettes, packing the tobacco with swift taps against his palm before removing two cigarettes and offering one to Alex. Alex nodded his head, a very small motion that exploded pain across his shattered body. No, thank you, but that stuff will kill you. Alex smiled. The man paused for a moment, the ghost of a smile showing on his face for just a moment before disappearing. Returning the offered cigarette, the man took his own and lit it, giving Alex a good look at his face in the light of his cigarette lighter. Alex had been right. The man appeared to be somewhere in his mid to late thirties. Handsome, but not cover model, so just pleasing to the eyes. He sported short hair, carefully combed and perfectly neat completely unaffected by the slight drizzle that still fell. The more Alex looked at him though, the less he could remember about the man's exact features. It wasn't that they changed in any way, but rather that he simply couldn't hold on to any details for more than a few seconds. I'm dying, aren't I? The figure didn't speak, nor did it nod or make any form of verbal or bodily communication. He simply looked, and Alex understood. Alex had never been particularly religious or spiritual, but in that look, he understood that there was a world beyond, and one that he would very quickly be entering into. It was as if, for the first time in his life, he was able to probe that world, reality peeling away just enough to glimpse what was beyond. Twisting paths through planes of shadow and light both, shuffling figures along each, and at the very center of it all, a light? No, a feeling, love, pulsing forth like the beating heart of it all. The saints had their angels, the wicked their demons, but everyone else in between the two, they had him, a guide, someone to watch over them on their final journey. Alex coughed, it was ending soon. The man took a drag from his cigarette and removed a handkerchief from another hidden pocket, carefully dabbing away the blood around Alex's chin then returned to his silent smoking. His vision was beginning to dim around the edges, the noises of the forest growing more and more distant. Alex knew it wouldn't be long now, but he had just one final thing to do. As he always knew they would, his thoughts returned to her, here, at the end. Once more, he turned his head towards the passenger side seat, pain exploding across his body with the motion. There, just on the far edge of the seat, as his phone, having miraculously survived the crash. It was no good though. Even if he'd been able to move his shattered right arm, he could never reach it with his fading strength. The smoking man took one final pull of his cigarette, putting it out on the side of the vehicle and pocketing the stub. Then he reached through the broken driver's side window, Alex catching a slight whiff of cigarette smoke blended with an unrecognizable but pleasant cologne. The man reached across Alex and grabbed the phone, pulling back and looking down at Alex's shattered right hand. After a moment, he reached down once more and put the phone in Alex's left hand. Thank you. The words were barely a whisper. He had to concentrate now, willing the pressing darkness to part just long enough for one final task. The man once more placed his hand reassuringly on Alex's shoulder, and the darkness parted slightly, just enough for what Alex needed to do. He worked the phone awkwardly with his left hand, 
gritting his teeth through the pain of broken fingers. Opening a new message, he scrolled down his contacts. G, H, I, J, finally, K. He found her name at last, then began typing out a message. I still think about you every time it rains. He moved his thumb to press send, but that's when Alex's body failed him at last, the phone tumbling out of his grasp. But the man was there to catch it. Moving blindly fast, he snatched the falling phone up and held it carefully to Alex's eyes before pressing send. He held the phone there for Alex to see through his fading vision until at last, message sent confirmed successful delivery. The rain began once more, temperamental as it always is in the Pacific Northwest. Fat, heavy raindrops fell on the scene of a terrible accident, the victim seemingly having died on impact. On his lap, though, lay his phone, and somewhere far away and far below this dark mountainside, a message notification chirped on a distant phone. SCP-4999 manifests to only one person at a time, and only when they are alone. All subjects to date have been in the final stages of a terminal illness, suffering from a life-threatening injury or otherwise on their deathbed. It also appears that all subjects have personalities and lives that could be described as nondescript, insignificant, or otherwise unremarkable. No testing of SCP-4999 has been authorized by the Foundation due to both the difficulty in predicting where it will appear, as well as the fact that observation seems to prevent the anomaly from appearing. There are also ethical concerns, since many in the Foundation feel that SCP-4999 is providing an important service to humanity, even if it is only for those on the margins of society, and it is debated whether this should be one anomalous creature that is allowed to continue its existence and its work without interference. It goes without saying that the SCP Foundation archives are filled with some terrifying monsters. Even the deadliest creatures can, in theory, be defeated, or at least soundly avoided. After all, they're just flesh and blood, or in some cases, metal or concrete. But what if reality as you know it one day just broke? Or worse, you were transported to a reality so frightening and alien to our own that death seemed like the only escape. But you couldn't even give yourself that. This brings us to today's topic, the terrifying alternate reality of SCP-3001. The Foundation is no stranger to freaky alternate dimensions, but what was experienced by joint lead researcher Dr. Robert Scranton at Site 120 is a truly unique nightmare. Co-managed by his wife, Dr. Anna Lang, Site 120 is a facility largely designated for research into SCPs with dangerous reality warping capabilities in order to mitigate future containment breaches. Reality warpers are among some of the more perplexing and dangerous SCPs, from the pocket dimension creating SCP-106 to the SCP creating Dr. Wondertainment and everything in between. Scranton and Lang's goal to further study such entities was an admirable one, if a little overambitious. And on January 2nd, 2000, during the testing of a new technology created by the Foundation's leading power couple, disaster finally struck. Scranton and Lang had already been the brains behind one of the Foundation's most valuable tools in the fight against reality-bending SCPs, the Scranton Reality Anchors. Their follow-up, the Lang Scranton Stabilizer, or LSS, likely would have been an even more advanced variant of their earlier invention and should have been a huge success for the team. But things didn't turn out that way. Dr. Scranton and several other researchers were gathered in Reality Lab A performing routine tests on the LSS prototypes. While other technicians ran diagnostics tests, Scranton stood at the control panel, the blinking red light above the console confirming that everything was going according to plan. But as anyone who's fallen victim to one of the Foundation's many anomalies will tell you, just because you've done everything correctly doesn't mean you're safe. Scranton began operating the machine, not knowing that something was rumbling up towards him from below. Without warning, a sudden, unexpected burst of seismic activity rocked the entire base. Researchers grabbed onto whatever was closest as the world shook around them. In his panic, Dr. Scranton clung to the LSS control panel as the seismic blast fried the circuits and kicked it into overdrive. There was a blast of magnificent blinding light, and when the rumbling stopped, not only was the doctor gone, he had been erased from reality as we know it. The earthquake had caused a deadly malfunction in the machine meant to stabilize reality and instead tore a rift in it dragging the unfortunate doctor and the control panel into oblivion. 
His wife, Dr. Lang, and the many researchers who idolized him were devastated by his unexpected demise at the hand of what should have been his crowning achievement. The one silver lining was that this reality-ripping event had almost definitely eliminated the doctor quickly and painlessly. As far as the Foundation and his loved ones were concerned, Scranton's death had been immediate and complete, a luxury afforded to few Foundation employees who die anomalous deaths. But sadly, that isn't how Dr. Scranton's story, or the story of SCP-3001, ends. No, this is where it all begins. How do we know all this? In the hellish new place where Scranton had been transported, the control panel from the LSS that he'd been clinging to for dear life had been transported with him and continued to record audio data from this anomalous location. Not that Dr. Scranton realized it, not at first anyway. As far as he knew, he'd suddenly been transported into a pitch black location. No sights, no sounds, no sense. True nothingness. At first, the doctor was confused. One second he was testing out his new technology, and the next he was quite literally nowhere. In spite of his current situation, the doctor was still an intelligent and rational man. He took a moment to compose himself, hoping that in time his eyes would adjust to the new darkness around him. But that moment never came. The darkness remained perfectly absolute. Much like the darkness in another reality-defying SCP, the deadly endless staircase known as SCP-087, the dark seemed thick, almost like you could touch it. The doctor, not wanting to give himself to despair and die in this impossible place, and with no other options seemingly available, began walking. Either he'd find his way out, or the Foundation would find him. No need to panic. It may have altered the doctor's temperament if he knew that the Foundation already assumed he was dead, and that no search party was going to come looking for him. Still, logic dictates that if a person walks for long enough, they're bound to find something. The problem Scranton was about to face was that SCP-3001 doesn't run by any kind of conventional logic. He walked and walked and walked, but he didn't seem to get any nearer to or farther from anything. But how could he even know? After all, in total darkness, there aren't any landmarks to assist in navigation. The doctor walked and paced and screamed for days on end, but he made no progress. He was alone in an empty world. He had no choice, though. So he kept walking, and walking, and walking, for 11 days. During that time, he felt his hunger and thirst grow. He was in terrible pain from a mix of starvation and dehydration, but the release of death didn't seem to come for him. He was going to have to learn the rules of this new place the hard way, and it grimly dawned on Dr. Scranton that dying in this place might not even be the worst possible outcome. He paced and repeated facts to himself, hoping to ground himself in the moment and avoid the panic that could so easily set in. Name, Robert Scranton. Age, 39. Birthday, September 19, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, living on a prayer. Wife, Anna. Little by little, the words seemed to turn to nonsense in his mouth as the terror grew. Just as he felt like he was about to lose his mind, he noticed something a small oasis in the endless darkness of SCP-3001, the glowing red light on the LSS control panel. Where had it come from? And how was it still recording? The doctor had no idea, but he was grateful for any kind of familiarity in the strange darkness around him. Perhaps the LSS could be the key to saving him, or at least figuring out what on earth was going on here. Whatever the case, there was no denying that having the panel here was better than nothing. At least, when it was found, if it was ever found, then people would know what had happened to him. As the days passed and he continued to mysteriously survive, Dr. Scranton deduced that one didn't need food or water to survive continually in SCP-3001. The location had an anomalous effect on its inhabitants. As the days passed and turned to weeks of wandering in the darkness, Dr. Scranton further deduced that he was no longer in his home dimension. This was an entirely separate pocket dimension much like the one possessed by SCP-106, but featureless, a perfect self-contained void. Now dimly illuminated by the red light of the panel, Dr. Scranton explored further into the void around him. He traveled for months on end, the pain of his deficiencies growing by the day, but found he was getting nowhere. All things considered, he wasn't even sure he was moving, or whether reality and darkness were swirling around him like a thick liquid. Rather than walking on a single flat surface, he was moving in all directions across a three-dimensional plane, 
the space-time continuum appeared to be entirely broken here, where movement is more defined by the conscious intention to move than any real geographical repositioning. Dr. Scranton knew that this place broke every single one of Kijel's laws of reality parameters, and from his years working with a plethora of reality warpers in Site-120, he had a theory for why this pocket dimension was so strange. It had an extraordinarily weak Hume field. Before we get back to Dr. Scranton's semi-living nightmare, we need a quick primer on Hume theory and why having a weak Hume field is such a problem. A Hume is a unit of measurement for the strength and amount of reality in a given location or being. In an area with an incredibly low Hume field relative to our world, such as SCP-3001, universe breaches and anomalous incidents rise significantly. At the time of his being trapped there, SCP-3001 had the lowest number of Humes in any recorded environment, making it a phenomenally anomalous zone. It was for this reason that starvation and dehydration never took hold of him despite causing him great pain. And the worst by far was yet to come. Dr. Scranton wasn't trapped in this dimension for weeks or even months. He was trapped in the darkness for years, and it took a nightmarish toll on his body and mind. The small flashing red light on his LSS control panel became his only friend, and as the years drew on, he would hold entire conversations with his only source of illumination. He knew that his days were numbered. If he didn't escape the dimension within around three years, the Hume field would diffuse further, and he would be left in a truly horrific state. But based on how little headway he'd made in the time he'd been there, he didn't feel optimistic. He kept speaking into the recorder, if only to break the silence and prevent him from going completely insane. But even that would only hold it off for so long. Alone and talking to himself endlessly in the darkness, Dr. Scranton could feel his mind slipping as the confines of the pocket dimension constricted and his body began to change. The low Hume field slowly diffused his physical matter, destroying the physical integrity of his body, but never being merciful enough to actually let him die. In his haunting audio logs, the doctor described his hands as diffusing and thinning out like spiderwebs. Over time, there was less and less of him, and what was left wasn't entirely human. As Scranton's Hume level lowered to equalize with that of SCP-3001, the lines between his body and the LSS control console began to blur in a twisted marriage of warp flesh and machine. The Lang Scranton stabilizer was anything but stable. Before his mind and body became something else entirely, the doctor still had the presence of mind to finally realize how he'd come to be in this terrible place. The LSS had opened a wormhole known as a Class C broken entry into a paradoxical pocket dimension between layers of reality and taken him through it. He'd slipped through a crack in reality into absolute darkness, and now he was stuck with a fate far worse than death. How do we know any of this? Much like the event in the first place, it's a total accident. Testing superior reality-bending technology almost six years after the disappearance caused the sudden return of the missing LSS to Site-120's reality labs. The only trace of Dr. Scranton that it brought back with it was the blood and viscera that coated the console, much to the abject horror of his still-grieving wife, Dr. Anna Lang. To this day, Dr. Scranton, formerly one of the Foundation's brightest minds, remains trapped in the nightmare of SCP-3001. His current condition, whether the doctor is still alive after 20 years of being warped by the low Hume field of 3001's darkened confines, is still unknown. But for the doctor's own sake, we hope he's been dead for quite some time because few things on Earth are as horrifying as the alternative. In the office of SCP Foundation researcher Yoshihiro Takanaka, there sits a small containment capsule filled with ash, all that's left of a neutralized SCP-1762. These ashes don't pose any harm. They won't bite, burn, or assume control of your mind. But few can hear the sad story of SCP-1762 and not be haunted by its tragic and mysterious tale. It weighs heavily on the hearts and minds of all who came into contact with it during its ultimately brief time in the Foundation's hands. And to think, it all started with a simple little box with an even simpler message. Here be dragons. The box to look at it was really nothing special. A simple cardboard box, 32 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 26 centimeters, spray painted silver inside and out. Its short message scrawled across the lid in black permanent marker. It appeared on the doorstep of Foundation agent Scott Thomas, who, after determining it wasn't a bomb, anthrax, or a deadlier kind of anomaly, turned it into his superiors. 
That's when it became Yoshihiro Takanaka's little pet project. Safe class SCPs are rare treats for any overworked Foundation scientist. The box itself, known as SCP-1762-1, is certainly important. But what's really interesting is what resides within the box. If you'd open the box yourself, you'd find that it's empty. However, when the box chooses to open itself, it's an entirely different story. The box would sometimes open and emit great plumes of thick black smoke that would quickly dissipate. Around 20 seconds after this, an SCP-1762-2 would emerge from the darkness of the box. 1762-2 is the collective names given to all the beings that exit 1762-1, which are, as you may have guessed, dragons. Eastern, Western, big, small, and presenting in a rainbow of colors. These dragons appear to be living origami sculptures made from kami paper, and have been known to fly together in large groups and interact playfully with nearby humans. These little paper dragons would then swoop around their containment chamber, delighting all who were fortunate enough to see them for up to three hours, at which point smoke would begin pouring out of the box once more, and the dragons would return home. They'd fly through the smoke, disappearing past the rim of the box, and then the lid would close once more. The dates on which the box would open were seemingly random and indeterminable, and didn't appear to work by any kind of external logic. And what's more, the box would sometimes act as a hub of communication between this world and another, known simply as fantasy. Messages written or carved into various materials would appear on the lid of the box, mostly after instances of 1762-2 emerging. This communication, though, would always be one way. Attempts to pass messages back through the box never resulted in success. The Foundation staff could only be observers of the strange world of fantasy, never active participants. So why is this particular SCP considered so tragic? We're going to answer that question right now, but just know that what is learned cannot be unlearned, as much as you might wish you could forget. If you're ready, then it's time to learn about a period of time that lasted just under a year, during which a strange and sad series of events took place, now known as the Jabberwocky event, an event that took here be dragons from safe to neutralized. You've seen that SCP-1762 would communicate with Foundation staff via written messages after each instance of the box opening. The very first message the box gave up after arriving at the site read, You have found us. Thank you. It has been so long since we last saw each other, friends. The peace has been upheld. The giants and behemoth have kept their word and have not caused any trouble since you last came and gave the order. We missed your company. How has your family been? Do you know how to work your room? You are welcome to visit any time. Later it gave another message, expressing confusion and concern on behalf of Fantasy's inhabitants. It's strange to see how much your world has changed. It is even stranger to see how we now appear in this place. In Fantasy, we are much bigger. Or maybe you've grown taller. Fantasy is still the same. We hope you can visit us like you used to. Though our room is as grand as ever, it appears yours has... shrunken. We do not understand. The rooms were supposed to be maintained, as was our agreement. Please restore the belief. Things got worse during the next stage of the event. The box opened, and only 20 paper dragons exited. This time, though, they did not fly, and instead walked slowly across the ground. This was the message that accompanied this sorry parade of dragons. Friends, we apologize for our few numbers. We have had to remain in fantasy for quite some time. The others are growing impatient. We are trying to keep the peace, but please, for all of our happiness, repair the room quickly. We know you are trying. Your family is the most imaginative of us all. Naturally, Foundation scientists were concerned. They weren't sure what exactly the messages were referring to, or how they could possibly help the inhabitants of fantasy. Of course, things only got worse. Only ten dragons appeared the next time, along with a few balls of crumpled up construction paper that shook violently before stopping all movement entirely. This message accompanied it. The giants were foolish. Your room was not ready to accept them yet. We're sorry, friends. We hope that we can still see you. But time is growing short for our happiness. 
And sadly, this message spoke the truth, as the next time the box opened, only five dragons exited. They were carrying the following message, and flew straight back into the box after depositing it on the ground. Tensions are rising. Fantasy is becoming darker. We, the serpents and the hybrids, are furiously trying to hold them back. But the giants and elves wish to strike and make an entrance. They say that your family has grown stupid and ignorant. We hope this is untrue. It would sadden us all greatly to know that you have forgotten. It seemed clear that fantasy was speeding towards some kind of terrible conflict, and it was perhaps too late to do anything about it. The next attempt at communication came from a single dragon with a crumpled, wounded body. It collapsed to the ground and appeared to die, its body unfolding into a small piece of paper that bore a single heartbreaking message. War. Goodbye, friends. But two hours after this message was delivered, something happened. The lid opened again, only this time the box let out a huge jet of white-hot flame, reaching temperatures of 1700 degrees Celsius. The terrified and confused researchers heard roaring and the sounds of an intense battle from within the darkness of the box. Many of the observing staff found themselves overcome with emotion, afraid that they were perhaps witnessing the death of fantasy play out in front of them, and even hardened Foundation researchers and guards were moved by the event. At 8 p.m. that night, the box ejected a huge quality of paper. The majority of it was either torn, burnt, shredded, or crumpled into balls. And all instances of 1762-2 were announced deceased upon official examination. It seemed that fantasy's bloody war truly was taking its toll. And even the forces of the Foundation, one of the most powerful and resourceful groups the world has ever known, were powerless to do anything to help. All they could do was sit, wait, and see what the result would be of this paper-crafted war. The box continued to open and close sporadically over the next six weeks as the war raged on. It would often emit more spouts of deadly fire and vomit out more piles of ruined paper, though researchers noticed that each time it released less and less paper. Even more disturbing, matter resembling muscle and tissue was ejected from the box with increased frequency. It was clear that whatever was left of fantasy was in great peril, and the researchers were desperate to know what was going on, but the box would remain closed and inactive for the next seven months. When the box did finally become active once more, it wasn't in a way that the researchers were familiar with. The box opened, but not a single dragon exited. Not even a crumbled piece of paper came out. Instead, researchers found what appeared to be an ancient and desiccated scroll of parchment. The words written on it were smudged, and some were stained with blood. It made clear that things had fallen further into darkness than they had ever before. The message read, Are you still out there, friends? We miss you dearly. Fantasy is no longer safe. Our haven, your beautiful creation, is gone. The giants are dead. The centaurs are dead. The birds have fled. We are going to bury your room. We cannot risk hurting you. This is our goodbye. Maybe one day, your family can build another room. This may be a hollow hope, but we will cherish this thought. An hour later, the box began to convulse violently and let out more plumes of thick black smoke. For a moment, the researchers entertained the hope that it might be the return of the dragons but no such luck. The box began to sag, tear, and collapse, as though it was on fire on the inside. Parts of the box began to char, and small holes were burned through the silver paint. Perhaps the saddest of all, the words, Here be dragons, were burned from the box. Not long after, one more message appeared inside the box. It was a papyrus scroll, depicting a hand-drawn image of a beautiful mountainous landscape with huge trees and waterfalls. In the distance, a dragon appears to fly away for the last time. A message written on the back read as follows. Master says that we won't see you again. We are sad, so are the remaining others. We once filled each other's heads with dreams and goals. It is so sad that we cannot share them any longer. Master says we have to go. He says that he will make us a new fantasy. He says you cannot be a part of it. We are sad. We love you. 
We will not forget you. We are scared. Will you forget us? When this document was removed, streams of salt water began to leak from the box, healing its burn scars. A few minutes later, the box was returned to its original state, save for one big difference. The text scrawled on the lid no longer read, Here be dragons. Now, it said, Here were dragons. The Jabberwocky event was over. The box, now neutralized, would sit in Yoshihiro Takanaka's office for commemorative purposes, never to release another message. Or so we thought. In 2015, SCP-1762 spoke to us one more time. The box shook and began emitting great plumes of purple smoke before it fell to the ground. There it ejected two objects, a purple crystal, later identified as an amethyst, and a large leather-bound book. The box continued emitting smoke for another 40 minutes before finally disintegrating. Upon further inspection, there was a single message carved into the amethyst. One last time. And what about the book? Consider the greatest fear of the inhabitants of fantasy, that they would one day be forgotten, forgotten and left behind by us. The book was sent to help prevent that. It's an extensive catalog of the creatures of fantasy, their strange and wonderful ways in their strange and wonderful world. Even if they're gone, they won't be forgotten. And perhaps one day, we'll tell you those stories too. But that's a tale for another day. Joseph and Frank were two lifelong squatchers. No, that isn't an insult. That's a self-given title for Bigfoot enthusiasts who are willing to head out into the woods and search for the legendary Sasquatch firsthand. While most squatchers will go their whole lives without ever encountering one, Joseph and Frank were about to get lucky. They just didn't know what kind of luck. During a journey through the forests of the Pacific Northwest, Frank spotted something moving in the distance. A huge ape-like creature with grayish fur and human-like movements. Frank thought he was finally laying eyes on the mighty Bigfoot after decades of searching. What he didn't know was that he just made a deadly mistake. He had looked directly at SCP-1000, and there would be terrible consequences. Frank was excited. He just achieved the life goal of any Squatcher. He tapped Joseph on the shoulder and directed him to look in the direction of the creature. Joseph followed Frank's direction and stared into the distance. When his eyes finally came into focus on the ape-like beast, he froze. His brain just short-circuited. One second he was about to encounter the holy grail of his hobby, and the next he was literally brain dead. Joseph collapsed. In the distance, the ape-like creature disappeared back into the woods. Not that Frank even noticed. He was too busy trying to wake Joseph, but it was no use. Joseph was gone, and Frank had no idea why. The headlines read, Bigfoot killed my friend. Most people either ignored it or laughed it off. Just a couple of cranks goofing off in a forest and one of them had dropped dead. Who cares? Well, one organization cared. The SCP Foundation. Mobile Task Force Zeta-1000. The Foundation's specialized SCP-1000 detail were alerted to the reports. They sprang into action, tracking down and detaining Frank for questioning. They process a million loony Bigfoot lovers every year and usually find nothing, but the death of Frank's friend made it all too clear. They hadn't encountered a Bigfoot, but a real, genuine example of SCP-1000. SCP-1000 rarely ranks among the scariest or most dangerous SCPs, but underestimating the creature is a terrible mistake because just looking at it gives you a 2% chance of dropping dead on the spot. Frank, despite losing his friend, was one of the lucky ones. The Foundation debriefed him before administering amnestics and making sure that he'd never venture back into those mysterious forests in the Pacific Northwest region. Director Jones, the site director charged with the management of SCP-1000 populations, was given the information on this latest case of an SCP-1000-related fatality. It was a story he heard many times before. For Director Jones, they all seemed to bleed into one another. So what exactly is SCP-1000? And how did it leave poor Joseph dead in the woods? SCP-1000 is a whole species of large, hominid ape-like creatures. They're largely nocturnal, but sightings of the creature during the day aren't unheard of. They're omnivorous, mostly seeming to consume plants and insects, and their fur is usually gray, brown, black, red, or occasionally white. The creatures have large eyes capable of impressive vision nestled underneath a pronounced Neanderthal-like brow. Another defining feature is the ridge of bone on the forehead, much like that of a gorilla that is present in both sexes. 
According to Foundation studies, the creatures exhibit a level of intelligence on par with that of the common chimpanzee, but nowhere near that of us humans. What they lack in intelligence, though, they make up for in size. The adults can be as large as 10 feet tall and weigh up to 600 pounds. Despite their great size and impressive strength, the creatures are neither aggressive nor territorial. In fact, they seem to instinctively avoid humans, mostly residing deep in the forests of the American mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest and in the Himalayan Alps. There have been sightings of SCP-1000 on every continent, though the Foundation has taken pains to exterminate all SCP-1000 populations situated near human population centers to prevent a potential disaster, considering the 2% chance of instantaneous death upon visual contact. That brings us to our second question. What is it that makes these seemingly harmless creatures so dangerous? Sadly, for both these unfortunate creatures and us humans, the danger is beyond the control of SCP-1000. According to Foundation research, SCP-1000 likely evolved alongside us Homo sapiens until a tragedy occurred between 10 and 15,000 years ago. A mysterious extinction event eliminated the vast majority of their species, leaving only 1 to 5% alive in the aftermath. What happened? It's believed that around this time, SCP-1000 contracted what the Foundation refers to as an anomalous pseudo-disease. Meet SCP-1000-F1 a disease that is passed along at the genetic level and is so durable that it persists in the species to this day. The tiny fraction of the population that are immune to its effects manage to survive, but the majority who aren't immune die shortly after birth. This is why the overall population remains relatively low to this day. It's a disease that only appears to affect hominids, including humans, chimpanzees, bonobos, and non-immune instances of SCP-1000. Any hominid that lays eyes on a carrier of the disease has a 2% chance of experiencing immediate brain death. While a 2% chance of instant death may not seem all that threatening, at least when compared to some other nightmare-inducing SCPs, the truly scary part is that the percentage is cumulative. In other words, the longer one observes a carrier of SCP-1000-F1, the higher that percentage rises, the greater your chance of experiencing an abrupt death. According to Foundation studies, the percentage rises by around 1% every 20 minutes, and the percentage also varies between specimens, with some exhibiting a terrifyingly high death chance of 90% upon viewing. This death chance continues to occur in dead specimens if they carry the anomalous pseudovirus while alive though thankfully the risk doesn't appear to apply to small fur or tissue samples. The Foundation's true concern actually goes far beyond SCP-1000 themselves. Because of the species' close relation to Homo sapiens, there's a worry that SCP-1000-F1 could transmit to humans, causing our own species to meet a similar fate. If humans did indeed become carriers of SCP-1000-F1, it's extremely likely that humanity would undergo an unprecedented extinction event, with billions across the globe dropping dead as brain death sets in en masse. While full extermination of the entire species has been deemed unlikely, this existential threat they pose to humanity more than justifies the occasional culling of SCP-1000 <laughs> populations. That was a lot to take in, right? First, the creature we thought was Bigfoot was actually a new species of SCP out in the wild. And second, these creatures could end human life as we know it if they made it into a population center. But what you're about to hear next, a dark secret only available to people with level 3 SCP Foundation clearance, is the most shocking SCP-1000 fact of all. Are you ready? The true secret of SCP-1000 is that what you've just heard is a lie. There is no anomalous pseudo-disease, and SCP-1000 poses no pathogenic threat to humanity whatsoever. Who would spread such a thing? The SCP Foundation, of course. Strictly speaking, the Foundation has disseminated two direct lies about the nature of SCP-1000. The first is that of the disease, which does not exist, nor has it ever existed. The second lie is about the creature's intelligence level. They're far smarter than the average chimp. In fact, they're every bit as intelligent as human beings. These were all lies formulated by Director Jones and the Foundation, as was the very existence of the Bigfoot myth. The Foundation has been spreading information that makes the very concept of the Sasquatch out to be a joke for decades, all to discredit and further push the very concept of SCP-1000 into the shadows. But why? The Foundation is no stranger to coming up with cover stories, but why would they put intentional lies into their own files to anyone below a level 3 clearance? Well, that all comes down to the horrifying truth behind the origins of today's SCP-1000 population. 
The creatures were first brought to the attention of the Foundation by outcast members of the Serpent's Hand, an organization dedicated to defying the Foundation's activities. These members, known as the Children of the Sun, told them the secret history of SCP-1000. While at first, Foundation personnel like Director Jones didn't want to believe what they were hearing, they soon came to terms with the horrifying truth. Humans and SCP-1000 did evolve alongside each other, with humans occupying the day and SCP-1000 the night. However, while humans were still basic hunter-gatherers, SCP-1000 were undergoing vast intellectual and societal development. They were able to create tools, weapons, agriculture, stable settlements, domesticated animals, and eventually even fully developed cities. It was like nothing the world had ever seen, and wouldn't see for thousands of years to come. Their numbers swelled into the tens of billions as they created culture and technology hitherto unimagined, including weapons of devastating power. Meanwhile, humanity was pushed to the brink of destruction by their competitors' rapid and seemingly unstoppable growth. It looked as though the human species had lost the evolutionary arms race and would have to bow out. But according to the Children of the Sun, a trickster forest god smiled upon humanity and gave them the power to use SCP-1000's weapons and technology against them. 70% of SCP-1000's population were wiped out in a single horrific day, known to the Children of the Sun as the Day of the Flowers, as every flower supposedly bloomed that day during the massacre. Humanity destroyed the entire civilization, and with the same technology they stole from these unfortunate creatures, the vengeful humans drove the apes mad. Their higher consciousnesses were blocked out, reducing them back into the states of mere animals. Once the massacre was done and everything that was built had been destroyed, we, the human race, used the SCP-1000 weapons to wipe any memory of the atrocity from our own minds. The advanced civilization of SCP-1000 had been wiped from history. Humans returned to their plodding path of evolution, none the wiser. For thousands of years, all the way up until today, this time remained a mystery to us. So again, why did the Foundation lie to us? What did they have to gain by convincing us all that it was dangerous to even look at these creatures? While well, as the frequency of sightings and the attempts of communication increased, people like Director Jones became aware of a frightening possibility. What if the pendulum was swinging back? What if the apes were regaining their lost intelligence and worse, still harbored feelings of revenge for what we did to their species thousands of years ago? Even the mere possibility that they could do to us what we once did to them is a chance that the Foundation simply cannot take and thus, limiting contact between humans and SCP-1000 at all costs is an absolute must. However, in spite of the Foundation's fears, one intercepted message from the apes suggests that their paranoia may be misplaced. This message, translated from an attempt at communicating with Foundation personnel, reads simply as follows. We forgive you. Given choice for now, not forever. Let us back in. It's enough to make you wonder what species the Foundation should really be keeping tabs on here. After all, when it comes to meting out violence and death, humanity has a track record to rival the worst creatures in the Foundation containment cells. And few examples illustrate that better than the tragic case of SCP-1000. There's no doubt that the SCP Foundation has come across some dangerous anomalies over the years. If you had to guess, what would you say is the most dangerous SCP they have in containment? A lot of people might immediately think of SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile. And perhaps they might be right. After all, we're talking about a gigantic lizard that can regenerate almost all forms of damage, and harbors a burning hatred for any and all other forms of life. Then there's the various eldritch entities the Foundation has come into contact with, beings that could easily rewrite all of reality out of pure anger, or just to torment us for their own amusement. But the most dangerous SCP might well be something completely unassuming. Instead of a zombie-producing plague doctor, or an actual plague of flesh-eating zombies, imagine if there was just a man. One seemingly ordinary human man. Nothing about him that looks unusual, no mimetic or anomalous superpower. And yet one look at him tells you that he's the most dangerous man you've ever seen. Someone who should be locked up forever for all the horrible things he's done. Welcome to the story of Fraser Melbrook, the most dangerous person, also known as SCP-3017. 
To anyone that knew him, Fraser was just an ordinary man. Although at 25 years of age, he had not exactly lived a charmed life. People would look at him and could almost tell there was something unsavory about Fraser's character. It was as if one glance could somehow tell you that he was trouble. It was this unshakable feeling that he gave people that led to Fraser Melbrook being arrested and arrested and arrested some more. Over the course of his adult life, he was placed under arrest a total of 23 times. Fraser was suspected of having committed a number of different crimes, ranging from robbery and assault all the way up to accusations of murder. Interestingly, he was never formally indicted for any of his alleged crimes, meaning he was only ever arrested and held as a suspect, but never once was he confirmed to have been guilty. There was never any evidence, nothing to prove beyond reasonable doubt that Fraser was, in fact, a criminal. Instead, every arrest boiled down to the way he made people in his presence feel. Unfortunately, even though he was never proven to be guilty, or even capable of committing the crimes he was accused of, Fraser Melbrook's multiple arrests garnered him a notable criminal record, and soon drew the attention of the SCP Foundation. When he was transferred into Foundation containment and designated as SCP-3017, it was believed that Fraser had some form of connection to a number of groups of interest. These are various organizations that the Foundation monitors, viewing them as causes for concern and sometimes outright threats. This list includes the Church of the Broken God, a cult of religious zealots that worship an entity that combines a number of SCPs, as well as the Global Occult Coalition, a gun-ho organization policing the paranormal that shares an uneasy history with the Foundation. However, no member of staff could explain exactly why they thought Fraser Melbrook had any connection to these groups. There was no evidence that he was, but still, they had a hunch. And so, testing began. Hours upon hours of rigorous interviews and experimentation trying to understand what it was that made people want to keep this seemingly ordinary man locked up. After extensive research was conducted by Foundation personnel, they were able to determine why SCP-3017 had been arrested so many times before, and what had drawn the Foundation to him in the first place. Fraser Melbrook was suffering from a cognito hazard. This was a condition that did not so much have a direct adverse effect on him, but rather influenced those around him. Anyone that stood close enough to SCP-3017 or made an attempt to engage him directly in conversation, even those that just looked at him, all reacted the same way. Fraser gave people the overwhelming belief that he needed to be placed in custody, even if he'd not said or done anything to give them a reason to. Anyone that looked at, spoke to, or even stood near him became spontaneously aware that SCP-3017 was some sort of dangerous criminal. The cognito hazard didn't give people knowledge of his exact crimes, it more just made them believe that Fraser had a violent disposition and that he needed to be locked away. Any person staying within the vicinity of SCP-3017 for an hour or longer would experience further effects of Fraser's cognito hazard. Beyond just knowing there is something untowards about him, those who spent extended time around SCP-3017 would actively try to restrain him, and then after an hour, they would exhibit violent behavior towards him. They would start obsessively trying to ensure that he was incarcerated, almost like the thought of him being free was so horrifying that they couldn't help but try to arrest him themselves. Luckily, these effects of longer exposure to Fraser were not permanent, and often the subject's tendencies to try to restrain him could be cured through amnestics. The effects of Fraser Melbrook's cognitohazardous condition seemed to change relative to the amount of time he remained incarcerated. After continuous exposure to SCP-3017, the effects of his cognitohazard would appear to fade, meaning that those who had previously been compelled to incarcerate him would later become indifferent or even release him freely. This caused a problem for the Foundation and raised a very important question. How do you contain someone that you later feel the urge to set free? The answer was designated SCP-3017-1, a list of individuals with a connection to Fraser Melbrook, all of whom had seemingly become immune to the outward effects of his condition. Not one of these people could be convinced that Fraser was a violent criminal that everyone else saw. 
Among the list of names were Fraser's parents, Vivian and Beck, along with his siblings, grandmother, former classmates, and romantic partners, and his fiancée, Nadia. But you might be wondering, how did the SCP Foundation use nothing more than a list of names to keep SCP-3017 caged? By threatening them, of course. Researchers who interviewed Fraser found that they could greatly decrease the secondary effect of his condition, making them far less compelled to free him. All it took was them to tell Fraser that his family, friends, fiance would be captured, tortured, or even killed if he tried to escape containment. According to the Foundation, this didn't stop Fraser from trying to escape, though. His file states that he actively made several attempts to breach containment, all of which failed. The truth, however, was that just about any move that Fraser made was misinterpreted as an attempted escape. In one instance, while trying just to use the bathroom, SCP-3017 was tackled and restrained by a Foundation guard. You see, Fraser knew that just like with his previous arrests, he'd done nothing to deserve being locked up and interrogated by the SCP Foundation. But to the eyes of everyone around him, he was a dangerous threat. The researchers and guards treated him like a monster, because as far as they saw, he was one. By manipulating information about the current health of his loved ones, like telling him his grandmother had developed lung cancer, the Foundation kept Fraser under lock and key. Hearing threats against his friends and family, or bad news about their current state quickly put an end to SCP-3017's attempts at escape. Even though he was frustrated with the Foundation, he was without hope and had little choice in the matter. So, Fraser did his best to comply with his captors and offer the SCP Foundation information on groups of interest he thought they wanted to hear, even though he had no affiliation with any of them. By bringing Fraser's fiance, Nadia, into containment and showing him a live video feed of her, Foundation researcher Dr. Kiran hoped to coax a wealth of valuable information out of SCP-3017. Afraid for his partner's life, Fraser did his best to answer their questions, and Nadia was later freed and given amnestics to forget the incident. But Foundation researcher Rylan was quick to realize that the information Dr. Kiran had extracted from SCP-3017 didn't seem to add up. Fraser, of course, had no knowledge about any groups of interest and had to improvise to protect his fiance. Researcher Ryland picked up on this, remarking that SCP-3017's information could not be considered reliable but she was unsure if Fraser was hiding something or simply didn't know anything. During another interrogation, Fraser's brother, a former classmate, and two former romantic partners were brought into the Foundation and sedated. In an adjacent room, Fraser was threatened by Dr. Kiran with a handgun and made sure to answer for their questions. Every time he did it, the doctor threatened to shoot one of Fraser's loved ones. It was after this incident that researcher Ryland once again reassessed the information given by SCP-3017. Finally, she came to realize that there was no evidence of Fraser's criminal history, nor was there anything tying him to groups of interest. Everything that the Foundation had thought of him was just a result of SCP-3017's condition, and he genuinely had none of the information they'd been seeking. He was only answering their questions to protect the lives of people he cared for. Realizing the huge ethical mistake the Foundation had made, essentially psychologically torturing Fraser for information he simply didn't have, researcher Ryland begged her superiors that SCP-3017 be released. The request was denied, and instead Ryland was contained, believed to be a new instance of SCP-3017-1. With the help of security officer Rudolf Cardiad, who had guarded Fraser, Ryland escaped her own cell and the pair of them triggered a containment alarm. In the ensuing confusion, Ryland and Cardiad freed SCP-3017 from his incarceration, and she and Fraser escaped the containment facility where Officer Cardiad was captured and contained by security personnel. Ryland brought Fraser to what she thought was safety of his family's home, but neither of them expected to see what awaited them. The house had been burned to the ground, with almost all of Fraser's family inside. His parents, siblings, grandmother, fiance, and even neighbor had all perished in a fire that had engulfed the one place in the world that Fraser hadn't been held against his will. It is still unclear if the fire was intentionally started by a member of the SCP Foundation to drive SCP-3017 back into containment, or had merely been an unfortunate accident. 
but notably Dr. Kiron had been strangely absent during SCP-3017 and Ryland's escape from the Foundation. Overwhelmed with grief and despair, Fraser was last seen on a bridge not far from his childhood home, and researcher Ryland was recaptured without resistance by Foundation personnel near the same spot. With SCP-3017 gone along with his cognitohazardous effects, both her and Security Officer Cardiad were reinstated back to full employment with the Foundation. The Foundation then reclassified SCP-3017 as neutralized, quietly avoiding the truth of their mistake. All records of his supposed criminal activity and links to anomalous groups were stricken from the record as unsubstantiated. He had been innocent all along, just a man who had never done anything he was accused of and didn't deserve to be locked away. The SCP Foundation had tortured Frazier, asking him questions he didn't have the answers to, using the love he had for those closest to him as a way to try and goad him into giving the Foundation what they wanted, and in the end, may have been responsible for multiple innocent people being murdered. Perhaps it was easier for them to stamp neutralized on his file than to actually face up what they'd done to him. The Foundation has spent at least a century containing anomalies and monsters, but the hardest monsters to contain are often the ones that emerge within us, and nothing better illustrates that than the Foundation's monstrous treatment of SCP-3017. On the 13th of October, 1989, the town of Danner, Wisconsin was shaken by a seismic event unlike anything they'd ever experienced. This might have been written off as an earthquake, were it not for one disturbing factor. The ground-shaking event was accompanied by a huge spike of radioactivity. With the strange phenomenon happening a month before the Berlin Wall was torn down, during a period of the Cold War that historians call the Year of Crisis, it's easy to understand why the people of Danner immediately assumed the worst. But the huge eruption they felt wasn't the result of a nuclear bomb going off. The SCP Foundation was alerted to the event in Danner when they picked up a series of radio transmissions coming from just outside the town. When they arrived, they found something incredible, like something out of a sci-fi movie. Standing at the quake's epicenter was a creature that looked to be from another world. Standing two meters tall and weighing almost 300 kilograms, the being was green and brown in color, with a bulky humanoid body. Its head was a different story, though, and resembled a gigantic housefly with a proboscis and huge stereoscopic eyes. Surprisingly, the strange creature did not immediately go on a rampage. Instead, the being, designated SCP-2273, appeared to be exhausted, injured, and extremely malnourished. It offered no resistance at all to the Foundation containment team, and it was taken to Site-17 without conflict. While the SCP Foundation is no stranger to visitors from other worlds, there was something especially unusual about this supposed alien invader. The doctors who examined the creature and treated its injuries found an appendage that seemed to function as an organic radio transmitter, and large open wounds on its shoulder blades and forearms where further appendages had been ripped off. Additionally, while its insect-like exoskeleton was mostly a uniform green and brown pattern, the creature's upper arms and torso were dotted with a variety of scars and markings that, on closer inspection, looked like military badges. Was this some kind of wounded intergalactic soldier who had been stranded on Earth? If it was, then how were the organic badges on this alien's exoskeleton a near-perfect match to military badges worn by soldiers in the Soviet Union, even if they did reference a unit that didn't officially exist within the Soviet Army? The scientists were sure this alien wasn't an alien at all. Underneath its exoskeleton was a non-anomalous human being. If that was true, then this was even more terrifying than an extraterrestrial visitor. The scientists were sure that the USSR had developed a new kind of organic armor, and this anomaly showing up in Wisconsin was the result of a test on US soil that had gone wrong. If that was the case, then there was no telling how many more of these exoskeletons were out there and would need to be contained. The Foundation had to act quickly and find out more. While SCP-2273 was recovering, they called in Dr. Friedrich, an on-site psychologist who could speak several languages, including Russian. Dr. Friedrich would be tasked with interrogating the SCP on his origins and the nature of the suit. The interview was conducted via AM radio from a separate observation chamber, 
as the biological transmitter seemed to be SCP-2273's only method of communication. The interview began with Dr. Friedrich speaking to SCP-2273 in Russian, only for 2273 to respond that Dr. Friedrich's accent was atrocious and requesting he use German instead. SCP-2273, who, according to the organic military patches on his body, was named Major Alexei Belitrov, initially resisted being interviewed. He believed that he was a prisoner of war, being held by the American military. According to him, he had been in the middle of battle, and that the Americans had killed his men and left him for dead in the wilderness. Nothing that Dr. Friedrich told him, that there was no war, or that the Foundation was not affiliated with the U.S. government, could convince him otherwise and he refused to talk further. Before a second interview was conducted, Belitrov was given an old copy of the Level 1 Researcher General Debrief as a way of helping him further understand the nature of the Foundation and his containment. Belitrov was more cooperative after that, though the realization that he would most likely be kept in containment for the rest of his life caused him great distress, and he was unwilling to speak to Dr. Friedrich for another three days. Dr. Friedrich didn't give up, though, and when Belitrov finally opened up to the doctor, he began to tell him more and more. Belitrov told the doctor that when he was a child, Russia was hit by an American nuclear warhead, and that the Soviet Union immediately retaliated. The resulting nuclear conflict, which Belitrov called the War to End the World, caused massive devastation and left most of the planet dangerously irradiated. That is why he had the exoskeleton. It was to shield him from the radiation and allow him to survive above ground. Unfortunately, Belitrov knew very little about how the suit was made or how it worked, saying that it was built by the engineers and that it grew naturally over a period of several years. But Belitrov hadn't made the decision himself. It was his parents who had volunteered him as a test subject for the exoskeleton suit program when he was still young, hoping it would give him a better chance at survival. The process of bonding the exoskeleton to the human body was extremely painful, but according to Belitrov, its advantages far outweighed the pain. The suit not only helped him survive in a nuclear wasteland, but made him a better soldier. The suit allowed him to lift and carry up to 1,200 kilograms, gave him stereoscopic vision, and the organic radio transmitter allowed him to communicate with other soldiers across long distances, as well as listen in on encrypted enemy transmissions. The wounds on his shoulders and arms, where it looked like appendages had been ripped out, were where his weapons and supply packs had previously been mounted. Belitrov had been stationed with his men in the area he was discovered when they were attacked by American soldiers. The soldiers had ripped off Belitrov's weapons and supply pack, and did the same to all his men as well. They were all shocked, with Belitrov being spared for the moment only because the Americans had identified him as the commanding officer. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light, and the American soldiers vanished. Not only that, but the landscape changed. Where there had been a post-nuclear wasteland before, now there were lush green trees. Injured and disoriented, Belitrov began sending distress signals, only to have those signals intercepted by the SCP Foundation. The most interesting part of Belitrov's story, as far as the Foundation was concerned, came during his fourth interview, when Dr. Friedrich asked him about the engineers who had designed the exoskeleton suit. In Belitrov's own words, they weren't truly known to man until the years of the Great War and the Revolution. The French found them, in buried cities where the Western Allies were digging their trenches. Eventually, they were made to build weapons for the war, by both sides. By his description, these engineers didn't sound human, but they were by no means unknown to the SCP Foundation. Belitrov described the engineers as humanoid, nocturnal, covered in fur, and possessing technology and intelligence far beyond that of any human. Those familiar with the Foundation's history might already know the engineers by their Foundation designation of SCP-1000, or their more commonly known name, Bigfoot. A quick rundown. SCP-1000 are a species of intelligent humanoid primates that lived alongside humanity in highly advanced cities until their own technology was turned against them. Not only were their cities wiped off the face of the Earth, but 70% of their population was slaughtered, and the survivors were driven mad to the point that their mental faculties were no higher than those of a chimpanzee or gorilla. The SCP Foundation is tasked with keeping them away from human contact, 
in fear of what the creatures would be able to do to humanity if they ever regained their memories and full mental function, and rumors have been spread about them possessing deadly anomalous properties. But evidently, the destruction of the SCP-1000 species never occurred in Bellatrov's universe, or if it did, it wasn't nearly as complete. In that timeline, humanity regained contact with SCP-1000 after discovering their underground cities sometime during World War I. After this discovery, both Allied and Axis powers began recruiting them to build weapons, and their weapons played a role in both the Russian Revolution and the Second World War. It was because of these technological advantages that the Cold War escalated into what would become the War to End All Wars. Both sides were armed with not only nuclear warheads, but highly advanced, radiation-proof exoskeleton armor that allowed the conflict to continue even after the total destruction of the planet. While the humans fought above ground, life continued as normal for SCP-1000 in their underground cities. As Velotrov noted, they never wore the armor themselves, as they had no need to venture above ground. Only soldiers wear armor, and this is not their war. Velotrov continued to adjust to life in containment and sitting for regular interviews with Dr. Friedrich. He was given the rations provided for humanoid anomalies, but in much larger quantities, as the suit required him to eat around 8,000 calories a day to keep it functioning. Velotrov also began taking advantage of his ability to access the Foundation's library. He would often read or listen to classical music, particularly by the Russian composer Tchaikovsky. He seemed especially fond of reading The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. No surprise, given he was able to directly relate to the experience of living through an apocalypse and being transported to a strange timeline with no way to return home. But with little else to occupy his time, Belotrov began to display symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder, reporting in his now regular interviews with Dr. Friedrich that he was constantly reliving memories of the battles he'd fought and the lives he had taken in combat. The suit was making the problems worse too, it seemed. It was as if he could never forget, as one of its features was an ability to store and replay memories. This feature was intended as a strategic aid that would allow commanding officers to more effectively gather and process information about their surroundings. But outside of combat, this only served to force Belotrov into reliving his most painful memories again and again. Every night as he tried to sleep, he would see the faces of his men, their weapons torn from their exoskeletons, laying in the dirt after being gunned down by the enemy. Like many veterans, Belotrov was being hit all at once with the harsh realities of war. Now that his brain wasn't solely focused on keeping him alive, it had time to process all the horrors he'd experienced. He told Dr. Friedrich, I trained alongside these men for years before they put us back on the surface. Since we were all young children, we were brothers, and I gave them the order to surrender and got them killed. I should have died with them. While the story of SCP-2273 ends here, the story of Alexei Belotrov SCP-2273-1 continues. In 2018, Belotrov was allowed passage to Volograd, Russia as part of an anomaly reintegration program. While he was unable to secure employment within the Russian government as he had hoped, he eventually was taken in by a monastery and continued to write letters to Dr. Friedrich until Friedrich's eventual death from lymphoma-related complications. There's plenty more on the monastery, the anomaly reintegration program, and what happened to Major Belotrov when he returned to Russia, but that will have to be a story for another day. The SCP Foundation is an organization that polices the abnormal in all its forms. Whether it's a multi-dimensional chaos god, a big scaly monster, or a very effective coffee machine, the Foundation takes a pointed interest in pretty much anything outside the norm. So you're probably wondering, what would they want with Mr. Smith, a man who was about as normal and average as could be? Mr. Smith was a 47-year-old African-American construction worker with a wife and daughter. He lived a modest but contented life. He had a close circle of friends, a happy family, and was well-liked among his co-workers. But Mr. Smith had no idea about the anomalous nightmare barreling down the tracks towards him. Mr. Smith wasn't just about to have his life destroyed by an anomaly, he was about to become one. It seemed like a normal day at work on the construction site when he received a phone call. 
It was the police, informing him that his wife and young daughter had been involved in a terrible car accident. While this is anyone's worst nightmare, it was only the start of the horrifying things that were about to happen to poor, poor Mr. Smith. That night, when Mr. Smith went to sleep, he fell victim to a strange phenomenon. He started to disappear. While it would be easy to write off as the result of mental illness, like a kind of stress-induced mental breakdown, Mr. Smith wasn't the only one who noticed, or rather, didn't notice. His co-workers would slowly begin to forget details about him, even obvious things that you could glean from simply looking at a person, like clothes, height, or skin color. It seemed that, little by little, ever since his family died, Mr. Smith was becoming an unperson. This led to increasing levels of fear, paranoia, and distress, as people whom he'd thought of as his closest friends could barely recognize him anymore. Thankfully, Mr. Smith wasn't just going to slip into non-existence without a fight. He realized early on that his new condition seemed to abide by certain rules. The effects got worse in the night when he was alone, but seemed to lessen somewhat during the day when he was interacting with people. It seemed that he disappeared just that little bit more whenever he wasn't being interacted with. And perhaps he hadn't developed this condition upon the death of his wife and child. Maybe he'd had it for a while, but it was the constant presence of his family that kept the effects from worsening. But now that he'd properly identified the problem, Mr. Smith could begin devising some solutions. If nobody else was there to interact with him at night, he'd keep his position in reality stable by interacting with himself. Mr. Smith would repeat his own name to himself regularly, reaffirming his existence to himself. He'd often check his own pulse to feel the rhythm of his heartbeat. He'd write detailed descriptions of himself, either on his own body or a surrounding surface. And in one particular stroke of genius, he devised a method of recording his own voice talking to himself and playing it back while he was asleep to stave off reality decay. During the day, while at work or just existing socially in the world, he'd do everything he could to constantly interact with people. That way, they could keep reaffirming his presence and therefore continuing his existence. The symptoms of Mr. Smith's condition are somewhat similar to a rare mental illness known as the Cotard delusion, in which a patient believes they are dead, dying, or don't even exist. Except in Mr. Smith's unfortunate case, the delusion was becoming a reality. And this was a reality that Mr. Smith could only hold off for so long. Little by little, the coping mechanisms he'd built to manage his new life began to collapse. People in his inner circle truly began to forget him. His company no longer recognized him as an employee. To the people who barely knew him, he was little more than a ghost. A kind of palpable absence. This was the point when the SCP Foundation finally got involved. They swooped in and apprehended Mr. Smith, redesignating him as SCP-1467. It was one of the rare occasions that the Foundation didn't need to apply any amnestic treatment to bystanders, because, due to the nature of Mr. Smith's anomalous activity, Almost everyone who knew him was already in the process of forgetting him. When the Foundation interviewed a man that Mr. Smith referred to as a close friend, he couldn't even recall Mr. Smith's basic physical traits with any reliability. Because of Mr. Smith's condition, the Foundation had real difficulty verifying elements of his backstory. Mr. Smith told the Foundation researchers everything about himself, about his family and his life before but field agents were stumped whenever they tried to follow up on the information. First, there were issues with the existence and fate of his supposed wife and child. No records were ever found of either of these people existing, and there was no existing documentation to prove that Mr. Smith was ever married. The Foundation also looked into the deaths of Mrs. Smith and her child. There were no records of a car crash in the area that Mr. Smith directed them to. But that's not all. There were also no death records, nor any graves ever found. The construction company that Mr. Smith claimed to work for had no records of his employment. They couldn't find any of Mr. Smith's supposed extended family either. The only proof that he had ever existed was his physical body, locked in a Foundation humanoid containment cell, and Mr. Smith's own words. If you think this sounds like a living nightmare, then Mr. Smith would wholeheartedly agree with you. The effects of his anomalous nature traumatized Mr. Smith, 
He was diagnosed by Foundation therapists as suffering from bipolar depression, as well as chronic sleep deprivation. Though if you disappeared a little more every time you slept, you'd probably lose a lot of sleep too. The unpredictable nature of Mr. Smith's anomalous traits could have equally unpredictable effects on the nature of his containment, so he was classified as Euclid. Mr. Smith is one of the few anomalies that is referred to by his real name, at least to his face. When referred to as SCP-1467, Mr. Smith enters a state of rage and panic, and this mistake has caused several injuries for Foundation personnel during attempts to restrain him after using his SCP number around him. Mr. Smith is contained in a foam-padded cell to prevent self-destructive behavior, along with three audio recording devices, though these were installed at his own request, in order to continue his habit of recording his own voice to play back to himself while asleep. This served the dual purpose of not only mitigating his fading from reality, but also keeping him calm and docile during containment and these devices are kept in good working order in order to avoid creating hostility between Mr. Smith and Foundation staff. While it may seem that the anomalous effects of Mr. Smith purely served to create a personal hell for him and him alone, the Foundation wasn't so sure. The fact no records could be found of his wife, daughter, or extended family was concerning. It raised one frightening question. Are the effects of Mr. Smith's condition contagious? If so, he could be putting a lot of people in grave danger. Foundation scientists headed by senior researcher Dr. Thorne devised a series of experiments to better understand Mr. Smith's mysterious condition. There were 22 experiments in total, but things began to get interesting at around experiment 16. For this experiment, Mr. Smith was forcibly restrained and brought into a research chamber with research assistants Rainier and Dieter. They were told to simply observe Mr. Smith without interacting with him and record what happened in the process while Dr. Thorne supervised. At 10 minutes and 12 seconds, the researchers were unable to recognize the subject as Mr. Smith. At 14 minutes and 32 seconds, they were unable to recognize the clothes of Mr. Smith. Less than 10 minutes later, they were unable to identify his race. Five minutes after that, they couldn't identify what Mr. Smith was currently doing. 10 minutes later, they couldn't even identify how Mr. Smith was sitting. At almost 40 minutes, the research assistants weren't able to identify anything of Mr. Smith, save for the fact that there was some kind of humanoid creature in the room. At this point, research assistant Dieter started a recording, instructing Mr. Smith to describe himself on record. As this happened, Smith returned to a describable state, curled up in a fetal position on the floor. There was no sign of the restraints or the chair in which Smith had been placed, Subsequent tests showed similar results, with minor variations in timing. Just by being in physical contact with Mr. Smith, the chair and the restraints had literally faded out of existence. Evidence was really pointing towards Mr. Smith's anomalous effects being potentially detrimental to the people and objects around him. But the experiments continued. They had to know more before there was nothing left to know. The next series of experiments were performed with D-classes and led Dr. Thorne and his team of researchers to a number of frightening conclusions. Two D-classes locked in with Mr. Smith as he slipped out of existence began experiencing extreme states of terror and distress. Even when they could no longer see him, they could still feel the presence of an entity in the room. When the two D-classes tried to escape, one of them was almost mistaken for Mr. Smith himself. He too was now starting to slip out of existence. Both D-classes were summarily terminated, and Dr. Thorne began to wonder whether Mr. Smith's condition was contagious, or if he was instead somehow able to lash out at others in his vicinity in a more localized fashion. Only two other experiments were ever performed on Mr. Smith before further experimentation into his case was permanently suspended. In the first, a non-violent D-class was placed in Mr. Smith's cell and ordered to ignore him. Mr. Smith didn't take this well. He began attacking the D-Class, who fought back, breaking Mr. Smith's nose. Ironically, this physical attack was actually beneficial to Mr. Smith, as the violence helped ground him in reality and secured his existence just that little bit more. In the final experiment, Mr. Smith was given a cellmate, a female D-Class who was allowed to acknowledge him. The two appeared to become close, and their time helped stave off Mr. Smith's fading just a little bit longer. It's unknown if she contracted his fading condition or somehow was able to escape, 
but one day while Mr. Smith slept, she simply disappeared. Mr. Smith fell into a state of almost catatonic silence. Soon after, he began to speak again, only to repeat, I don't want to go again and again and again. Experiments concluded for good not long after. Because of his delicate mental state, Mr. Smith is allowed a visit from a therapist every week, and before any future experiments are performed on Mr. Smith, researchers are required to seek permission from his active therapist. Because of his effects on the minds of people aware of him, Foundation Protocol is to terminate Mr. Smith immediately if he ever breaches containment. The site director has also appended a memo to Smith's file, instructing personnel to refer to Mr. Smith as SCP-1467 whenever he's out of earshot. Doing otherwise will incur severe punishments. Records on Mr. Smith are backed up in six separate copies and stored in different locations, in hopes that this will prevent the information from decaying like Mr. Smith's existence. Mr. Smith's story is one of pain, tragedy, and existential horror. There's no shortage of SCPs that can cause XK-class end-of-the-world scenarios, but sometimes, the terror of these anomalies pales in comparison to SCPs that can bring one person's world crashing down around them. According to all the SCP Foundation studies, it's likely that Mr. Smith will disappear sometime soon, regardless of their intervention. Hour 1. There is only one news story on every website, newspaper, and TV screen. The flowers are blooming everywhere, all across the globe. Every country, every landmass, the bitter cold of the Antarctic gives way to a glowing rainbow of petals. The Sahara Desert and Death Valley become beacons of thriving technicolor plant life. The highest mountains, the lowest valleys, the darkest caves, the flowers even burst free from the concrete of cities, as if reminding us that really it was never our world. We were only borrowing it. And today, our lease is up. This is SCP-001, object class, unnecessary. It was foretold by tales from other dimensions, a distant future coming down the tracks towards us. And today, the train has reached the station. Nobody's reporting on how the economy or the stock market is doing today. No point. Celebrity scandals have faded away into nothingness. Greedy businessmen, lying politicians, brutal tyrants. None of them are making the headlines today. The very last headlines. The world gone beautiful. And what a shame. It takes the end of it all to make us realize what really matters to us. That's right. You're looking at the end of the world. But it's okay. Don't panic. Take a deep breath in and out. It was bound to happen eventually, so no point worrying now. Even the Foundation knows that this just isn't something they can stop. So instead of asking things like how can we prevent this or do we have any final tricks up our sleeve, let's ask a different question entirely. What would you do if you knew that you only had 24 hours until all life on Earth ends? Think hard. After all, even if you never live to see the flowers bloom, a final day will still come for you, just as it does for us all. Hour 6. A D-Class sits alone in his cell when he sees the flowers growing out of the ground. Normally he'd assume that this meant he was in some kind of Foundation experiment, but not today. Everyone on Earth had an innate sense that the time is now. A kind of gallows calm spreads out over everyone and everything. It's over, and that's okay. We all knew it was going to happen eventually, right? He sighs and gives a slight smile. Those flowers sure are beautiful. That's when he hears footsteps outside his cell approaching. A key slides into his cell door and opens. There stands Dr. Gears, holding a bottle of wine and two glasses. Anyone who knows him might think he's been replaced by some kind of shape-shifting anomaly, or had his mind taken over by a powerful cognito hazard. But no, it's him. The famously cold Dr. Charles Ogden Gears. Dr. Gears says, Come on, it's a lovely day out there. It'd be a terrible waste to spend the whole thing cooped up in here. It'd feel like a trick on any day but this. The D-Class nods and follows the doctor out. The normally oh-so-stoic Foundation senior researcher pours himself and the D-Class each a glass of wine and asks, 
What's your name, by the way? I don't think I ever checked. The D-Class replies that his name is Harold. The two smile and chat as they exit the now empty D-Class containment wing. Everyone else is outside already. Researchers, guards, administrative staff, and D-Classes. All rubbing elbows, enjoying the beautiful sun on their last day together. Elsewhere on site, a flock of SCP-514 is released, just as identical flocks are being released from every containment site all over the world. They've prepared it all for this very day. SCP-514 is a special breed of homing pigeons created by the Mana Charitable Foundation, which have the power to suppress aggression for those within their field of anomalous influence. And now millions of them are flying all over the world. After all, there's no point fighting on a day like this. There is no future left to secure. People always told them there would forever be hope until the flowers bloomed. No situation was ever truly over until the world went beautiful. But in the absence of hope, there was something even more inviting. Total, absolute calm. The Site-19 personnel sit together and watch the flowers bloom. Hour 12. All militaries call a global ceasefire. Soldiers from opposing sides hug and shake hands in flowery fields that once seemed choked by death and blood. Borders fade. Bitter rivalries turn to dust. Korea unifies. All is quiet in the Middle East. Gangsters and drug cartels drop their weapons and return home to their families and friends as flocks of SCP-514 fly above. What good is all the blood money in the world on a day like this? Wardens walk cell to cell through all the world's prisons, granting people their freedom again, sometimes after lifetimes of not having it. They taste the air again, feel the sun on their face. They close their eyes, drink it in, and walk among the flowers. Free men. Locations of Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited close their doors and shutter their windows worldwide. For the first time in as long as any of them can remember, they turn their signs to closed. They've earned a day off. Everyone has. The Chaos Insurgency rolls up their plans and burns them. They drop their weapons and throw away their tactical gear. As they do so, they can't help but question themselves. What was it all for in the end? What was any of it for? All the fighting and bloodshed and death. We did it day after day, only to do it again the next day. What silly reasons we killed and died for. What silly reasons indeed. The Global Occult Coalition dismisses its staff, thanking them for their service and telling them to go spend their last hours with the ones they love. Like the Foundation, they accept that this is the one true final end. No ritual to stop, no monster to fight, no evil extra-dimensional entity to thwart. Just go outside and smell the flowers while you still can. The Serpent's Hand are similar. They decide after decades fighting a losing battle, They'll spend their last day in the Wanderer's Library, reading some of their favorite volumes. All these wonderful stories, now left for other Earths to read. Their own stories would be counted among them in the end, and they take great comfort in that. In a sense, everyone will live forever in the pages of the books in the Wanderer's Library. Herman Fuller's Circus of the Disquieting releases all of its freaks and clowns from their twisted grasp to go and live out whatever small dreams and tiny pleasures they could find over their last hours. They have no foundation of fear anymore. Nobody minds their strange appearances and odd behaviors. Why would anyone waste such a beautiful day judging others? On the last day on Earth, there's nothing left to prove. Sarcasists drop their ancient fleshbound tomes, and acolytes of the broken god put down their gilded blades. On the slopes of Siberia, the jungles of Peru, and the most isolated beaches of Mexico. Twisted flesh finally touched living metal in the spirit of husbandry. Their eternal war is at its end. In the face of the blooming world, they didn't seem so different after all. The agents of the Dr. Wondertainment Corporation predictably chose to spend their last hours sitting around and playing with toys together. Time well spent, if you ask us. In a highly secretive location, perhaps the most heavily secured place in the entire world, the 13 members of the legendary O5 Council decide to just sit and talk. Anyone who knows anything about this secretive cabal can tell you, the O5 Council has spent a considerable portion of their very, very long lives trying to figure out ways to dodge and cheat death. But now facing a death they can't dodge, 
the same calm washing over the rest of the world has finally reached them too. All they can really think this time is, well played, Reaper, well played. As they chat about the kind of inane, casual things that they haven't had time to discuss in years. 05-3 suggests inviting the Ethics Committee over to join. Nobody disagrees. Hour 16. It isn't just the D-classes. All sapient and non-aggressive SCPs have been released from containment, free to spend the last of their time as they wish. Tens of thousands of anomalous individuals are released from containment sites all over the globe. It'd be the greatest victory that the Serpent's Hand could ever ask for, if they weren't all too busy reading to notice. SCP-105 Iris Thompson finally returns to her parents. The Foundation had fed them the lie that their daughter had died many years before, but as Iris had a tendency to do, she was ready to work a miracle. Her parents embrace her with open arms. They'll spend their last hours together catching up on what's happened since they parted ways and making up for lost time. They couldn't be happier. SCP-1867 Lord Blackwood, the fantastical sea snail, is delivered into a warm rock pool near the site where he was being contained. There he might finally have one more grand adventure before all is said and done. Though afterward, he may not have the time to tell anyone about it. A terrible shame, really, because nobody spins a yarn like Lord Blackwood. The non-aggressive little misters run free. Mr. Fish eagerly returns to his native Boston, Massachusetts, where he enjoys one more lobster sandwich before the end of the world. Mr. Headless decides to go hat shopping because he wants to look good for the apocalypse. Mr. Lost finally settles down for the afternoon, deciding that, just this once, he's earned himself a rest. SCP-2800 Cactus Men returns to Edinburgh to spend his last days picking up litter and helping old ladies cross the street. SCP-3663 The Tunnel Monster walks the streets of his hometown, searching for an old friend, hoping to reunite before it all ends. SCP-073 Kane decides to take a walk outside for the first time in thousands of years. He can't help but smile, as the bright, colorful life beneath his feet is growing faster than his presence can kill it. What a truly beautiful day. Knowing that there's no longer time for cults to form and bother him, SCP-2662 Cthulhu decides to take a break from his intense Minecraft session and go take a walk outside. It feels so good to have the sun on his tentacles once more and to feel the lush green grass under his suction cups. He shakes his head thinking once again about the irritating cults that had been pestering him for decades. What kind of idiot would want him to destroy a world like this? SCP-343, also known as God, sighs and looks over all his creation for what he knows to be the last time. His mouth curls into a smile as he thinks, Well, we had a pretty good run. Still in a cell, SCP-049, the Plague Doctor, puts his feet up and decides to relax. The pestilence will soon be taken care of. On some animalistic level, below thought, below even instinct, SCP-096 feels grateful that no gaze will ever fall upon it again. Somewhere fizzling in a vat of acid within a highly secure containment chamber, SCP-682 is feeling, for the first time in its hellish existence, a sense of profound relief. The pain, the hate, the rage, the constant termination attempts, it all be over soon. Hour 23. People gather in the streets. They laugh and dance and sing as the moon shines, fat and white, far above. Deep in their hearts, they quietly contemplate the end of all of this. But why worry? Why spoil the fun? There's no future left to worry about. Strangers become as close as family in the end. Human or otherwise, anomalous or non-anomalous, Chaos Insurgency agents have last suppers with ex-Serpent's hands and GOC operatives. There is no hate left, no violence. No malice, no cruelty. The greatest tragedy in all of this is that it took the ultimate end to bring it out in people. But why worry? Why worry? Seconds pass, then minutes. The world buzzes, it hums. Trillions of creatures doing everything they'd wanted even though it won't last. In the face of the true end, the world has never been more alive. Hour 24, silence forever and ever and ever. Good night. We'll end this video the way it began, by putting a question to you. 
How would you spend your last 24 hours on Earth? Let us know down in the comments, because it'll happen to all of us, eventually. What is your favorite word? Think about it for a moment. Think real hard. Write it down in the comments, post it for everyone else to see. How many letters does it have? How many syllables? Say it aloud. How does it sound? How does it feel on your tongue? Really, really think about it. Now make sure you keep that word in mind. It's important, and we'll come back to it later. For now, it's time to talk about SCP-3449. Look, there's really nothing any special about this one. It wasn't even important enough to be mentioned with the other info hazards. It's not an evil talking toaster, that's for sure. SCP-3449 appears to just be a standard spiral notebook. Notebook? It's supposed to be notebook, right? Anyway, it's just a standard spiral notebook with a dark blue cover. It's safe class, and it's stored in the standard, <coughs> standard containment locker in Site-19. There aren't any other containment requires, but testing is currently underway to determine, um, I think it's meant to be determine, long-term containment requirements. Ugh, this is a mess. Anyway, this item and its anomalous power is actually considered so inconsequential that researchers have explored the possibility of putting it on the anomalous item's log, a place where items too useless to warrant a full file ends up. Jeez, how do you misspell up that badly? It's two letters. Well, it's supposed to be two letters. How did you work Z into that? They aren't even close to each other in keyboard. <sighs> Man. Anyway, the notebook contains mostly blank pages. Some are torn, and only six contain actual writing. But due to the formatting of the writing, the text, consisting mainly of diary entries, is almost unreadable. This is due to syntactical errors, random capitalization, and rampant imp... misspellings? Great, you misspelled misspellings. <sighs> How cute. Apparently, all attempts to correct these misspellings fail, or even lead to additional misspellings. This anomalous effect extends to anyone attempting to write... Yep, that was spelled R-I-G-H-T. Anyone attempting to write about SCP-3449, including the script for this video, apparently. There are no further notable anomalous properties? Tests are ongoing, though those with any inquiries about testing SCP-3449 should contact lead researcher Niklo Gerdnell. The Notbok, which was misspelled even worse this time, impressive, was first recovered by MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, after a series of info-hazardous and cognito-hazardous phenomenon were discovered in the Pittsburgh Metro area. The source seemed to be a storage unit filled with anomalous items, and SCP-3449 was among us. I think that's meant to be among them. The storage unit was registered to a man by the name of Edward Salisborough, currently designated as Porpoise of Interest 4335. Whew, that's the end of that. Thanks for watching the video, folks. Now go check out... Oh, wait, there's more. Phenomenal. Let's keep going. Apparently, that version of the file was an older one. Let's check the next one and see if that's any more useful. Oh, oh, oh my. It appears that the updates here are actually quite extensive. <sighs> okay, let's give this another try. SCP-3449 is a Euclid-class SPC kept in the humanid containment cells of Site-19. Items affected by it are kept in standard storage lockers for safe-class anomalous objects at the same site. The primary reason for this shift is that SCP-3449 has changed its object of designation. It is no longer the Spiral Notebook. It is now a 34-year-old Caucasian man known as Edward Selsborough formerly known as Person of Interest 4335. He is believed to be the creator of the Notbok, as well as other objects found in the storage looker in Pittsburgh. Hmm. Foundation personnel are now trying to locate and contain any other objects created by Mr. Selsberg, though success has been lamented on this front. That was cute. SCP-3449's analogous abilities manifest onto both Edward himself and all the objects created by him. Ridding about him or any of these objects will result in synactical errors, 
arbitrary capitalizations, and rampart impspis smellings. Attempts to revise or correct the writing will either fail to remove the errors or create new errors. It appears that the anomalous effects of SCP-3449 proper are more severe than that of the ones caused by his anomalous objects. MTF Epsilon-6, also known as the Village Idiots, apprehended SCP-3449 in his apartment just outside of Pritzburg. He appeared to be in an advanced state of disorientation and dehydration. Records collected by the Mobile Task Force found that Mr. Selberg had not left his apartment in over 10 days, which would account for his dire health conditions. Selberg did not communicate with Mambas of the Mobile Task Force, but did not reset arrest and subsequent containment either. Uh, okay, okay, these spellings are rough, but I'm going to try and power through. I am a professional, and we're almost there. The following is the full lug of items obtained from SCP-3449 storage look car that also exhibit his anomalous effects. The notebook. As already discussed, the pages are either blank, torn, or illegible. Salzburg's computer. Files saved on this device include spreadsheets dealing personal finances, ideals for products, and an unfinished horror novel that is almost unwritable due to the poor quality of its writing. Grocery list had only two written items, Booter was spelled with only one T, and Medication, which was spelled Medication, a planner. Last entry was dated two weeks before containment, and believed to contain reminders to perform various chores. However, a mixture of poor handwriting and word choice allows for other interpretations. And finally, Mr. Salzberg's cell phone. Foundation researchers were also able to collect the call logs in hopes of further tracking Salzburg's pre-containment activities. The last three calls, which were all made on the same day two weeks before contentment, dialed different numbers, only one of which was in use. The Foundation made contact with the receiverer of said call, who had no knowledge of SCP-3449, and claimed that they did not answer the call. Lead researcher Niccolo Gerdinel conduced the first in interview with SCP-3449 shortly after his capture. When he entered the interview chamber, he found that SCP-3449 was just sitting in the corner, which with his head in his hands, rocking back and forth in what appeared to be apparent distress. He then began looking down into his lap and twiddling his thumbs like a child. Niccolo engaged him in a calm and polite tone, addressing him as SCP-3449. The anomaly made eye contact with Dr. Gurdonell, but he didn't respond, and instead continued staring at him. As Gurdonell asked further questions, Salzburg simply didn't answer, or would at the very most acknowledge the questions with simple gestures. Gurdonell asked whether Salzburg was making products for his business, to which he smiled and shook his head. Gurdonell then asked Salzburg whether he could speak or not, or if it was merely a choose on his part. Unsurprisingly, Salzburg offered no explanation, and the interview came to a close shortly afterwards. Tests are still ongoing to find out if Salzburg's inability to spac or communicate come as a result of his anomalous traits, or if this is simply a result of apiphonia, a uncommon but non-anomalous condition that renders its victims unable to spike. Tests have confirmed that Salzburg does have all the organs required for vocalization, but appears to not use them, for the tests are required. Alright, there we have it. That was a complete nightmare to read, thanks to SCP-3449's anomalous effects, but at least it's over now. <sighs> now, go check out... Wait, there's more. <sighs> Another update to the file. Good, okay. <sighs> Alright, let's go take a look. Oh, I see. This is a lot more dangerous than I thought. I suppose I better read on. SCP-3449 has been upgraded to Keter Class Anomal, SCP-3449-A. The new designation for Edward Salzberger is to be kept in a high-security Hazmart containment in Site-19. The inanimate anomalous possessions of Edward Salzberg are to be kept in standard object containment. Any reports written on SCP-3449 must be rotten by Popple who have been exposed to it 
for less than seven days in order to keep the files rateable. To prevent this infectious info hesmard from spread further, the number of people allowed to interact with this anomaly is kept relatively small and consists of those that have already been exposed at some point or another. This includes 05-8, MTF Epsilon 6, Dr. Teller's research team, some additional personnel selected for XPC-3449 research, and personnel chosen to update SCP-3449 documentation. Some additional personnel selected for XPC-3449 research and personnel chosen to update SCP-3449 documentation. While Edward Selzberg and his personnel effects are chronally locked up, SCP-3449 is not currently considered contained. Research into the sprout of SCP-3449's effects, the vectors for transmission, and any potential recremities for its degenerative effects are now top priority for all in loved before this whole thing gets out of hand. Further research has taught the Foundation that not only are Selzberg and his items powerful info hazards, their anomalous effects appear to be able to infect these who experience them permanently. Initially, it will a prayer that writing quantity only degrades when the subject is actually writing about SCP-3449 itself, but over time they'll come to the frightening realization that it actually affects their writhing as a whole. The effect also progresses in its summarity over time, eventually rendering the victim's ability to write legible sentences completely displayed. The initial anomalous effects of SCP-3449 were discovered when MTF Epsilon-6 writes their field reports on the Mater and found it littered with synactical error, random capitalization, and rampant implillings. Similar errors appearing in the initial fail about SCP-3449 only serve to reaffirm this observation. However, researchers only begin to notice true extent of SCP-3449's effects when the village idiot's field reports concerning other Solomonies came in with equally atrocious writing. Attempts to correct this writing simply led m to more mistakes and frustration on part of team. Soon after, a re-stretcher named Dr. Teller, who'd since tracked and over the SCP-3449 case and his team found that they were experiencing similar issues. They couldn't just make the blurs happen, no matter how hard they concentrated. They forgot spellings. They couldn't make hand move in the manner they waited to in order to form the wards. Even the most intelligent and articulate members of the team came across as extremely young children on page, but didn't stop there. Wasn't long before researchers who'd never worked on the SCP-3449 case started to exhibit these same suspicious errors in own writing. The Foundation didn't know how, but this slickness was starting to spread, with people's abilities to write degrading across the entire Foundation. That's when a Foundation web trawler picked up something even more distraubing. Global literacy seemed to be taking a dive. The telltale synactical error, random to capitalization, and rampant lingus spillings ticking up everywhere and for everyone. And the end of writing would be one thing, but SCP-3449 doesn't stop there. No, that's just the begrinning. Morse code go next, then pictograms, not long for sign language become hopeless scrambled communication bre breaks down little by little. People can't draw anymore can't move right hands call goes calls codes last go his voice talking gets her remember favorite word think about it say it loud when scp 3449 done when everyone infected you'll never say again nobody will ever say <laughs> Imagine for a moment that you are a teenager. According to our viewership analytics, some of you watching this won't have to imagine very hard, but some of you will have to really stretch your mind to remember what that time was like. Either way, put yourself in the shoes of an adolescent for a little while. You're anxious and uncomfortable in your body, desperately trying to juggle your responsibilities at school, 
your burgeoning sense of young adulthood, your social life, the looming specter of the future, and a dozen other things that might make you stress sweat through your hoodie. Somehow, in between the classes and extracurriculars, the standardized tests, and missed party invites, you found someone who wants to go out with you. You're not sure what they see in you, but they must see something. Several months into the relationship, you decide to try and take things to the next level. You wait for your parents to leave town. You pick out the perfect Netflix and chill material, dim the lights, and cozy up together on the couch. You go in for the kiss, and, shockingly, it goes over well. Then, just when things are starting to heat up, something doesn't feel quite right. You feel an overwhelming pain wash over your body. There's a flash of blinding bright light that burns into your retinas, and everything goes black. When you finally wake up, your partner is gone, only a grisly smear of dark blood remaining, staining the couch where they sat like some kind of gory chalk outline. Somehow you know, they're gone, they're never coming back, and it is all your fault. It sounds like the opening scene of a horror film, but for one unfortunate young man known as SCP-213, it was all too real. SCP-213 was recovered by the SCP Foundation in Palo Alto, California after his arrest. The local police department brought him in on charges of homicide after he accidentally vaporized his girlfriend. There were undercover Foundation agents in the Palo Alto Police Department who, recognizing this case as evidence of an anomaly, made a report and were ordered to bring the boy in for containment. During the initial attempts to apprehend 213, he vaporized the agents as soon as they made physical contact with him. Four agents were lost before 213 could be successfully brought into a Foundation facility, where his anomalous properties could be better studied. SCP-213 is able to sever the bonds between atoms in any solid matter he comes into physical contact with. During this process, there is a bright flash of light, and SCP-213 experiences extreme pain, often to the point of passing out. Like most sentient beings in containment, he is considered a Euclid-class SCP. SCP-213 was initially contained within a high-security cell in Site-77. The cell is surrounded by a 10-meter-wide zone pumped full of gases that are corrosive to human skin. SCP-213 was informed of the nature of his containment. Outside of the containment unit, two armed guards were stationed with high-pressured hoses, pepper spray, and polymer web grenades in case of any escape. However, containment of 213 soon proved difficult, thanks to the nature of his seemingly uncontrollable ability. 213 made seven escape attempts before one was eventually successful. He requested an interview with the researcher assigned to his case, knowing that when she entered his containment facility, the containment procedures would be temporarily disengaged. He vaporized the remaining containment measures and escaped from his holding cell. The head researcher attempted to grab him by the arm, but was promptly vaporized, dissolving into a pile of blood and tissue. Two more agents, who tried to block 213's path without touching him, met similar fates. After making his way into the hall, 213 quickly became disoriented. His mind muddled from a mixture of pain, panic, and lack of familiarity with the layout of the facility. He was unable to find an exit, and was cornered in the staff break room, the door barricaded with a chair where he was attempting to vaporize a portion of the floor. At this point, he was too exhausted to disintegrate any more matter and collapsed from exhaustion just as a group of agents broke down the door. He was, with a great deal of care and the use of a gurney to avoid any unnecessary physical contact, returned to his original containment cell. Several weeks later, SCP-213 breached containment again. However, this time, it was completely unintentional. Security camera footage from 3.15 a.m. on the day in question showed 213's bed and a portion of the floor vaporized in a flash of light, after which he fell through the opening in the floor and landed in the basement. This incident made it clear that 213 had far less control over his ability than previously believed. Rather than a purposely destructive entity, he was simply a kid who destroyed what he touched and could not do anything about it. If it could happen accidentally this time, when else could it happen? Could he, potentially, someday vaporize himself without meaning to? Following this containment breach, and some time to recuperate from the injuries he sustained from his fall, 213 offered to be more cooperative with the research into his condition. He agreed to comply with a series of experiments as well as routine physical examinations, and whatever else it might take to unlock the secrets of the vaporization effect. Just like the Foundation, he wanted to know why he caused this destruction, and how he could stop it from happening. During one of the agreed-upon physical examinations, the research team discovered something concerning. 
There were smooth nodules, growths of abnormal tissue on 213's back placed in the shape of a perfect square, with exactly 15 centimeters between each one. The nodules were determined not to be tumors or cancerous in any way. They did not seem to cause the subject any pain, and he could not remember how long they had been there. Perhaps they had been there his entire life. Nothing resembling the nodules or their precise placement could be found in any public medical records or research journals. It became clear that the strange spots on 213's back were likely somehow related to his anomalous ability. Medical personnel were assigned to monitor 213 in his containment and watch for any changes, and follow-up examinations were scheduled to keep an eye on the nodules and any other potential physical symptoms. A week after the discovery of the first four nodules, 213 was brought back into the examination room for a follow-up inspection. There was nothing new found on the subject's back, the original nodules remaining in their place and exhibiting no change in size or shape. However, upon inspection of his hands, the research team discovered two more nodules. When asked if he was experiencing any pain or discomfort as a result of these nodules, 213 insisted that he only felt some mild itching and irritation on the skin around them. A doctor pressed gently on one of the nodules with his fingertips, and it did not budge. With the appearance of these additional lumps on 213's hands, the research team opted to perform a biopsy on one of them and extract a sample. A local anesthetic was administered to 213's left hand, and the doctor attempted to slice into the surface of the nodule with a scalpel. As soon as the scalpel's blade came into contact with his skin, there was a sizzling sound, a blinding flash, and when the attending researchers had regained clear vision of the room, the scalpel had disappeared. SCP-213 insisted that he had not deliberately vaporized the scalpel and offered to try again. The second scalpel met the same fate as the first, as did the third and then a fourth scalpel. After the fifth scalpel disappeared, the testing was suspended for the day, and 213 was sent back to his containment chamber to rest for the next day's testing. From that day on, 213's demeanor changed. He was less enthusiastic about continuing to research his condition, complaining of a pervasive sense of exhaustion no matter how much he slept, ate, or hydrated. He complained of extreme pain in his back and stomach, which did not respond to treatment with physical therapy or painkillers. In spite of 213's newfound apathy, the research team was determined to persist. They had come this far in their quest to uncover the mysteries of SCP-213, and they were not about to let their subject's discomfort and a few lost scalpels stop them now. The plan for another follow-up exam and a new attempt to perform a biopsy were cut short when 213 was spotted via security camera having a seizure in his containment cell. He was moved to intensive care and kept there for further observation. Over the course of the previous 48 hours, 10 more nodules had appeared on his back, each separated by a distance of 5 centimeters. The nodules formed no discernible pattern. Once stabilized, 213 was returned to his cell, where more medical personnel were stationed alongside the guards in order to monitor his condition and watch for any further seizures or other adverse effects. One week later, everything would change, and the true nature of SCP-213 would finally be revealed. 213 requested his next physical exam, claiming that he had noticed something wrong with him while taking a shower. While washing his back, he was shocked to find the skin suddenly smoothed and unblemished. The nodules had disappeared, seemingly overnight. However, he was more concerned than relieved. He could not shake the feeling that, even though he could not see it, something worse had replaced them. A cursory examination could not identify anything in place of the nodules. However, a closer inspection revealed that there was indeed something there. Where there had once been lumps of tissue, there were now thin cuts, like surgical incisions less than one millimeter in width. Guards rushed to the examination room where the sound of a terrified scream echoed through the halls. They found the medical examiner white as a sheet and trembling. While she had been examining the incisions on 213's skin, the one on his left palm had opened to reveal an eye. Though she could not explain how, she knew that the eye was watching her, that it could see what she was doing and wanted to understand it. 213 was permanently transferred to a medical wing of the facility and placed under constant observation. The appearance of this eye sparked a new hypothesis among the research team. SCP-213's anomalous properties are not his own. Indeed, his body is not his own either. Some sort of parasite is residing within him, watching his surroundings through eyes buried beneath the skin. It is vaporizing matter in an attempt to protect itself from harm, and possibly as a means of feeding itself. When the eye first appeared and the parasite hypothesis was introduced, 
SCP-213 began to panic. He begged the research team to remove the parasite from his body, to cut him open and extract it by any means necessary. They refused, and 213 had to be sedated in order to keep him from attacking any of the medical staff. Whatever is living inside of 213, it does not show up on medical scans. It cannot, or will not, communicate with the research team about its nature, or what it might want. The more the medical team tests on it, the larger it seems to grow. With more and more tiny incisions appearing on 213's body, through which the entity can look. SCP-213 had been placed in a medically induced coma until the parasitic entity can be better understood and perhaps even removed from his body. In the meantime, perhaps it is better for him and every living thing around him if he just stays asleep. Ever since we took those first steps out of the primordial soup, mankind has long since looked to the night sky and dreamed of setting out among the stars. Space is, as it has been said, the final frontier, the vast inky void that, for all its perils, still holds a sense of wonder and calls us to venture out and explore the cosmos. The earliest missions of the space race during the 50s and 60s showed the people of Earth that, while it wasn't easy, the dream of achieving space travel was possible. And that dream, the willingness to chase it, is all you really need to get there. Well, that, plus a couple of friends and a Volkswagen microbus. For William, that dream of traveling away from Earth and up to the starry skies was inescapable. At 21, he was a guy like many others growing up in the 50s. His friends and family all thought of him as a bit of a beatnik, who was in deep with a lot of hip counterculture types. William had even dabbled in a few alternative religious groups as well, most notably practices like the action of transcendental meditation, as well as the teachings of Meher Baba, an Indian spiritual leader who claimed to be God in human form. In other words, William would have been a full-blown hippie in the 60s if he'd only lived long enough to see them. Even now, the idea of taking a summer road trip with a small group of close friends isn't unheard of, and that's almost exactly what William had in mind during the summer of 1958 but with a few key differences. For one, this was set to be a one-way road trip, with zero plans for a return journey. And why? You guessed it. It was because William and his pals wanted to go to outer space. More specifically, they wanted to drive to space, to leave the world behind and cruise all the way out into the shining lights of the solar system. In March, William bought a brand new microbus, a Volkswagen Type 2 Samba bus after pooling money for a down payment with his three friends, Jerry, Sam, and Susan. Ask anyone nowadays to picture an old-school minivan, and they'd probably end up describing the exact same type of bus. What had spurred them to buy a bus in the hopes of traveling off-world in it? Well, the three had recently been excommunicated from the Fifth Church, a highly secretive New Age religion. Members of the church, or fifthists, are all about conformity and control. You may remember these eccentric folks from our video on SCP-3512, The More You Know. But William's intention of traveling to space seemed to conflict with the fifth church's beliefs, most likely on account of his free spirit defying a group whose two main hobbies were obsessing over patterns and mind control. The young man believed there was magic up there among the stars, and refused to work a boring 9-to-5 waiting for that magic to come down to Earth. So, with the help of Jerry, he began to work on modifying the bus. Heaven was up there, and according to William, it was waiting for its angels. It took about two months, but Jerry came through. The engine compartment and cabin of the microbus were now airtight, with the section near the rear doors transformed into an airlock. The windows were replaced with shatterproof acrylic, the outer surface treated to withstand any space debris. The gas tank had been replaced with technology decades ahead of its time, but the steering wheel, gear shift, handbrake, and pedals all functioned exactly the same. One look at the outer panels of the microbus would have told you what it was and where it was heading. The word Starmobile was spray-painted on one side and the other Alpha Centauri, or bust. The 4th of July rolled around and their Starmobile took flight. William, keeping a diary of their journey, referred to himself and his friends as the only four people in the universe who were truly free. 
careening upwards at 82 miles per hour without any police to stop them, no longer restricted by mundane life on Earth. The group traveled higher and higher in their microbus. Their plan was to travel straight to Alpha Centauri, the closest star and planetary system to our own solar system. Thinking their journey would only last a few short weeks, William and his friends waved farewell to Earth. The bus had everything on board that these intergalactic travelers could possibly need, from bedrolls and pillows to sleep on to enough dehydrated food to feed the four of them for three whole months in space. There was even room aboard the microbus for Susan's cat Millie, as well as all the comforts of home. William and his friends packed bongos, a guitar, and countless books. But this road trip wasn't just an aimless joyride out into the cosmos. The intrepid group had enough supplies with them, and enough ambition to set up the first off-world human colony. They'd packed a seed bank, containing hundreds if not thousands of varying seeds from a number of common domestic plants from Earth. On top of that, there were even frozen egg cells of domestic animals like cats and dogs and livestock such as cows and pigs. These embryos were all ready to be unfrozen and allowed to grow once the gang reached their destination. However, it didn't take long for problems to start arising. For one, the group quickly ran out of libations within the first five days of leaving Earth. Spirits were naturally dampened by the absence of spirits, but William tried to remain optimistic hoping to grow barley and concoct some homemade brew once they arrived at Alpha Centauri. But while the lack of ale and lager was an inconvenience, there was worse on the horizon. During a group sing-along, something collided with the Starmobile. Naturally, all aboard were rattled, and it was Jerry who stepped up to calm everyone, stating it was likely just space dust or debris. He opted to take a look outside and see if there had been any damage to the microbus. Donning a homemade spacesuit, Jerry left via the airlock at the rear of the bus and examined, finding no significant harm had been done. But as he was about to make his way back inside, something struck the Starmobile again. The force of it caused Jerry to lose his grip, sending him drifting out into space. William was the only one at the wheel of the bus, but had never learned to drive. Eventually, he was able to turn the Samba bus around, but it was too late. Jerry was dead, adrift in the cold vacuum. The loss overwhelmed the group, but hit Susan worst of all. She and Jerry had wanted to get married the moment they arrived at Alpha Centauri. William had even obtained a minister's license so he could officiate his friend's wedding that would now never happen. Three days later, Sam and William awoke to find Susan dead on the floor of the bus. The grief and sorrow had gotten too much for her. According to William's diary, she died of a broken heart. Drawing up his guitar and strumming Amazing Grace for his second dead friend, William watched as Sam let Susan's body drift out of the airlock. He wrote in his journal that he hoped she would find Jerry out there in space, and at least they would be together. By now, it had been well over 50 days since the Starmobile had left the safe confines of planet Earth. The group had suffered two tragic, heartbreaking casualties already, one by accident and one as a result of the first. And yet, William and Sam, the survivors, were still traveling even deeper into the dark void above, plotting their course to Alpha Centauri as best they could with the hand-drawn star charts they had brought with them. So far, their journey into space had begun with promise and optimism and was now fraught with dangers and obstacles and these were far from over. Slowly, William began to realize that it was taking much longer to reach their destination than he and Jerry had first anticipated. Alpha Centauri is roughly four and a half light years from Earth. Bear in mind that a single light year is equivalent to roughly six trillion miles. William was unsure if the microbus had been traveling in the right direction, or if it had even managed to miss the terminus of the journey. The charts Jerry had drawn were of little help. He had been the expert. The one who planned the trip and modified the Volkswagen Type 2 Samba bus for space travel. William was out of his depth, hurtling through the galaxy with little help from his passenger. To make matters worse, both William and Sam had started feeling unwell. Not just travel sick, as you might expect after spending a long ride in a microbus trundling through space. Their illness wasn't even caused by being trapped in the cramped space for such a long duration of time. Blotches had begun to appear all over their skin, and Sam had been having trouble eating. At random, even a tooth spontaneously fell out of his mouth. 
These aren't symptoms typical of space travel, though. Due to a severe lack of vitamin C in the food they had packed, the pair of them had developed scurvy. Just as it seemed like a trip to Alpha Centauri couldn't have been a bigger disaster, William awoke to see something out of the microbus window, something he had probably seen hundreds of times in his lifetime. But seeing it now filled him with dread. It was the moon, as in Earth's moon. They were barely close to Alpha Centauri, quickly realizing that they would never reach their destination on their current course due to their grievous errors in calculation. William did the only thing he could. He closed the curtains so that Sam couldn't see how big of a mistake they had made. Eventually, Millie crawled behind the sofa and died. Meanwhile, Sam stopped being able to keep his food down. Towards the end, he could barely so much as see or even sit. Every time he asked his friend if they had arrived yet, William would tell him that they would be there tomorrow. He couldn't bring himself to tell Sam the truth. Finally, Sam asked William to read to him a poem by Dylan Thomas called And Death Shall Have No Dominion. He was dead before William finished reading. Saddened and filled with remorse, William pushed the last of his friends out of the airlock, realizing that no one would be left to push him out whenever he eventually died. The final thought he recorded in his diary came after two whole months spent isolated and alone in space before William's death. The last thing he wrote was that the stars looked so beautiful against the dark backdrop of the universe. In spite of the tragedy of his situation, so few others, especially from his time, would ever truly see them like this. Today, the bus is still drifting quietly through space. Now known as SCP-1958, it rests in the orbit of Mars, the withered remains of its driver still sitting at the wheel. William and his friends never made it to Alpha Centauri. In fact, it would have taken them almost 40 million years to reach it. They never saw their dream come to the ending that they had planned. Instead, William, Jerry, Sam, Susan, and Millie the Cat all died among the stars, driving their magic bus, their Starmobile, out into the unknown. For them, space, that final frontier, had a lot more finality to it. Water the wellspring of life. We've dealt with a number of anomalous water sources on this channel, like SCP-006, the much sought after fountain of youth, or the terrifying SCP-3280, where murderous water threatens to destroy the entire world. But we've never seen anomalous water that behaves quite like this before. In many of the legends of King Arthur, the sword of Excalibur is presented to him by the mystical Lady of the Lake. This lady emerges from the depths of the water, gifting Arthur with the enchanted sword. It's an incredible, if impossible, image. A woman appearing from within the lake, rising up from the bottom and breaking through the surface. It's safe to say that none of us have ever seen anything quite like it. Well, at least most of us haven't. In a small unnamed English village, there was a young woman who set out on a particularly lovely warm spring day to take a swim in a nearby lake. While wading in the water enjoying the sunlight and the gentle breeze on her skin, she saw a strange ripple ghost across the surface. She stopped her swimming, staring at the motion. She expected to spot a fish or some other aquatic creature. Instead, the water itself began to rise up, gathering and forming into a shape before her eyes. It was impossible, and yet here it was, happening. She pinched herself and found that she was definitely awake, as the water transformed into the shape of a human woman. It turned to look at her, shimmering eyes finding hers and liquid lips forming into a warm, inviting smile. Though this being was shocking to see, it clearly meant her no harm. It raised a translucent arm and gave her a small wave, as if to welcome her to its home. The young woman approached this lady of the lake, reaching out her own hand of flesh and bone to touch this impossible creature. Just as her fingertips reached the water woman's own, the figure dissolved back into the lake with a splash. The young woman ran home, telling anyone who would listen about the incredible thing she had seen that day. Of course, no one believed her. That is, until word of her sighting reached the only people who might take her claim seriously. The SCP Foundation. 
they sent operatives to the lake, where they managed to capture the shapeshifting entity dwelling there. SCP-054, also known as the Water Nymph, is a being made up entirely of water, with an average volume of 90 liters. When it is out of a body of water, the being tends to adopt the appearance of a humanoid woman, though it is capable of taking on a variety of other shapes including other humanoids, animals, and various inanimate objects. The entity is also capable of shedding its form and effectively disappearing into a given body of water. In order to avoid shrinking or possibly disappearing entirely from evaporation, SCP-054 is required to return to a larger body of water. Studies of samples taken from the entity's body, or its version of a body, reveal that it is made up of ordinary water. There is no apparent reason for its ability to move, and no thermal, electromagnetic, biological, or supernatural anomalies were detected. The research team could not determine what might make this water alive and sentient, and the nature of its unusual properties is uncertain to this day. When SCP-054 was first brought into containment at Site-08, it displayed surprisingly congenial and curious behavior, often walking around outside of the water and taking turns mimicking the shapes of various staff and scientists that spoke to it. Its demeanor began to shift towards suspicion and aggression, however, following a series of experiments and an incident involving the research staff. The first experiment conducted on SCP-054 sought to determine what would happen if the entity was denied access to any fresh water. Water was drained from the fountain holding it, leaving only enough water for it to form a humanoid shape, but no additional water in the basin to compensate for the effects of evaporation over time. SCP-054 became visibly frustrated as the water was being drained out of its enclosure. For the next few days, it enthusiastically greeted anyone who entered its containment facility, attempting to use a report and sense of familiarity to convince the person to provide it with more water. After it realized that this approach had no impact on the amount of water in its fountain, it became distant and even cold to anyone who attempted to speak to it. 054 only became friendly again once the water in its fountain was restored to a pre-experiment level. Next, the research team opted to test SCP-054's reaction to extreme temperatures, particularly extreme cold. The temperature of the containment facility was slowly dropped until the room fell below the freezing point of water. As the temperature dropped, 054 became sluggish and exhausted. It lost its ability to shift between forms, remaining locked in its preferred humanoid female shape. Its movement slowed more and more as the room grew colder, until the entity was completely frozen solid. Portions of the ice were chipped off and studied, revealing the crystals were identical to those of ordinary ice. After the Sub-Zero testing, the research team decided to take things to the other end of the spectrum and test the effects of heat on SCP-054. The subject was placed in a tank outfitted with heating equipment, and its temperature was slowly raised over the course of several minutes. When the water reached a temperature of 95 degrees, the entity's behavior became frenetic and aggressive. It pounded on the glass walls of the tank and attempted to break through the lid in a desperate bid for escape until the temperature was returned to a comfortable level. After the extreme temperature experiments, the previous calm and cooperative nature of SCP-054 was nowhere to be found. The subject displayed increased suspicion of the research team and would fight back whenever it was removed from its fountain and taken to a lab for experimentation. In spite of this newfound resistance, the team decided to continue their experiments as planned, hoping that the entity would return to its formerly docile self over time. Next, Dr. Seskel, the acting head of the research team, conducted a study involving SCP-054's memory and ability to be conditioned. The entity was presented with a series of increasingly complex mazes and puzzles. When it failed to comply with the experiment or solved a puzzle incorrectly, the entity was punished with an electrical shock or the release of silica gel into its body. Both of these options seemed to cause it a great deal of pain and distress, and it was eager to avoid further exposure to them. SCP-054 displayed impressive learning and problem-solving capabilities, revealing it is likely much more intelligent than it was first presumed to be. Dr. Seskel, observing the experiments and with the effectiveness of his somewhat unsavory motivational techniques, quipped to his research assistant that they would have it trained to fetch in no time. After several days of these experiments and repeated use of both the silica gel and electrical shocks, the entity's progress slowed down considerably and it became visibly exhausted. It was removed from the lab for a 48-hour rest period before experimentation was resumed yet again. 
This time, Dr. Seskel planned to expose SCP-054's water source to various levels of acids and bases in order to test its homeostatic capabilities, beginning with a 0.5M solution of hydrochloric acid. Prior to conducting the experiment, Dr. Seskel noted, I have no idea what will happen, but if this thing incorporates homeostatic mechanisms like I suspect, then we should get some insight into how it maintains its form. He also noted that SCP-054's behavior was becoming increasingly erratic, but made the decision to continue with the experiment as planned. SCP-054 displayed a now familiar reluctance when it was removed from its containment chamber and taken to the lab. It thrashed around in the fountain, splashing researchers with water, and retreated from them as they approached. In spite of its efforts, however, it was removed from its fountain and placed in the experimental tank. The solution of hydrochloric acid was then dripped into the tank, and then all hell broke loose. As soon as the acid touched the surface of its water, SCP-054 became incredibly distressed. It formed into the shape of a human face, eyes wide, mouth open in a silent scream of rage and pain. The water churned so aggressively that the lid of the tank was shaken loose, allowing it to escape the boundaries of its containment. The water formed into two large hands, which shot out of the tank and grabbed the two nearest researchers, pulling them into the water and exposing their skin to the acid now present there. As the men scrambled to drag themselves back out of the tank and their colleagues were busy helping them, SCP-054 took on its usual humanoid form and ran for the door. It then collapsed into a puddle, slipped under the crack in the bottom of the door, and made its way down the hall. It was apprehended roughly 10 minutes after its escape by a team of guards, who froze it using canisters of liquid nitrogen and then carried its icy body back to the containment facility. The two researchers who had been pulled into the tank experienced chemical burns on their skin, as well as significant mental distress. They were given immediate medical attention and placed on a leave of absence, and all experimentation on SCP-054 was suspended until further notice. At the recommendation of Dr. Seskel, 054's object class was changed to Euclid. SCP-054 is currently contained in a watertight isolation room, fitted with climate control equipment. A beautiful, intricately designed fountain has been placed in the center of the containment room, filled with fresh spring water in order to accommodate the entity's environmental needs. All maintenance workers assigned to the area must wear NBC suits while inside, and must spend 10 minutes isolated in a drying room after exiting before they are permitted to return to the rest of the facility. If 054 breaches containment, the area must be evacuated, and the containment chamber will be filled with liquid nitrogen in order to freeze its water solid. As the entity is highly sensitive to the conditions of the water that houses it, chemical levels and volume of the water in the fountain must be monitored on a regular basis, and kept at optimal levels for the health of SCP-054. During the course of its containment, following the incident around the Acid Base Incorporation experiment, 054 has developed a distrust of men, as the researchers handling that experiment were primarily male. In order to prevent future incidents and keep SCP-054 calm, no male staff are to be assigned to the team monitoring its containment unit. Because five years have passed since the last incident involving SCP-054, its object class has been changed from Euclid to SAFE, on the recommendation of the lead researcher assigned to its case. Of course, caution should still be exercised while interacting with the entity. This is the SCP Foundation, after all. And just because a moderate amount of water is good for you, doesn't mean you can't still drown. Experimentation on SCP-054 has resumed, though this time its boundaries are being honored, and it is allowed adequate time to rest and recuperate between experiments. All use of punishment in order to motivate the entity has been suspended, as it has shown itself to be more than willing to cooperate if it is treated with respect. Like all of us, it responds far better to kindness than it does to fear and intimidation. It doesn't just take on the appearance of a person, it has thoughts, feelings, and the urge to defend itself when threatened. So think twice next time you find yourself swimming in a random body of water. You should be mindful of what might be living in there. Not just of the fish, the algae, and the tiny water bugs, but of the invisible, intelligent, impossible creatures that might be swimming in there with you or even make up the very water itself. What is it that makes a person a hero? Is it a trait that you're born with? Something that you can inherit? 
passed down from generation to generation. Is someone still a hero if they never save a life but improve the lives of the people that matter to them? Do you really need a magic hammer, an enchanted suit of armor, or a tragic origin story in order to become a hero? Or can you still be heroic as an ordinary, everyday person through the simplest of kind deeds? Maybe it only takes a few moments in a lifetime to be a hero. Moments when you are given the chance to overcome adversity or conquer a personal flaw. Perhaps learning how to deal with defeat and get back up after, rather than learning how to never be defeated, is the essence of heroism. We can all be heroes, every single one of us, and in a way, we already are. Everyone is the hero of their own story, and if you want any further proof of that, then maybe you should take a look inside SCP-1230. An unassuming book is presented to you. Its hardcover is dark green, but other than that, there is absolutely nothing remarkable about it that you can notice. But little do you know, this book that you hold in your hands is none other than SCP-1230. So what's inside? Surely it must be an important anomalous artifact if the SCP Foundation has an interest in it. Perhaps it's filled with ancient spells or a mathematical formula to calculate the exact mass of the fabric of reality. Now, if you're expecting every page to be full, you'd be disappointed. In fact, only the first page you open in the book will have anything written on it. The rest will appear blank. And this can change depending on which page you open first, resetting every time the book is closed again. However, the phrase you will find written on that page will always stay the same. When opening SCP-1230, you will see the words, A hero is born. What happens after you read these words? Well, not much, at least not right away. In fact, you won't notice any active effects after reading SCP-1230 for quite some time. Until, that is, you fall asleep. And as you sleep, you begin to dream. Now, most dreams are pretty disjointed, sometimes fragments of memories or your deepest, most random thoughts. Of course, other times it's a fear, a long-held and deep-rooted phobia or manifestation of anxiety brought to the surface for a while in the form of a nightmare only to be forgotten by the time you've woken up. Perhaps that's why so many people look for the deeper meaning to their dreams, to get a better understanding of themselves. But this dream is different, far more vivid and memorable, with a meaning that is a lot easier to discern. In this dream, you find yourself as the hero of your own story, the protagonist of a fantastical adventure. It's more than an ordinary dream. It looks, sounds, smells, feels as real as the ordinary world you know. You will find yourself at the center of a fantasy world, where you are the hero destined to aid this troubled land, to bring peace and save the world. The fantasy you find yourself in is different depending on who you are. It's a dreamscape that has been tailor-made for your enjoyment, and your epic quest awaits on the path laid out in front of you. But where do these bespoke fantasy adventures come from? Does the SCP-1230 book itself bestow these dreams on a reader? Or is there some other force at play that creates worlds where the dreamer is the hero? Well, actually, yes, there is. And his name is the Bookkeeper, or SCP-1230-1. He looks exactly as you would imagine him to, an old man adorned in a dark green cloak with a long beard sometimes appearing to dreamers in order to guide them. Picture Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings books, but instead of the gray or the white, the bookkeeper is Gandalf the Green. In every dream caused by SCP-1230, the bookkeeper appears as the personification of the book itself, often aiding dreamers, willingly offering them counsel, guidance, and help on their fantastical quests. In an experiment to test the range of SCP-1230's anomalous properties, an SCP Foundation researcher opened the book and then boarded a domestic flight, spending the night in a hotel in his hometown. Even miles away from the book, the researcher still experienced a fantastical dream, and during this dream he was approached by SCP-1230-1. The bookkeeper was happy to explain the workings of the book, describing how SCP-1230 implanted a dream in the reader's subconscious mind from the moment they saw the phrase, A hero is born on the page. He claimed that he was the sole being with the ability to manipulate what he described as fantasy scapes, and that he enjoyed doing this, 
aiming to sculpt these fantastical dreams in such a way that the dreamer experiencing them would get the most enjoyment out of being the hero of their own story. Thanks to the bookkeeper, the length of the dreams vary. They could be quick, only lasting 45 seconds or seem to last as long as 200 years from the dreamer's point of view. However, in the real world, the person experiencing the bookkeeper's fantasy scape would only actually be asleep for an average duration of time. SCP-1230 only takes effect on living beings with the capacity for imagination. In other words, only human beings are affected by the book and are able to enter their own bespoke fantasy. When the SCP Foundation attempted to use a mechanical arm to open SCP-1230, the pages remained blank, leading the bookkeeper to explain to a subsequent dreamer that only beings who can dream may find the phrase, a hero is born within. Most animals or any machines that view the book will not experience its effects at all. So what can a person do within the fantasy scapes of these dreams? Is it an open sandbox to do anything and everything you can think of? Or do these fantastical realms have their own rules? Well, for a start, they do seem to be completely safe spaces. During testing, the Foundation conducted a number of experiments that involved getting members of D-Class personnel to read SCP-1230 and test the limitations of the dream worlds the bookkeeper created for them. Why use D-Class personnel to test out something seemingly as harmless as SCP-1230? Because the Foundation wanted to know if a person could die in one of these dreams. One test involved ordering a D-Class to immediately find a way to terminate himself once he found himself inside the dream world. He awakened after only 45 seconds of being asleep and described being at the peak of a volcano called the Ashen Spire. Apparently within the dream, the test subject had been sent on a quest to recover a sword known as Calidus, the Blessed Blade. He said these names had come to him as if he had known them all along. Following the Foundation's orders, the D-Class attempted to throw himself into the volcano before him, only to wake up moments later after feeling intense heat, but suffering no adverse effects in the real world. During the following experiment, Another D-Class was told to try and injure himself in the fantasy scape, but not a fatal injury. The subject awoke after six hours of sleep, feeling a numbed pain in the same place he had attempted to harm himself. But this sensation was never intense. In fact, it was barely noticeable. In his dream, the D-Class said that he had conversed with the bookkeeper, who had shown concern that the man was trying to cause himself injury, but thanked him for not terminating himself immediately like the other rude fellow that had preceded him. So, all of this sounds pretty great, right? A book that lets someone live out a fantasy adventure in which they are the hero of their own bespoke story. What could possibly be the downside? Well, the downside is this. What if someone preferred their fantasy to the real world? Now comes the unfortunate story of a professor working for the SCP Foundation a lifelong fan of tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. The professor filled a request for access to SCP-1230, and it was granted. He was apparently shaking with pure excitement. After reading A Hero is Born in the book, he didn't even wait until later to go to sleep, instead opting to doze off right then and there at the desk where he'd read it. After the professor had spent 15 entire hours asleep, concern had begun to spread among the other researchers. He remained sleeping, living out his own fantasy adventure for a further nine hours, spending a total of 24 hours in the dream world that the bookkeeper had made for him. When the professor awoke, he appeared to look around the room confused, unsure of where he was when approached by the Foundation's security personnel. Medical staff examined him and explained where he was, after which the professor seemed to regain his memory. After being reminded who he was, the professor excused himself to the restroom. He didn't emerge, and 15 minutes later a member of the medical team went to check on him. Sadly, the professor was dead. Scribbled on the nearby bathroom wall was one simple phrase, his last words. I can't go back to this. Attempting to immediately use SCP-1230 and make contact with the bookkeeper, another doctor tried to find the A Hero Is Born phrase within the pages of the book. However, instead the pages were soaking wet and on every single page, the same message. I am so sorry. I never intended for this to happen. I just wanted to make people happy. For three weeks, the book stayed like this until the same doctor placed a sticky note inside SCP-1230 that said, I'd like to talk to you, if that's all right. That night, the doctor fell asleep and dreamt of being in a dark void. 
There was only one source of light in the endless darkness, a street lamp under which he found the bookkeeper sat in a puddle. The old bearded man was sobbing uncontrollably, his cloak soaking wet with his tears. He explained through his overwhelming sadness what had happened to the professor. He had such an active imagination. I was able to create a vast and beautiful universe for him, and it was obvious that he wanted a life like that for so long. He conquered foul beasts and rescued princesses. He built kingdoms and even raised a family, but he never wanted to leave. He delved so far into his fantasy world that I soon realized he preferred his dream over the real world. I reminded him that this was all merely an illusion, but he wouldn't listen to me. He stated that if he was ever forced to leave, he would immediately end his life. I tried to keep him happy for as long as I could. The bookkeeper revealed that, from the professor's point of view, the fantasy life he had lived lasted 200 years. As much as the old man had tried to hold on and keep the professor happy for as long as possible, eventually he had to release him from the fantasy scape. And as a result, the professor had ended his own life rather than return to reality. SCP-1230 resumed its normal function a few days later, after the doctor left another note between the pages, offering some friendly advice to the bookkeeper. Now it sits quietly on a bookshelf in the Site-12 library, surrounded by fictional novels, the perfect material to inspire more fantasy scapes in the future. We all like to dream that we're the heroes of our own stories, but to quote the bookkeeper himself, as sweet as dreams may be, eventually we all have to wake up. Drip, drip, drip. If you see the telltale black mucus dripping from the wall behind you, splattering down from the ceiling, then it is already too late for you. The plaster will start to split. The wood will warp and rot. Metal will rust. You should try to run, attempt to hide, but know that he is coming for you. The old man, limping along relentlessly, never stopping to rest, to eat, to catch his breath. He has no need for such human things anymore. You can't fight him, you can't reason with him, and you can't kill what might as well already be dead. Just when you think you've found a safe place to hide, you'll hear a creaking from the floor below you. A blinding pain as something sharp slashes through your Achilles tendon is the last thing you will feel before the decrepit nightmare vision drags you to his lair, never to return. Even if you could escape now, the sickness is already in you, skin already slackening and muscles beginning to liquefy. He is rot. He is death. He is the disintegration of all hope and light, and he has made you his prey. We've covered SCP-106, or the old man before. We've talked about his abilities, his hunting patterns, an incident in which he escaped, and a variety of theories regarding his origin. It is unknown for sure where exactly the old man came from. There are three major theories as to his true origin, which created one of the most fearsome anomalies the SCP Foundation has ever come across. Perhaps he was a deeply disturbed World War I soldier who gazed too long into something better left untouched. Perhaps he was never human at all but instead a divergent humanoid species that preyed on early prehistoric mankind. Today we're focusing on the third possibility, and arguably the most tragic of the three. It begins with another man we've covered on the channel before, named Dr. Robert Scranton, and his wife, Dr. Anna Lang. You probably know them for two things, the Scranton reality anchor, and the accidental discovery of SCP-3001, or the Red Reality. In case you haven't seen our video on the subject, here's a brief recap of the whole unfortunate affair. On January 2nd, 2000, at Site 120, Robert and Anna were hard at work as the head researchers developing an experimental device known as the Lang Scranton Stabilizer. The LSS was intended to work as a reality anchor, but it was in its early stages and still unstable. A seismic event rocked the research site, damaging several LSS units and creating a wormhole that transported Dr. Scranton to the pocket dimension hereafter referred to as SCP-3001. This little pocket of space, this impossible world just adjacent to ours, has some unusual properties. It causes matter within it to deteriorate as its Hume level approaches that of the environment. 
Humes being the measurement unit for reality stability. Robert Scranton was trapped there in the red reality alive for a terrifyingly long time. Five years, eleven months, and twenty-one days before the logs he kept ended. There he struggled to hold on to himself. He grasped desperately at shreds of his humanity, his memories, even as the world around him slowly ate them away. Finally, only one thing remained. Anna, his wife. He could just barely remember her name, remember that he wanted to get back to her. There was a brief moment of hope on December 23, 2005, when the LSS control panel reappeared in a testing lab at Site 120. Dr. Anna Lang arrived to monitor the situation. A mass of bloody organic matter appeared alongside it, and as Anna called out for her lost love, something clattered to the floor and broke her heart. Her husband's wedding ring, stained with unidentified organic matter, smelling of black blood and spoiled meat. She collapsed under the weight of the possibility that her husband was no longer lost in a physical sense, but in another sense entirely. That this mass of flesh, unrecognizable as human, might be the man she once loved, tying his favorite tie for him on date nights, dancing drunkenly to living on a prayer, collapsing on the couch together breathless with laughter and the sheer joy of one another. That he could be both here at last, but gone forever. Dr. Anna Lang was taken to the medical bay and treated for shock. Years passed after Anna's last encounter with her husband. She carried the ring with her in her pocket every day for the first few. After five years, she threaded a chain through it, wearing it around her neck under her clothes. After ten more years, she stopped noticing it was even on anymore. It had become a part of her, engraved on her heart with the memories of the man she had loved, lost, and grieved. With nothing to go home to at the end of the day, no one to share her time off with, Anna began to pour herself deeper into her work. She would never remarry, she knew that. Robert had been the only man for her. Now there was only her commitment to the foundation and the research she did there, and the silent promise she made to herself that she would never let anything like the events of January 2nd, 2000 happen again. But will they? With no reason to go home, Anna's nights at the lab grew later and later. Her colleagues often joked that she might as well sleep there, since that was the only thing she went home to do. The sadness behind her eyes tended to cut their jokes short soon after making them, though. Anna liked the late night work. The lab was still, almost serene. She could disappear into the research, the calculations, let them take over and quiet the noise in her mind. The lights were dimmed. No one was asking her inane questions or bustling around while she tried to focus. There was nothing but her notes and textbooks, the light of her lone desk lamp glowing softly in the dark, and the work. It was one of these late nights, buried in a mountain of paperwork, that Anna began to hear a strange sound. She didn't notice it at first, absorbed as she was in a sea of calculations, but soon it began to permeate the room, breaking through her focus. A rustling sound, a crackling of sorts, quietly murmuring into her ears. Though she was vaguely aware of it, the way you might be aware of the wind rustling through the trees outside your bedroom window, she didn't truly hear it until she smelled something faint but foul. It was, no matter how muted, the unmistakable scent of rot. She stepped down from her lab stool, her joints creaking with effort as she worked out the stiffness in her muscles. She adjusted her glasses, peering into the shadows for the source of the sound, but saw nothing of note. She took a step forward into the dark, then another, and then another. Behind her, the desk lamp flickered, then cut out entirely. She stopped, blinking in the sudden, complete darkness and sudden silence. The noise had stopped. The only sound was her breathing, quickened with fear. She pulled the phone from her pocket and turned on its flashlight, using its weak beam to light her way. She turned back to her desk, looking for the issue that caused the light to cut out. Perhaps a short in the wire, or a bulb that needed changing. Before she could take a look at the lamp, however, something else caught her eye. There was something slick and red on her stack of papers, dripping onto the clean white surface and staining it with gore. A closer look revealed what it was, and a shiver ran down her spine. A kidney, fresh and human. She couldn't bring herself to touch it, but somehow knew that if she did, it would be warm. Her heart pounding in her suddenly tightening chest as the noise resumed behind her, wet, slapping, louder than before. Her feet moved on their own accord as she walked toward the sound, 
holding the flashlight in front of her in a shaking hand. The black wall of the lab illuminated by the light was smeared with something dark and strange, slick like oil, but with a rotten smell. A closer look revealed that the wall itself was beginning to change, drooping limply like wet cardboard. She froze, watching helplessly as the wall bubbled, crumbling to pieces. Suddenly a hand emerged from the wall, gray skin slick with black fluid. Its fingers, surprisingly strong, gripped her arm. She tore it away, scrambling back and saw that pieces of her lab coat had come off, melting into the gray skin of the alien hand. As the arm reached for her again, she stumbled and dropped her phone on the floor, casting its light against the wall and the figure worming its way out. There it was. An old man naked and gray with slimy decaying skin coming off in pieces. Its throat was shredded, an open wound, and it grinned at her with stiff, shriveled lips stretched over blackened teeth. Its eyes were the worst part, even amidst the rest of the walking corpse. They were almost like a man's. They were correct in shape and placement, but they were wrong. They were empty, clouded over and void of any warmth or mercy. As he stood there, the ground beneath him began to dissipate, melting into an oily puddle that enveloped her phone and snuffed out its light. There was only one thing left for Anna to do, and so, she ran. She turned and made a break for the lab doors, lungs burning from the effort. She cried out for the guard on night duty. Frank! Her voice was shrill and pleading. He appeared from around the corner, gun already drawn, eyes wide and alert at the panic he must have heard in her voice. As Frank tried to calm her down and she tried desperately to explain what she had seen, the old man forced his way through the lab doors, leaving a trail of corrosive black slime in his wake. Frank fired his gun, hitting the old man in the chest twice. He collapsed, sinking into the floor as his excretion broke away the tiles beneath him. As Anna and Frank debated what to do next, a drip of black mucus landed on Frank's radio from above. Another drop fell, landing directly in his eye. He screamed in agony, the mucus dissolving his eyeball on contact. Next, the empty grin appeared through the ceiling, and the old man fell on top of Frank, tearing out his throat with its bare hands. Anna knew that she had to escape. But where could she go? She couldn't think, couldn't plan. She just knew she had to run. She ran until her feet suddenly stopped obeying. She was stuck. She was sinking into the ground and then she was falling. Down, down into a moldy, dusty hallway. Dark except for a nauseating greenish gray glow. She had been pulled into some new nightmarish world. She ran through a nearby door and found herself shockingly in her old apartment. How had she gotten here? How did the old man know this place? There was her bed, her desk, her closet. She flung open the closet door to find a pile of rotten corpses that poured out and slopped onto the floor. She covered her mouth to choke back a scream, turned and fled. Then she was back in the hall. This time she recognized it. It was a twisted, warped version of Sight 120. In front of her, there he was. The old man had found her again. And now she was in his territory. He stared at her with those hollow eyes, and for the first time, spoke. <laughs> he growled. She stopped in her tracks, frozen to the spot. What he said next turned her stomach and brought tears to her eyes. <laughs> he knew her name. Again, he repeated. He reached out to her with a hand that had a tan line, where a wedding ring had one spin, the same ring burning against her skin under her shirt. He cupped her cheek, and she felt the skin sting and blister. He kissed her, her teeth melting and fusing, tongue turning to mush that dribbled down her throat and choked her. Her last thought, through the fear and despair, was the ache of love. Her husband was not lost, he was found, and he had found her too. Now they would be together forever. Not all heroes wear capes. Some of them wear Pokemon t-shirts and a baseball cap. You might think you've heard of every superhero out there, with Marvel and DC dominating the box office, and the incredible Cactus Man fighting crime on the mean streets of Edinburgh. But there is one tiny, aspiring hero you'd likely never heard of. In a world filled with danger and evildoers, one young boy armed with a pure heart and some telekinetic powers dared to step up and save the day. 
A woman was being abducted at gunpoint when seven-year-old Cameron spotted the struggle. He saw the weapon in the man's hand, the fear in the woman's eyes as she looked for a way out, and he knew that he had to act. He concentrated with all his might, reaching out with his mind and threw the gun out of the man's grasp and into some nearby bushes. The woman ran as fast as she could from there, but not before catching a glimpse of the child that had saved her life. Somehow, she knew that he had been her hero. Unfortunately for Cameron, but fortunately for the SCP Foundation, the woman reported what had happened to a nearby police officer, who just so happened to be an undercover agent for the Foundation. Before Cameron could leave the scene, he was being approached by a team of armed guards and brought to a strange new place filled with men in lab coats, who kept calling him SCP-2241. Cameron sat for a very long time in a white room, wondering whether he was in trouble, when a new man in a lab coat entered. He introduced himself as Researcher Valdez and told Cameron he was going to ask him some questions. He asked why Cameron had helped the woman instead of running away and getting an adult to help. He said, Superheroes have to help people. I can move things without touching them, and other people can't, so I should have used that to help them. He went on to explain that he had practiced his ability in the woods and kept it a secret from everyone. Valdez asked what sort of things Cameron could do, and he explained, I can move stuff without touching it, but not if it's too far away or if it's too big. Only like a cup across the room or a person's arm or something. Sometimes I, it can sort of change as well. When prompted, he elaborated. Sometimes when I'm moving something, it changes to something I want. Like one time when I was moving a stone, it changed to look like a toy I lost. But it changed back after a while before I even got home. Cameron became distressed during the interview, but Valdez promised him that he would be okay here. He asked Cameron what his superhero name would be, and he told him, Cameron the Crusader. Valdez explained that Cameron would be staying at the SCP Foundation for a while so they could learn more about his powers and help him become a better superhero. Researcher Valdez concluded his interview with this closing statement. SCP-2241 appears to trust me and believes that the Foundation is attempting to help him as much as possible. SCP-2241's account is consistent with the early stages of humanoid developing a reality-bending ability. SCP-2241 may have experienced abuse at the hands of its parents, leading to early development of said ability. In the event that a more developed ability is required for research, similar emotional stress can be applied by Foundation staff. SCP-2241 is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber. He is given access to television and comic books, though this access can be cut off as punishment for bad behavior. He is fed three balanced meals a day, with additional treats such as chocolate or ice cream provided after testing, especially if the testing goes on for a particularly long time or is exceptionally stressful. All personnel that interact with SCP-2241 are to call him by his name, Cameron, when interacting with him. Only Cameron's assigned psychologist and specifically designated personnel, such as Valdez, are allowed to develop a friendly relationship with him. If he becomes attached to an unapproved person, they are required to discourage this however they can. After containment procedures were established, Valdez and his team set to work putting together tests that would use Cameron's emotions and desires to save people in order to develop and strengthen his abilities. For the first test, they deliberately exposed Cameron to a D-Class that believed him to be a valuable hostage, one that he could use to escape from the Foundation. The D-Class abducted Cameron at knife point but Cameron quickly used his reality-bending ability to turn the knife into chocolate and escape. The knife remained chocolate and did not turn back to metal, indicating his powers had grown stronger. Details of events that followed this test have been redacted from the official file, but a note from a member of the Overwatch Council provides a peek into what might have happened. SCP-2241 has stated that it intends to grow stronger to stop more people from dying, and this will help both it and us in this aim. Killing a man with a teleported bullet was a stroke of tactical genius from the SCP object. MTF Theta-17 will be ready to respond during all further rounds of testing as a precaution. Following a series of tests, each of which included heightened emotional stakes, such as threatening the lives of innocent bystanders or treasured items belonging to SCP-2241, his abilities developed even further. In one test, a series of armed drones were made to artificially malfunction, posing an apparent threat to Foundation personnel around the boy. 
He responded by using his telekinesis to turn the drones on each other, crashing them into one another. While only one drone remained, he teleported its weaponry to a nearby field, leaving a harmless shell behind. In another test, a bomb was detonated near a member of D-Class personnel. The boy somehow absorbed the energy of the bomb as it exploded, transforming its kinetic energy and saving the man's life. Another bomb-related test featured man with a bomb strapped to him attacking a D-Class. In this test, it was ordered that the bomber be taken alive. Cameron responded by teleporting the bomb vest into an explosion-proof containment chamber and knocking the bomber unconscious with a single punch, though his tiny fist should not have been capable of delivering such a strong blow. In another test, a third bomb was placed in SCP-2241's chamber among his personal belongings, including some stuffed animals and comic books. He was very upset at this discovery and teleported the bomb high up into the sky where it detonated harmlessly. He remained upset for a while after, repeating, No one can take my things. It's not fair. I'm strong. I'm the Crusader. Moving on from bombs, the research team tasked the boy with stealing a box from a Foundation bank vault, which had been modified for extra security. He teleported himself into the vault, picked up the box, and then made a mistake. He tripped the sensors inside. However, he somehow slowed the sensors down and was able to teleport himself back out of the vault before the alarm could sound. This was the first task given to Cameron that could be perceived as morally gray or even villainous, but he performed it without question and this was recorded as a notable development. Next, a surprise long-range attack was performed on the Foundation site by a Foundation-owned robotic mortar. 2241 became angry, catching the bomb and throwing it toward the launcher at a speed that appeared to be approximately 1.4 times the speed of sound. It was noted that his abilities were less focused and his demeanor more violent when he was angry. He turned to an observing researcher and said, I hate them. I'm a Foundation Avenger and I hate the bad guys and I'm gonna fight them all. For the final test in this series, two D-Classes, who were described to 2241 as civilians, were held at gunpoint in rooms with bulletproof glass windows. He was told that the guns could not be affected by his powers, the hostages needed physical contact to be teleported to safety, and he needed to rescue them both before they were killed. Shocking the research team, he split into two versions of himself each teleporting a hostage to safety before returning to the crime scene to subdue the bad guys. He reported feeling a bit sick afterwards, but had no other adverse effects from splitting himself into two people. By the time this series of tests were completed, he was able to teleport objects as well as his own body, duplicate himself, see a few seconds into the future, and move or transform objects within a distance of 12 meters. He was excited about these improvements, referring to them as leveling up. Following these tests, Valdez planned to pause the psychiatric treatment of SCP-2241 in favor of a more hands-on approach. The plan was to begin neurological testing using a surgically implanted chip that would monitor the boy's brain activity during combat. The Ethics Committee caught wind of this and immediately intervened. They temporarily revoked Valdez's security clearance and placed him under investigation. They submitted an official report on this decision which read, Implanting a monitoring chip into a child this young cannot be done without significant developmental damage in later years. This will cause catastrophic problems for both the child and long-term containment, given his well-developed capabilities. Additionally, deploying a child in combat, even under testing conditions, violates all moral norms. Personnel involved in sweeping the previous rapid-fire tests under the rug are under review. The testing and research surrounding SCP-2241 did not only draw the attention of the Ethics Committee, but it also caused discord within the Overwatch Council itself. Following the Ethics Committee intervention, O5-3 ordered that testing be resumed, writing, These tests are more important than one SCP, regardless of whether it looks like an kinder. Long-term containment and observation is no longer a priority. Given the utility of data we have collected via intensive testing in the short term, the risk of the SCP breaching containment is minimal, given its loyalty. We now know which parts of the brain deal with certain anomalous abilities. With more detail, we can see how. We may even learn how to induce these abilities, and we will definitely learn how to neutralize them. Two other members of the Council were horrified by this statement believing that it went against decency and morality in a way that could not be justified. O5-4 submitted a statement. This is too far. 
We cannot let this stand as precedent. This is but one step removed from child soldiers, and even less removed from militarizing an SCP-level object. An emergency council meeting was called to address this internal disagreement, and the majority voted in favor of reinstating testing and exonerating Valdez of all ethics violations. I believe the results will justify both the risks and the means. We're closer than ever to understanding the mechanism by which human brains interact with extra-normal phenomena. The emotional and eventual neurological damage to SCP-2241 is unfortunate, but it is also necessary for the advancement of our understanding. In addition, due to the new modification of the monitoring hardware, 2241 can be neutralized quickly should it become a threat at any time after the surgery. And so the protests of the Ethics Committee were ignored. The concerned members of the Overwatch Council overruled and Valdez was allowed to resume his plan for testing and preparing to craft a super-powered child into a weapon. And all the while, a little boy named Cameron remained the test subject of the SCP Foundation, still dreaming of the day when he might have a chance to save the world. The SCP Foundation is responsible for containing some of the most dangerous forces in the world. Without them, we'd be at the mercy of the Plague Doctor, walking through the world and killing with a touch. Anyone could be snapped up by SCP-106 and dragged to a painful death in his pocket dimension lair. There would be no one to stop SCP-682 from devouring all living things in sight, and no one to hold back the dreaded Scarlet King from breaching our world and destroying life as we know it. We owe them a lot for sure, and they've earned at least a thank you card and an edible arrangement. But containing the anomalies of the world comes at a pretty steep cost. They're essentially fighting a war against a whole host of world-ending entities. And when you're at war, there are bound to be casualties. For some people and creatures out there, the most terrifying monster isn't 096 just trying to swallow them whole for looking at its face, or 173 just waiting for them to turn their back so it can snap their neck. For the unfortunates that find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time, the scariest monster in the world is the SCP Foundation itself. A decade ago, the SCP Foundation was attempting to recapture SCP-682, which had breached containment and was tearing its way through the southern Congo region. Unable to contain the monster by other means, and desperate to stop it from killing any more civilians, the Foundation decided to implement some rather… extreme measures. They deployed a variety of chemical agents and poisonous gases in an attempt to slow the creature down, but they had no effect. As the enormous reptile stomped its way toward a nearby river, with a highly populated village waiting on the other side, the Foundation made the decision to take things up a notch. They launched an aerial strike, deploying several aircrafts to drop explosives on the area around the river. They destroyed large portions of the riverbank, but the environmental impact was considered to be a necessary evil. When the smoke finally cleared and the deafening roars of the beast had gone quiet, they stopped their bombing campaign and dispatched Foundation operatives to the scene. There they found the bones of SCP-682, which were quickly brought into custody before the creature could begin to heal itself. The mission was considered a success, and they were ready to pull out all of their staff and head back to the nearest Foundation site when one officer spotted something floating in the nearby river. It looked like a group of human corpses face down in the water, their bodies badly burned. Concerned that civilians from a nearby village had been inadvertently present for the bombing campaign, a team of officers was sent to investigate the river more closely. What they found was not a group of dead humans, but something else entirely. They were, all along the riverbank and floating in the water, approximately 212 specimens of a previously unknown humanoid species. The bodies were clustered in groups of three to five, appearing to belong to the same family unit or social group. Many of them were frozen in positions of fear or attempt to defend themselves, with some observing personnel comparing them to the victims of the Pompeii eruption, stuck in their final terrified moments. What appeared to be parents and children held on to each other, some covered their faces, others lay in a fetal position. It seemed that they had known something was coming to kill them, but they did not have the time or the understanding necessary to escape it. Several of the bodies were removed from the river for autopsy and examination in order to understand more about this new, possibly already extinct species. They were humanoid organisms with an indeterminable genus and species, 
They resembled tall, thin humans with absolutely no body hair and elongated limbs. The most unusual aspect of the creatures was in their mouths. Their teeth were serrated and sharp, resembling those of a crocodile. In spite of these monstrous teeth, an autopsy revealed that there was no human flesh present in any of the creatures' stomachs, instead suggesting a diet of fish, livestock, and whatever else they could peacefully scavenge. Every last corpse was removed from the area and incinerated, to prevent any civilians from coming across them and asking questions. Just when the Foundation personnel were finally packing up and getting ready to leave the river once and for all, they heard something. It was a mournful sound, something between a man bellowing and a wild animal yelping in pain. Something nearby was still very much alive, and it was screaming. The officers followed the sound and spotted one surviving specimen of the crocodile people lying along the bank of the river. It was holding its face in its hands, curled up into a ball near the water, and it was wailing in agony. There were no visible injuries on the creature's body, but it was clearly extremely distressed. One officer attempted to approach the creature, calling out to it that he meant no harm, and wanted to get it some medical attention. It looked up at the officer with wide eyes, and its cries went quiet. The officer grabbed his weapon, afraid that the creature might suddenly rush him, but instead, it ran into the river. It jumped into the water, plunging beneath the surface, and began thrashing around. After a moment of watching its struggle, the officer realized what was happening. The creature was trying to drown itself. He abandoned protocol completely at that moment, diving into the water and pulling the struggling creature back to shore. It coughed up water for several minutes, all the while trying to crawl back into the water. When the creature had finally calmed down, it was brought into Foundation custody with no further resistance. It appeared to be the last living member of whatever strange human-crocodile hybrid species was living in that river, and it was designated SCP-6415. Since it was brought into Foundation custody, SCP-6415's behavior has been largely very consistent. Some SCPs are constantly attempting to escape from their containment or killing an endless revolving door of D-Class personnel. But 6415 is not one of those anomalies. It is not aggressive in spite of its crocodilian characteristics, and it's content to eat the food provided by the Foundation. It is fed a diet of raw meat, mostly beef and goat, which is provided fresh daily. The Foundation was curious to see if the creature could be pushed to be aggressive if its circumstances were made a little less comfortable. They deprived it of food for several days, but it did not seem to notice or even care much aside from occasionally looking at the door to see if new food had come. They tried sleep deprivation next, blaring a loud siren sound over the speakers in the containment chamber any time the creature was observed lying down or closing its eyes. It became listless and visibly exhausted, but did not act out violently at this either. After this testing, its ordinary feeding and sleep schedule was resumed. For the most part, all that SCP-6415 does is eat and sleep. There is, however, one notable exception. At random intervals, SCP-6415 will begin to cry, sobbing intensely and appearing to be in a state of overwhelming distress. Its cries are so loud that they can be heard from several halls away and have caused hearing damage in personnel in the room with it. There is no way to stop the creature from crying once it has started, though providing it with a hot cup of tea, a soft blanket, or a hug from a particularly brave and eager D-Class has caused it to cry a bit more quietly. Once it is finished crying after several hours of non-stop weeping, it will lie down on the ground and not cry anymore for weeks at a time. For a time, SCP-6415 was considered to be lacking human intelligence, and its containment procedures were changed to reflect that. It was held in the standard humanoid containment chamber in the light containment wing of Site-619 with soundproof walls. Because it displayed no threatening behavior, it was considered unnecessary to have any guards placed outside 6415's chamber. However, after Incident 6415-01, the Foundation's understanding of the creature changed dramatically. The incident occurred when several D-Class personnel were sent into 6415's containment chamber to feed it, and they found a harrowing sight. On the wall of the chamber, the entity had scratched a message with its fingernails. Its fingertips were bloodied and torn, its hands noticeably wounded from what must have been a great deal of effort. It did not acknowledge the personnel that entered the room, 
Instead, it just sat on the floor, staring at its work on the wall, cradling its injured hands and crying. Its shoulders shook with the force of its sobs, and its tears fell to the ground pooling around it. The D-Class personnel were later unable to report what they had seen without beginning to cry themselves, but eventually calmed down enough to report what the creature had written. Please bring them back. It was a desperate plea for the Foundation to somehow reunite it with its lost family. They had previously thought the creature to be a simple animal, incapable of understanding its own reality or communicating through clear language. This proved that the creature understood very well what had happened to it and was feeling the loss of its loved ones fully. One D-Class officer noticed a scrap of paper, likely a piece of butcher paper from one of the creature's previous meals, with a picture drawn on it. It was a crude sketch, but its subject was easily recognizable. It was the southern Congo River where 6415 was first discovered, with three creatures splashing in the water. The largest one resembled SCP-6415, and it was swimming alongside a slightly smaller adult of its species and a much smaller creature that appeared to be a juvenile of the same species. Context clues indicated that this was a drawing of SCP-6415's family, its partner, and their child. At first, the Foundation researchers were uncertain who exactly the creature was referring to in its initial message, but this drawing made it perfectly clear. It wanted its family back. It is uncertain whether or not the creature is aware that its family is dead, but it clearly feels their absence just the same and believes the Foundation might have the power to end its suffering. Foundation personnel who were exposed to the details of the incident became inconsolable, falling into a deep bout of depression brought on by a sense of shame and responsibility. When counseling sessions proved ineffective, the emotionally affected staff were given amnestics to wipe their memory of the incident, and of 6415 altogether. One employee, research assistant Cheryl Cruz, attempted to release the creature from its containment, insisting that it deserved to roam free. However, when she opened the door to its containment facility, the creature made no move to leave. It just stared at her, tears in its eyes as if it knew that it had nowhere else to go. Research assistant Cruz was given a powerful amnestic and relieved of her position at the Foundation. Her current whereabouts are unknown. In order to prevent any more reckless behavior from sympathetic staff, the message scratched into the wall was painted over, and the sketch recovered from its chamber was destroyed. But even if the memories and evidence of the creature's pain are gone, anyone walking by its chamber can still hear it weeping. It is uncertain what the containment procedures for SCP-6415 will become. It is not simply an animal and clearly understands language, though it appears to be incapable of speech. If it could talk, whatever it said would surely be heartbreaking. For now, the entity remains in its cell, serving as a grim reminder of the guilt that weighs on the Foundation's conscience. No matter what they do with 6415, they cannot take back what they did. They cannot lift the weight of the creature's grief or bring back its lost family. It is the lone survivor sitting in its Foundation cell, weeping for its broken heart and begging the Foundation for the one thing it can never do. Bring them back. The SCP Foundation is no stranger to containing dangerous entities capable of taking lives without discretion. But some of those entities aren't just mindless monsters. They're people with feelings and desires, stuck in an unfortunate circumstance, granted unnatural abilities by fate or chance. For a lot of human anomalies contained by the Foundation, it's not a stretch to say that they most likely wish they were ordinary, like anyone else that they didn't have to be locked up in a containment cell for the rest of their lives. As the years have gone by, the Foundation, much like any organization, has changed a lot. More facilities have pushed for ethical and humane treatment of anomalies, some going so far as to integrate safe anomalies into the command structure of the organization itself, with groups such as the Ethics Committee keeping the Foundation's most hardline normalcy supremacists from mistreating or mishandling the objects they're supposed to contain, it's hard to imagine that anything would slip by the ever-watchful eye of the Foundation's surveillance network. But in an organization this large, incidents are still bound to happen. While anomalies can be dangerous, the Foundation as a whole backs the ideal that they should be given ethical treatment, at least as much as they can afford. For safer, less dangerous anomalies, this is a lot easier to enforce. 
to suggest rehabilitation efforts and recreational privileges to be given to an anomaly capable of ending human life at a moment's notice raises a lot more eyebrows, even in the most progressive sects of the Foundation. That line becomes blurred when dealing with intelligent entities. What defines intelligence? Sapience? What distinguishes SCP-682, the indestructible lizard with a massive disgust for all life, from SCP-239, an ultimately innocent little girl with world-breaking reality-bending powers? This is the sort of argument that divides the upper ranks of the Foundation. Is the integration of these anomalies the answer, or should they be sealed away forever? Should they be uniformly treated as monsters and freaks, unfit to ever leave their cells aside from being used in testing? Fortunately for the anomaly rights activists in the crowd, the modern foundation is much more lenient than it had been in decades past, as research has proven that even dangerous anomalies, when given friendly treatment and basic rights, are more compliant, happy, and feel less strife about their situation. They can even be useful in some situations. Take SCP-5595, a sentient, sarcastic gumball machine located at Site-322, whose affinity for mathematics and harmless nature earned it a position at the site's accounting department. As part of a larger Foundation initiative called the Integration Program, which focused on integrating harmless anomalies into the site itself. In fact, SCP-5595's accounting skills were so great that it reduced Site-322 spending costs overall and opened the higher-ups to the idea of integrating more anomalies across the organization. If you need another example, SCP-999, the adorable orange blob lovingly nicknamed the Tickle Monster, has been used as a therapy object at Site-19 for years. But there is one side of the debate that spurs more controversy than any other, using anomalies as living weapons. The Foundation has long abided by the directive that its objects are to be contained and studied, instead of used in the field, as an uncontrollable object is more dangerous outside of a cell than in. But the directive has changed, especially in recent times. The Chaos Insurgency, one of the Foundation's greatest foes, utilizes anomalies as weapons to achieve their goals as do many other groups of interest. When trained human soldiers just aren't enough to contend with all the enemies the Foundation deals with, it's no wonder they begin to explore other options. And that's what brings us to the subject of today's video. The tale of SCP-4793, an anomaly trained as a brutalizing soldier who never really wanted to fight. This is the story of Androcles, a warrior with a blazing, savage fury in his body but with a gentle, tender longing in his heart. It all started during a Foundation raid on a Chaos Insurgency operation located in a mountain cave in the southern region of Greece. The deadly insurgency, always on the prowl for more anomalous weapons to use in its unending battle against the Foundation, had hired a team of mercenaries to scour the region for potential anomalous activity. They came across something buried in the mountains they were certain was anomalous, and after communicating with their superiors, decided to dig it up and see what it was about. Naturally, word of such a discovery travels fast, and with how many undercover operatives the Foundation keeps embedded inside the insurgency, in order to keep tabs on what their enemies are doing, it's no surprise that the Foundation mobilized its forces to get the drop on whatever this anomalous excavation site was. The mission was simple enough. MTF Upsilon 11, nicknamed Avalon's Wake, a team of combat specialists led by the skilled Captain Holly Shore would infiltrate their camp and seize any anomalous objects in the mercenaries' possession. Getting past the relatively unguarded entrance was a cakewalk, as the task force took out a single guard and were able to slip deeper into the cave undetected. Inside, they found a massive pit, surrounded by colorful stalagmites and flowing waterfalls. At the center of the pit, next to a smattering of camping supplies and bright floodlights, was a large stone stele, a type of pillar most often used in ancient times that would be carved with important messages or stories. The details were grainy from a distance, but the team could make out an engraved image of a Spartan hoplite soldier on the pillar. Surrounding the stele were five mercenaries, armed and in the process of digging out the pillar from beneath the rock. Captain Shore knew that this was most likely the big object the Chaos Insurgency were after. She and her team took cover, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. But their wait wasn't long. One of the mercenaries shoveling the ground near the stele let out a scream, 
They had cut themselves, splattering a small amount of blood on the stone monument. The mercenaries panicked, readying their arms. They weren't sure what was going to happen next, but with enough experience in the field, they knew that introducing an anomaly to human blood often had severe consequences, and their suspicions were proven correct. A flash of light surrounded the cave, and from the steely emerged a warrior, clad in the same armor as the Spartan soldier engraved on the monument's carving. The entity was clearly confused, and asked in English if the mercenary spoke Greek. Instead, they thrust their guns forward, screaming at the soldier to not move. The soldier was compliant, but one of the mercenaries, feeling it to be a cruel way to establish dominance over their new anomalous toy, shot at the soldier's exposed leg. What happened next was a whirlwind of swearing, blood, and combat. The mercenaries opened fire on the soldier, who retaliated back by using powerful hand-to-hand -hand combat. For whatever reason, bullets just couldn't seem to harm the soldier. He tanked dozens of open shots across his body, the rounds deflecting off his armor. As the soldier picked up a mercenary by the throat, the Kevlar vest he was wearing suddenly flung itself from the man's body and integrated itself onto the soldier's armor. The mercenary immediately recognized this as one of the soldier's anomalous abilities, but was powerless to stop it as it was slammed against the stone wall, falling to the ground. The Foundation Task Force watched in awe as the soldier took out each of the mercenaries, one by one. Captain Shore, seeing that the soldier was continually begging the mercenaries to stop shooting at it the entire time, sensed that there was a peaceful, humane side to the entity, a stark contrast to the acts of brutality it used to dispatch the mercenaries. Shore told her men to move forward, but with their weapons lowered. The soldier, holding on to a knife it grabbed earlier, stood on guard, but surrendered without question when he realized the Foundation operatives were not there to fight him. Captain Shore introduced herself and her men as part of the Foundation, and the soldier, clearly upset and distraught over the carnage he caused, introduced himself as Androcles. The team promised Androcles they would take him somewhere safe, and he complied. Little would he know that his journey with the Foundation was just beginning. Androcles was given the designation SCP-4793, and initial assessment found him to be anomalously strong with the ability to integrate any solid material into a weapon, either as a piece of armor, like it did with the mercenary's Kevlar vest, or as a weapon itself, such as turning the steel leg of a chair into a sharpened sword. Though this ability did have its limits, as Androcles had difficulty incorporating firearms and complex electronics as weapons or armor. On top of that, SCP-4793 was extremely durable and able to heal any wounds on its body almost instantaneously. Coupled with his highly trained fighting skills and raging fury, Androcles was a true warrior, capable of great power and might. But his wild side seemed to disappear when the heat of battle died down. One of Site-20's senior researchers, Dr. Fitzpatrick, was tasked with interviewing SCP-4793 weekly, and she discovered that SCP-4793 had a completely different element to his personality. He was intelligent, kind, gentle, and hated fighting. He couldn't remember much of his life from thousands of years ago, but he knew that he was a great warrior who caused mass destruction with his power alone. Androcles didn't want to be someone like that. He had an interest in history, in books, and learning why he woke up, what the world was like now, and why it had changed. Androcles wanted to know why there were metal birds in the sky and horseless chariots on the ground. Dr. Fitzpatrick found him to be a remarkable person and commended SCP-4793's behavior with access to various literature and history books so he could learn about the things he desperately wanted to know. But most of all, she was taken back by how averse he was to becoming his past self, a heartless warrior who killed indiscriminately. It seemed as if Androcles was so traumatized by his past actions that he sealed away those memories to forget about them as best he could. But Site-20's director, Jack Hargrave, saw Androcles as a mere tool, something he could use to achieve a nefarious goal he had been planning for a long, long time. Hargraves wanted to use SCP-4793's raw power to benefit the Foundation. From his office, he sat back, imagining the unstoppable force that a trained Androcles would be. 
If he could force him to fight, and he knew he could, then the Foundation would have a deadly weapon in their hands. Something that would surely even the odds between the Chaos Insurgency and those other pesky groups of interest. Director Hargraves forced SCP-4793 to train his combat abilities in a variety of sparring sessions with Captain Shore, the task force captain who discovered him in the mountains. Hargraves' regimen was brutal and he often threatened to blow up the explosive collars on SCP-4793's neck and wrists if he held back against Shore or disobeyed his orders. Androcles could take the explosion, but Shore would surely be caught in the blast, killing her. Androcles hated Hargraves, but cared about Shore, who showed him kindness and understood his difficult position. Over the next two years, Androcles would train weekly with Shore, sparring with each other using a variety of weapons, from swords to firearms. SCP-4793 still held back, not wanting to fight, and wanting even less to accidentally injure Holly Shore, who he was growing to see as a friend. In the meantime, Dr. Fitzpatrick continued to interview SCP-4793 weekly, also growing a friendship with the entity. But for as much as she cared about Androcles, she couldn't help him the way she wanted to. Hargraves was set on making SCP-4793 a functional weapon on the field, and he was growing impatient waiting for results. Hargraves was pushing Androcles beyond his comfort zone, switching up his sparring partners from Shore, who he trusted deeply, to other individuals or changing what weapons he had to use. Androcles hated this, not because he was scared to fight, but because he was anxious about what he could become if he let loose. He never wanted to be the monster that he knew he was capable of being. He never wanted to hurt someone. In the meantime, Hargraves began to have doubts about Androcles. His humanity and reluctance would slow him down in the field, keep him from being the perfect super soldier Hargraves wanted him to be. So he began development on another project, codenamed X-06. This mysterious weapons program was kept under wraps, limited in knowledge to only Hargraves and his most trusted men. If he couldn't have Androcles, he would simply have to do better, and he knew he would. While Hargraves worked in the shadows, the SCP-4793 research team uncovered a section of Androcles' past that he had forgotten. The steely he was trapped inside had an inscription on its front, written in ancient Greek. When it was translated and sent to Dr. Fitzpatrick, this is what it read. Gather around me, children. I will tell you the story of sweet Androcles, fierce as a pride of lions and as cunning as a pack of wolves. He lived for nothing but battle. He was beloved by his countrymen and feared by his enemies, so much so that Ares himself strode down from Olympus to challenge him to single combat. For ten days they fought a terrible duel, their blades cutting earth into islands and the sparks turning mountains into forges for Hephaestus. Impressed, he granted Androcles a boon. So long as he fought, he would never know defeat or age, and by mixing his ichor with Androcles' blood, Ares declared him kin to the gods themselves. As he came to bear on the world, he met his match in a woman from a distant land. With skin of white as sand covered in blues from the ocean, she blazed in his eyes like Helios' chariot. Together the mountains bowed before them, but even as Eros' arrow brought them together, an arrow split them apart. For jealous Ares saw his favored love something other than himself. With his guiding star gone, Androcles tore the bones of the earth itself. With his rage and lust for battle extinguished, he turned the battlefield into twin mountains. With his purpose lost, he was entombed there forevermore. Androcles was shaken by the revelations of his warrior past, and in the present, he couldn't shake the feelings that Captain Shore reminded him of his past lover. The feeling was so strong that during a sparring session, Androcles passed out, overwhelmed by how much she reminded him of her, the woman who he remembered to be his wife, Arabelle. Androcles continued to confide in Dr. Fitzpatrick about his feelings about Captain Shore, and especially about fighting for the Foundation. He didn't understand this strange new world or what exactly he would be fighting for, and the stories he heard about previous attempts to utilize anomalous soldiers in battle terrified him. The story of SCP-076 Abel, killing his entire task force team after losing control haunted him at night. He never wanted to become that. 
but Hargraves' secret project reached its completion before Androcles could be molded into the perfect warrior. Little did Hargraves know, however, that Fitzpatrick was keeping tabs on all of his shady behavior in hopes of one day exposing him for the monster that he was to the ethics committee, or maybe even the overseer council. Still, she took the job, wanting to see what monstrosity Hargraves had created as a result of his experiments. Fitzpatrick was shocked to see it. Hargrave's secret experiment was a black-winged, clawed creature with way too many teeth. From behind its containment cylinder, it grinned and chuckled an inhuman laugh. Hargraves was truly creating monsters. As Hargraves explained, the creature had near-human intelligence and could reproduce asexually, meaning all it took was one of them for it to multiply. With this new anomaly, he could revolutionize the Foundation's ways of waging war. A perfect soldier, one that wouldn't be held back by human emotion. Fitzpatrick voiced her concern but was cut short by Hargrave suddenly panicking. He noticed that there was only one X-06 entity in the cylinder, when he was sure there were two. And suddenly from the ceiling, one of the entities fell to the ground, flapping its wings and screaming in the researchers' faces. The worst had happened. The X-06 entities had broken free, and if they weren't stopped soon, they would run rampant over Site 20. The two fled for safety, but the horrifying creature chased after them. Androcles and Captain Shore soon learned of the containment breach as well, after their sparring session was cut short by a creature breaking into the room. Androcles made short work of it, but it was too late. Site 20 was overrun with Hargraves' beasts. There were hundreds of them and those numbers would continue to grow. They infiltrated the entire facility, leaving Androcles and Captain Shore with one option, to fight. Androcles didn't want to do it, but this was different. He needed to be a hero and save the people still trapped in Site-20's facilities. He would have to use force, but if he was helping others, then it was justified, he reluctantly told himself. Still, he hated it. And as Captain Shore and her task force as well as SCP-4793 moved through Site-20, taking out one entity after another, Androcles realized how hopeless the situation was looking. There were simply too many of them. They needed to focus their efforts on getting people out of the site rather than hoping to fight back. While most personnel were slaughtered in the carnage, at the site's D-Class block, the team found a holdout of guards and D-Class, who were conveniently relocated to an above-ground elevator that could escort them safely out of the site. Androcles made the decision there, to let Captain Shore and her men, as well as the survivors, get to the surface, where he would stay below and fight. He didn't want to do it, but Androcles had a plan. Shore didn't want to leave him behind, but she had no choice. After parting in the heat of an X-06 ambush on the block, Androcles was alone, while the survivors were on the surface. Fighting without holding back, Androcles tore through hundreds of X-06 entities, going deeper and deeper into the site. His plan was dangerous, but it would save everyone at the expense of his own life. Androcles knew how dangerous those X-06 entities could be if they were let loose into the world, and that was why he decided he would blow up Site-20's reactor, destroying both himself the site, and every single creature. As he was about to do just that, Androcles found Director Hargraves in the rubble of the reactor room. Hargrave was heavily wounded, and Androcles felt such rage and anger towards the man, especially when he revealed that the X-06 creatures were genetically engineered from Androcles' own blood. But he didn't hurt him. He was better than the monster Hargraves saw him as. Instead, Androcles set Hargraves up on the elevator to the surface, knowing that the Overseer Council would serve a far worse punishment than he ever could. Before blowing up the reactor, Androcles recorded one last message. He addressed it to Holly Shore, the captain who had shown him so much kindness. I was born to a farmer and grew into a warrior. I battled Ares to a standstill. I won war single-handedly. Then I met my wife. We were set to claim the world to immortals who wanted to bring a chaotic world some semblance of peace. And then Ares killed her, and I lost everything. And now I'm here, alone, adrift. A stranger surrounded by even stranger things. But within you, I see the spark I saw in her. A burning desire to make the world better. It makes me want to be better. And I don't know if you feel the same. 
or whether I'll get out of here, but I will fight for you. Die if I have to. I love you. And with that, Androcles, one of the greatest warriors the Foundation had ever known, sacrificed his life to blow up Site-20's nuclear reactor, destroying the facility and saving the world from Hargraves' deadly creatures. To those who knew him, especially Captain Shore, he will never be forgotten, because true heroes never really die. The perfect childhood. School is out, shoes are off, you're sprinting across the hot sandy beach, smiling for no apparent reason, because back then you didn't even need one. Did I mention there's an orange cone on your head? Where did it come from? Why is it there? What is the point? Do not think too deeply about it. There is no room for symbolism in the summer. There is no use overanalyzing the antics of teenage youth. It's just a cone, and you're just a kid, doing things for no other reason than that you want to. You're busy living, doing your thing. Responsibility is still years away. Such a pretty picture we're painting, isn't it? But this is SCP Explained, so of course by now, you figured out this is all a misdirection, didn't you? Well, here it comes. Watch closely. Look at you run, moving towards nothing as if it means everything. Look at that smile, the wind whipping through the gap in your teeth. Soak it in. In 20 years, your face muscles will have forgotten the movement. Look at you live. Yes, go on. Soak it in. You will be chasing this feeling your whole life while moving further and further away from it. Oof, depressing, isn't it? We think so too. But here is the silver lining, something you'd be wise to celebrate. At least you have this moment to look back on. The memory is with you forever. Not everyone is so lucky. Not everyone had a good childhood. Furthermore, not everyone even has a childhood at all. Some live beyond the expectations of age. Imagine a 14-year-old forced to be 40. That's not to say they have to pay taxes or can run for Senate. No, this level of forced maturity that I'm speaking of transcends the scope of average adulthood. So let's not imagine a kid going through the mundane life of a cubicle junkie, filing papers, pretending to work, and answering phone calls. Instead, let's do this. Imagine a kid going to war. Imagine a kid carrying out stealth assassination missions. Imagine a kid being locked in containment, living with little human interaction and freedom. This is all to say, imagine a kid not being a kid at all. Now this is more like an SCP Explained. This is the sad story of someone who had to say goodbye to the joys of adolescence earlier than anyone ever should have to. In fact, they didn't even get to say goodbye at all. This is the story of SCP-105. Now, to be clear, SCP-105 is not a bloodthirsty demon living in the shadows. It is not an unsquishable spider dancing across your hardwood floor, mocking the soles of your shoes as they stomp down with no success. It is not a grand piano in a hotel lobby absorbing the DNA of all who touches its keys. And it is not a freezer that tempts late night snackers to reach deeper and deeper towards an ever elusive hot fudge sundae until they are sucked in frozen solid, sold for millions and displayed as decorative ice sculptures atop the center of punch bowls at parties for rich politicians. No, we'll just have to get to those later on on a different day. Because SCP-105 is just, mm, how do I put this, a girl. Yes, a small, unremarkable looking girl. At the time of acquisition, she was just 1.5 meters tall and weighed 50 kilograms. Even those of you listening with little to no instinctual senses for converting meters and kilograms to feet and pounds can still understand this is no frightful giant we're talking about. Lining up a class by height, she'd blend in somewhere toward the middle. And if you look even closer, beyond the shallow surface of measurements and toward the details of her face, even still, you won't find a single freckle to fear. SCP-105 has blue eyes and blonde hair, nothing coastal Californians haven't seen a million times over just this Monday. Formerly known as Iris Thompson, SCP-105 has no discernible oddities. If you saw her jumping rope, you wouldn't point and stare. If you saw her at the park playing with your children, 
you wouldn't pull them away and squeeze them tight. If you saw her walking toward you on a sidewalk, you wouldn't turn around and run away in the other direction. By herself, SCP-105 is not too different from anyone else, no matter how close we zoom in on her appearance, personality, or her tendencies. There is nothing to see that triggers alarms. If you ask her to spit fire, she won't. If you conduct a lab experiment where she has to find the exit of a maze using only her sense of smell, she will get lost and fail. This is all to say if you look too closely through the microscope at SCP-105, you might miss her anomalous abilities. Instead, you'd be better off taking a step back and just watching her live her life. And that is all that she wanted to do live her life. Is that so much to ask? The first thing you will notice is that she isn't alone. And like in any good buddy-buddy film, her counterpart reveals more to her character. So who is standing by her side? Who is the co-star of this film that pushes our protagonist into the Foundation spotlight? Well, it's no person at all. It's a camera. Her camera. SCP-105-B is a Polaroid 1 Step Express, manufactured in 1982. It does not appear to have any out-of-the-ordinary physical characteristics and appears to be, for all intents and purposes, a normal Polaroid camera, operating as expected for all persons aside from SCP-105. When you point it at a subject, they don't get sucked into the lens. The flash can't blind an army of soldiers. When you say cheese, it doesn't shoot out a brick of cheddar. The camera is nothing more than a camera. That is, until it's in the hands of Iris Thompson. What's more unique than the camera itself are the photographs it produces. When SCP-105 holds a photograph taken by SCP-105-B, the picture changes from a still shot to that of a real-time image of the person, location, or object photographed. Regardless of the subject of the photograph, the image will convert itself into what appears to be a handheld live stream of whatever was pictured. Imagine a photograph of a waterfall. If held by SCP-105, you do not just see the image of a waterfall, but you will physically see the water falling, splashing down onto the rocks below. It is similar to holding your cell phone and watching a GIF. However, instead of just watching, Iris is able to interact with it in a way beyond any technology has ever allowed. SCP-105 is then able to move her arm through and into the photograph and manipulate objects within reach of the original point at which the photograph was first taken. Yes, you heard me right. SCP-105-2 doesn't just offer Iris quick prints of memories, it gives her much more, granting her access to a new dimension. Although this is clearly a unique situation for Iris, it doesn't mean that Iris is the only one affected by this anomaly. When she engages with the photographs, it actually affects the world attached to them. That is to say, there are consequences to her actions. Every photograph she has ever taken is essentially a portal to a world of problems. Witnesses who have been on the other side of the photograph while SCP-105 was manipulating it reported seeing her hand reaching out from an invisible portal and carrying on whatever actions she pleases. Once her arm is inside the photograph, she has the freedom to control the image as she wishes. This ability has obvious benefits for anyone. Imagine being able to carry around with you a photograph of your oven. Then, whenever you get that paranoid feeling that you forgot to turn it off, you can reach into the Polaroid and turn the dial how you please. But the peace of mind is just a small benefit of this power, and it's easy to assume that anyone would be tempted to use their abilities for far more than just controlling at-home kitchen appliances while on vacation. The Foundation specifically concerns itself with bigger, more ambitious uses of anomalous power. And the power in this case wasn't just in the camera. While 105-B helps Iris use her powers most efficiently, she is still able to manipulate objects through photographs taken by other cameras, though not quite as well as when she's using her favorite camera. Noting that 105-B and the photographs taken by said camera have no unusual properties when used by any other person except for SCP-105, it was clear to the Foundation who the greater anomaly in the situation really was. The tool wasn't of their interest, but rather the person wielding it. But how did this all come to their attention? Is the Foundation really investigating the life of a girl playing with a camera in her bedroom? Well, some moments are just too big to be bound by privacy. SCP-105 was brought to the forefront of the Foundation's attention, 
shortly after the murder of her boyfriend. Promptly after his death, the police investigated the scene and looked for answers. And when looking for answers, they started conjuring up questions, one of which put Iris at the center of their search. Where were you? Her response wasn't so straightforward. She wasn't there, but then she was. The police pressed further, not understanding. SCP-105 explained that she was at home, but once she learned of his death, she hurried over to him. This left the police even more suspicious, as there was no way she could have been informed of the murder by an outside source. She must have been there all along. Seeing the skepticism in their faces, SCP-105 scrambled for an explanation. She took a deep breath and got her story straight. She claimed to have been on the phone with her boyfriend at the time of the violent attack, and once she heard the commotion, it prompted her to hurry over to his location, where she saw him dead. This excuse made logical sense, and so the police dropped their suspicion. After all, Iris was just a small, innocent teenager. However, just as quickly as the police moved on from Iris, they returned to her, this time with tangible proof of their doubts. The telephone records did not correspond to her story. She was never on the phone with her boyfriend that night. It was then that SCP-105 had to confess. She informed her lawyer that she had, in fact, been there for the murder. Well, not there, but kind of there. She explained how she witnessed the murder through a photograph she had taken with her boyfriend several days prior. The attorney in question disregarded the story and recommended that the subject plead guilty. Iris, however, refused to do so. She was sticking to her truth, no matter how crazy it made her seem. She went forward and told her story in court. It was met with derision. The judge and the jury didn't even entertain the possibility of any of it being true. Iris was flustered. She was a young teenage girl fighting for her freedom, her only weapon being the truth. But the room wasn't participating in her reality. They dismissed her as crazy. And so, when Iris offered to demonstrate her ability, it was the last straw. The judge wouldn't allow Iris to waste any more of anyone's time. She was sentenced to a psychiatric ward. Iris was determined to get out of there. She knew she didn't belong. Luckily, someone else knew, too, that she didn't belong. And because of this, in a matter of days, she was out of there. But home wasn't where she was heading. No, it wasn't mom and dad picking her up from the psychiatric ward, but rather the foundation breaking her out, stealing her for themselves, and bringing her to Site 17. There at Site 17, Foundation personnel began their mission, which started with trying to convince SCP-105 that they were on her side. They began by retrieving SCP-105-B from SCP-105's home and replacing it with an identical model, only then to give it to her under the lie that it was the original. The lies wouldn't stop just there. They'd continue to pour over her reality until it was impossible for her to recognize one from the other. SCP-105's parents was informed that she was killed during the botched escape of another patient, while both were in the custody of a psychiatric care facility. In truth, though, the Foundation wants nothing more than to keep SCP-105 alive. However, they are not concerned about the quality of her living. Iris was a tool for the Foundation. She was an asset. She was a secret weapon. She had powers they could have only dreamed of. Only now, they existed. But before shooting their shiny new weapon, they needed to learn how to use it properly. But with what manual? How do you learn how to use another human? Well, having seen enough Marvel movies, they knew they would be better equipped with knowledge if they understood her origin story. So they began questioning Iris, trying to get to the root cause of her anomalous aptitude. She was either 10 or 11. She remembers because she was looking at a picture of the ocean, and she noticed that the waves began moving. Her parents said that she just had an overactive imagination. When she first was able to move objects in the photos, she was 11, 12 maybe. Her family took a trip to the Grand Canyon. She looked through the photo album after they got home, and she brushed her hand up against one by accident. When she did, she pushed a rock over the edge, falling into the canyon. She could actually hear it clatter on the way down. She became fascinated with photography after that. Most of the time, it didn't work with photographs she took, but her parents got her a Polaroid one-step express camera that she'd been begging them for since Christmas. After she got the camera, the photos got easier to interact with. After hearing her story, the researchers made her an offer. She'd be allowed certain freedoms if she agreed to use her powers to do them a few favors. She could, at least in some capacity, act her age, socialize, 
and do things a girl her grade would normally do. But in exchange, she had to first do things that nobody any age should ever have to do. Iris agreed, and it was in this agreement that we see just how desperate she was during her childhood. She was willing to risk everything for something as small as a quick conversation with a guard, five minutes of jump rope, or simply a few minutes spent under the sun. She was assigned to be part of Mobile Task Force Omega-7 to carry out a wide range of missions. And if the fate of the first humanoid SCP recruited to Mobile Task Force Omega-7 was any indication how this might play out, Iris was in a lot of trouble. The Pandora's Box initiative had a history of failure. Their previous efforts under Team Abel ended in the death of absolutely everyone. However, Team Iris began on a more hopeful note. They carried out different missions than Team Abel. Instead of violent attacks, their primary missions were reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. However, just because there were no swords and blood drawn, the missions were not so harmless. Despite Team Iris carrying out over 20 jobs in cooperation with the Bow Commission, swiftly and without incident, their streak eventually had to come to an end. The first disciplinary incident for SCP-105 involved the escalation of Team Iris missions from reconnaissance to assassinations. Yes, this teenage girl with not a violent bone in her body was tasked to kill. Note that her only power is that of manipulating photos. In her mind, this is nothing more than a party trick. It was a gift she was born with, and she was always aware that it was unique, but never did she expect it to be a curse. She liked being able to straighten books and photographs of libraries. She liked being able to read into photos and hug her teddy bear that she no longer has. She liked being able to help, heal, and embrace history, not alter it. SCP-105 violently opposed the use of her abilities to carry out assassinations. They wanted her to murder people, and like any girl of her nature would, she resisted, but they kept pressing. While some teenage girls are pressured by parents to play sports they don't particularly care for, this one was pressured to kill. During these events, SCP-105 became emotionally distressed and attempted to deceive Foundation personnel into believing that her anomalous traits had disappeared. She claimed that she couldn't carry out the missions anymore. Her doctor submitted a report recommending that SCP-105 be reclassified as neutralized, undergo amnestic treatment, and be released to the public with regular monitoring. After further investigation, the Foundation realized the doctor was prioritizing SCP-105's emotional state over the goals of the Foundation. They had built a friendship. He was the one telling her to pretend not to have powers anymore. This was all found out. Thus, his recommendation to release Iris was denied. With nothing to lose at that point, the doctor even helped Iris try to escape the Foundation's custody. But this failed. She was captured, and the doctor was promptly discharged. At that point, Iris had to start over again to regain the trust of the Foundation. In yet another compromise, she re-demonstrated her anomalous abilities in exchange for the restoration of limited privileges. Nothing more than occasionally being allowed to jump rope, getting a lollipop every Thursday, and being informed of the recent trends on TikTok. And so, this is where we know her to be. Continuously making sacrifices in exchange for tiny teaspoons of teenage life. All the while she is growing older and older, unfulfilled by the years she passes. And so while it is easy to look back on our childhood with lust and longing, at least it was there, and is still there now, safely stored in our memory, stored in the protection of the past. For Iris, this is not so. Her childhood is both behind her and in front of her. It is something she moved on from too quickly, and it is a future she fights for every day. Even when she is 97, gray, decrepit, and on her deathbed, she will be sacrificing her freedoms to feel 15. And so we have to wonder, is SCP-105 a danger to anyone at all? I leave you with a question. Are we more likely to be attacked by a dog or the master holding its leash? It has been often said that dog is man's best friend, and obviously that isn't just exclusive to men. Ask any pet owner, whether they own a dog, cat, rabbit, hamster, or soul-sucking interdimensional parasitic monster with too many tentacles, and they'll all tell you the same. Your pet can be your best friend. They can give you the most unconditional, affectionate form of love possible. And as long as you treat your little buddy right, they'll be loyal to you for the rest of your life and theirs. It's not uncommon for a pet to outlive their owner, 
especially if they belong to someone who's elderly, and that might be a sad thing to think about for some. Although, it is important to remember the positives, like how much happiness and companionship that animal would have brought an aging owner in their last years of life. Even someone younger who dies unexpectedly might have had their quality of life infinitely improved by owning a loving pet to make them smile. But on the other hand, there's the negative downside that now some pets have to live on after a tragic death, not fully understanding where their beloved owner went. So often we hear stories of dogs that waited for their master to come home, only for them to never walk through the front door again. And it's equally hard when things pan out the opposite way, and an owner loses their pet. The one silver lining is that we as human beings have a far greater understanding of death and the grief it causes. We know that eventually, despite how hard it can be to adjust to that initial heartbreaking loss, it is possible to move on and for things to one day get better. But what happens when someone can't accept the death of their beloved animal companion? When the unconditional love of their pet is suddenly missing from their life, how far will a person go to recapture that feeling? How long does it take for grief born out of love to become an unhealthy fixation? And what is the true price of obsession? Well, the answer involves SCP-589, both what it can give and just as easily take away. For as long as she could remember, and even further back than that, Erin and her dog Poncho had been inseparable. Ever since her mom had first adopted that scrappy little Jack Russell Terrier, Erin had fallen head over heels in love with that little rascal. Loving a pet is different from loving another person because they just can't help showing how much they love you back. Humans, for all their good qualities, are so nuanced and not everyone is honest with each other all of the time. But a pet, especially a dog, even though they can't speak, a bark or a whimper or excited wagging of a tail can easily tell you how they're feeling. And Poncho was no exception. Erin and her mom Cleo lived alone. It was just the two of them for quite a long time. And while Cleo had little problem with that, she couldn't help but notice how isolating it was for her daughter. From a young age, Erin had always been quiet, kept to herself at school. Her mom kept expecting her to make some friends, asked to invite them over or vice versa, but it didn't seem to be happening. It didn't seem to be bothering her daughter, but Cleo was worried that it was giving her the wrong idea, that being on her own was somehow better. So, in an effort to give Aaron at least one source of companionship, Poncho joined the family. Brown patches dotted over his white fur. He was the perfect pet, an excitable and loving little puppy that Aaron was immediately smitten with. When Cleo told her he was hers to keep, being only seven years old, Aaron broke down crying with tears of joy. Her mom had let her pick out a name for him, and she'd quickly settled on Poncho. At first, Aaron had meant to say it differently, in order to name the pup after a friendly character from her favorite animated movie, but had mispronounced it in her excitement at meeting the energetic dog for the first time. The name quickly stuck though, and as the years went on and Poncho got bigger, Aaron bought her four-legged best friend a little poncho of his own to wear when it started raining. Over the following years, Poncho became Aaron's most constant and loving companion. Even as she grew up, moving through her childhood, and found making friends a little easier with every passing year, there never came a time when she didn't need her best friend. When Erin had her first breakup in high school and came home with floods of tears in her eyes, Poncho could sense she was upset and came wandering up to her, sitting in her lap to make her feel just a little bit better. Then a few years later, when her mom got sick, Erin had to take care of her, a task that would have been much harder without Poncho there to alleviate that stress and lift her and Cleo's spirits. And when Cleo eventually passed, the little white and brown dog sat quietly with his owner as she said goodbye to her mom. Now that it was just the two of them, Aaron and Poncho were living in a tiny apartment. It was cramped for one person and a dog, but Aaron was just grateful to have a place to live in the company of her favorite pup. Besides, Poncho wasn't a puppy anymore. In fact, he hadn't raced around the park or chased a ball for quite a long time. With the numerous stresses of her everyday life, Least of all holding down two jobs in her desperate attempts to make enough money to pay rent, Aaron had hardly noticed the signs. Poncho was showing his age. It had been happening gradually in the background over the years. He wouldn't chase the ball or really move around much, 
and when he did, it was little more than a lethargic plod around the apartment. Perhaps it was because of such a measured, slower-paced change that Aaron was unable to acknowledge it. She could see her old friend was getting more tired, sleeping longer, his tail rarely wagging as much as it used to. But by now, that felt like Poncho's normal behavior. Then again, given how important her dog was to her, it's just as likely she didn't want to accept the truth that, unfortunately, nothing lasts forever. He was almost 15 in human years, which by all accounts is an impressive age for a dog, especially one of Poncho's size and breed. It was on a day that Erin was out working her morning job when it happened. The faithful, adoring Jack Russell Terrier, who had spent his years being nothing but loved and giving back only more love in return, curled up on Erin's bed. The apartment was still, silent, not a sound to be heard, save for those last, tired few breaths. Laying there, maybe the dog wondered if he'd ever get to see his friend again, if she would make it back from work in time. He closed his little brown eyes and peacefully drifted off for one last sleep. During the break between her shifts, after the end of the one at her first job and before starting her second, Erin had just enough time to get home. Usually, she had just had enough time to eat and get herself ready for the changeover, then quickly check on Poncho before having to dash back out. Poking her head into the bedroom, she saw her dog laying right there on her bed. There was a stillness to him that instantly made her stomach drop. His ears didn't move when she called his name. He didn't react when she stroked his fur. He was gone. And the moment she realized it, Erin felt like her whole world had come crashing down. The loss of her oldest and closest friend hurt almost as much as losing her mom. Erin always felt that the problem with funerals wasn't just how sad they were, or how it always seemed to rain when she went to one. Instead, it was more that they could never properly sum up just how much someone truly meant. Nobody could ever condense the year's worth of love and memories into a burial, and it was worse when losing a pet. There was no procession, no wake, nobody else there, just her and Poncho saying goodbye a final time. Eventually, things got to be too much. The heartbreak of Poncho's death was another struggle in a lifetime of lows that had all left their lasting wounds on Aaron. That, coupled with the stress of trying to carry on with a busy life, barely able to keep herself afloat in either of her jobs, had pushed her to the edge of a breakdown. Maybe that's what summoned it. Perhaps something had sensed all of Aaron's mental anguish and had come to seek her out. It might have been that her wishes for something, some little alleviation to all the pain and stress were finally being granted. Or maybe it was just a gift left by her neighbor. The sun had long since set when Erin arrived back at her apartment, stepping over the envelopes that littered her doormat, a few with words like overdue and urgent notice printed on them in red ink. Passing through the hallway, Erin paused as she always did, hoping to hear the gentle pattering of paws against the floor. Her therapist had dissuaded her from doing that, saying it would only make moving on from losing Poncho worse. She didn't care. She wanted her dog back. And opening the door to her bedroom, it seemed like someone had been listening. Sat on her bed was a stuffed animal right in the spot where she'd found her little friend on that horrible day. It had been made to look like a dog, specifically resembling a Jack Russell Terrier, with brown patches over its white fur. The plushie was even wearing a little rain poncho. The sight of it was enough to cause Erin to break down in tears, weeping in heavy sobs as she dashed across the bedroom to hold it in her arms. Hugging it tightly, her tears seeped into the soft fur as she felt it against her face. She didn't even think to question where it had even come from. All she wanted to do in that moment was hold the stuffed animal close. For the first time in what felt like years, a feeling of relief washed over Aaron. It was as if everything was melting away. The stress of work and the toll of her tiring shifts gone. All the pain from losing Cleo and Poncho dissipated too. In fact, it felt like she now had her beloved dog back. No, it was better than that. It was almost as though everything about Poncho, his energy, his spirit, the way he made her feel so calm and loved was all distilled into this stuffed animal. And now, it would never grow old, never age and die, causing her more pain. Erin gripped the soft toy tightly. The longer she held the hug for, the more her stress and sadness faded. Her face was still wet with tears. Although her sobbing had gradually become low, gentle chuckles soon giving way to a peal of uncontrollable laughter rising in volume. 
It was as though she had taken something, and the very chemistry of her brain was being altered. But after so much hardship, it felt good, to the point where she was almost lightheaded, laying down on the floor of her bedroom, arms locked around the plushie that reminded her so much of Poncho. Erin continued softly giggling to herself. Her entire body relaxed, so much so that every part of her felt like warm butter, as if she was about to start melting through the floorboards. Although she didn't know it, or probably wouldn't have even cared, her dopamine levels were spiking, flooding her with the bodily hormone that relieves stress and makes a person feel good. In fact, right now, she was feeling better than she ever had. Every day that followed, Erin would come home to her stuffed animal, her poncho too, as she liked to think of it. It didn't bother her how childlike anyone else might find it for a grown woman to rely so heavily on a plushie for comfort. At any rate, it wasn't something she was advertising to anyone else. After every shift at both of her jobs, she'd race back to her apartment, right to Poncho 2, and just sit there, just basking in the way it made her feel. It was the most all-encompassing sense of euphoria and relief, reducing her stress so much that she felt like she was floating, her body lighter than air. That feeling was all that mattered to her. Some days she wouldn't even eat. Poncho 2 was more important to her than food. Gradually, she started to become addicted to that feeling. Having to wait until the end of her work shifts to feel that rush of happy chemicals flood her brain was too long of a delay. She started to crave it while working, unable to focus, feeling erratic and restless without Poncho 2. Of course, she couldn't risk bringing it to work with her. What if someone took it, or she dropped it? Her boss might see her with a stuffed animal at her desk and fire her on the spot, or think that she was absolutely crazy. The only safe place for her source of relief was at home, but Erin knew she needed something to bridge the gap while she was working. The only substitute that worked was taking a photo of Poncho 2 on her phone, then blowing it up and printing off a copy. Erin could carry it around portably, keeping it in her pocket and taking it out to look at it every few minutes while she worked. The hit of positive chemicals it gave her wasn't quite as strong as getting to hold her stuffed animal. After all, it was just a grainy photo from her phone, essentially acting like a patch to tide her over until she could get back home to the real thing. However, it didn't take long for Erin to start taking Poncho with her anywhere that wasn't work, to the grocery store, to visit her mom and her dog, and, of course, to therapy. I'm rather concerned about this pattern of behavior. Aaron's psychotherapist, Dr. Lee, stated when her patient explained what had been happening. Sitting across on the opposite side of her office on a leather couch, Aaron had Poncho 2 pressed tightly against her. I don't care, she sighed, her brain already awash with hormones that kept her calm. I like how it makes me feel, so I don't care. Aaron, look at yourself, Dr. Lee urged. You aren't properly dealing with your grief. It seems to me you're channeling all your desire for positive emotion into this stuffed animal. Poncho 2. Erin corrected her without taking her eyes off the soft brown and white dog and its little cloak. Listen to me, the therapist insisted, trying desperately to get through to her. Poncho, your dog, your real dog, is gone. You lost him six months ago. And your mom, Cleo, she passed away too. You have to process and come to terms with those things, as sad as they might make you feel. That's how we move on. But what you're doing right now isn't healthy, Erin. It's becoming an obsession. Turning away, Erin pressed Poncho 2 up against her face. I don't care, she repeated. By now, Erin had become fully dependent on Poncho 2, showing up late for both jobs just so she could spend longer feeling those endorphins and hormones that hugging the stuffed animal seemed to bring. It didn't take long for her to start skipping entire shifts for days at a time and canceling any and all other plans just to sit at home basking in the relief brought on by her apparent obsession. Her apartment became a mess, untidied piles of mail by the front door, the walls plastered with hundreds of photos of her stuffed animal, fueling her obsession. Her evening job was the first to fire Erin, citing her recent absences as the grounds for her dismissal. Even then, she still didn't seem to care. The fact she might not be able to make rent barely registered. Returning home after her other job called her in to tell Erin she would no longer be working there either, she instantly looked around for Poncho too but it was nowhere to be found. All the photos on the walls having faded, Erin checked her phone. All the original copies of the pictures were gone too. Instantly racked with fear, so addicted to the plushie that she could barely function without it, she began tearing her apartment to shreds looking for it. 
She wrenched cupboards off their hinges and tipped over her refrigerator. Flipping her mattress, Aaron sliced the fabric open with a kitchen knife, searching high and low for Poncho too, but unable to find it anywhere. She became frantic, erratic, pulling her hair out in a fit of uncontrollable despair. Where had it gone? Had someone stolen it? Dr. Lee. The paranoia had already set in, convincing Aaron that her therapist must have taken Poncho too. She was the only other person who knew about it and had been so critical of her using it to make herself feel better. Marching into Dr. Lee's office utterly enraged beyond reason, all Aaron could think about was getting her stuffed animal back, no matter what she had to do. The effect it had on her was so powerful, so potent, and addictive, that living without it was worth anything, even another person's life. Little did Aaron realize, as her hands grew wetter, coated with more of Dr. Lee's blood after every bludgeoning strike, her therapist had no idea where Poncho too was. In fact, she had nothing to do with it vanishing in the first place. It had disappeared all on its own, along with all the photograph copies Aaron had printed. Arriving somewhere miles away, SCP-589 was ready to begin the whole cycle again on its next victim. It would take on whatever shape it needed to appease the desires of the very next person to find it, preying on their vulnerability and making them totally dependent on it. That was what it did. Everywhere it went, leeching off people that it could easily manipulate. Its presence and interaction would calm SCP-589's victims, helping to alleviate their stress or make them feel better about their deepest insecurities. Before long, these helpless victims would be able to think of nothing else, feeling as if they were unable to live without their obsession doll. And every time, that was when SCP-589 would make its cruelest move. It would vanish, leaving its prey in a state of intense withdrawal. With the calming influence of SCP-589 absent from their lives all of a sudden, the infected people would suffer from a variety of potential psychological symptoms, manic depression, psychosis, uncontrollable despair, dementia, or in Aaron's case, paranoia, and a heightened sense of aggression that caused her to murder Dr. Lee. That was one of the earliest in a spate of similar incidents that had been reported. As SCP-589 traveled from town to town, its influence spread, leaving entire populations dead in its wake. All the while, the stuffed animal fed on the mental anguish that it caused its victims, making them pay the ultimate price for their obsession. Dr. Jack Bright is a man known by many names. And whether that name is Oh God No or just Jack, if you've spent any amount of time here on SCP Explained, you've surely at least heard of the good doctor once or twice. He's a high-ranking senior staff member at Site-19, one of the Foundation's most notable facilities, and has served as a director and important member of the Foundation's upper ranks for decades. Of course, you wouldn't be able to tell that by looking at him, because depending on the current circumstances, Dr. Bright might not look a day over 13, or 80, or 90, or he might just be a chimpanzee. This is because Dr. Bright, in his younger days, came into contact with SCP-963, a metal amulet that gives its wearer's consciousness immortality. When the amulet is moved from one body to another, Dr. Bright's consciousness moves with it, allowing him to occupy a variety of bodies. From animals to old ladies, Dr. Bright has been them all. Heck, Bright's body-swapping abilities have even proven themselves to be incredibly useful for the Foundation, so the guy's able to get some actual work done when he's not goofing off. In undercover operations, Dr. Bright has been used to infiltrate areas that the Foundation would typically have trouble reaching, or when clandestine operations are the best course of action. In the 2000 United States election, Dr. Bright briefly occupied the body of George Bush in order for the Foundation to investigate political opponent Al Gore's activities without suspicion. But that mess is a story for another day. Today, we're going to be taking a look at a different side of Dr. Jack Bright, one that isn't so overt, one that's lurking behind the joking facade and silly antics so commonly associated with Bright's identity. This is SCP Explained, and we'd like to welcome you into the complicated, dramatic, and ultimately tragic world of the Bright family, specifically the story of SCP-590. Your consciousness being immortal certainly has its perks. For one, you can't die. On the other hand, you can't die. We all know the old cliché about immortality, 
how your friends and loved ones will grow old and die off while you'll stay the same age. How centuries will start to feel like months. How your mind will eventually crumble under the weight of countless years and experiences, because no man was made to live this long. But while it is cliché for us, it's reality for Dr. Bright. He's painfully aware of how futile his situation is, and behind closed doors, it scares him. Dr. Bright struggles intensely with existential depression, and for good reason, too. Right now, he might be fine, but in the relatively near future, he'll start experiencing that cycle of death and rebirth of those around him and himself. And over time, that cycle will just keep repeating. Body after body, friend after friend, tragedy after tragedy. In the long term, Dr. Bright knows that his life cannot have a happy ending. It's most likely because of this biting, inevitable future that Bright makes the most of his time with those around him in the Foundation, making himself known as a charming, goofy personality, brimming with quirks and zaniness. The part of Bright that makes others laugh does so because deep down, Bright needs something to take his mind off his situation. He wants the same type of familiarity and comfort that he brings to other people. But Bright's public-facing persona is often torn to shreds in private. On top of being an undying soul, Bright has to contend with an even more stressful experience, his family. The Bright family is a colorful assortment of old blood that has run the inner circle of the anomalous world for generations. There are members of the Bright family that were there when the first administrator signed the policy that created the SCP Foundation, members who serve time on the Overseer Council, and even those who operate outside of the parameters of the Foundation. Dr. Bright is just one among many other individuals of major anomalous significance in his bloodline and it's only fitting that every family has its issues. For the Brights, all strong personalities who hold positions of power in various places across the anomalous world, unity isn't exactly a strong point. In fact, most of the family isn't anywhere near each other, each member existing in their own bubble, working towards their own individual goals that often do not align with the rest of their kin. But there are occasions when the Bright family all come together to sneer at one another from across the table and enjoy a nice, loving reunion, though these meetings are often called out of necessity and are far and few between. This gathering of anomalous individuals is deemed important enough by the Foundation to have its own designated security term, nicknamed Code Brown. When a Code Brown is issued, it can only mean that the Brights are locked away in a room, convening, arguing, and scheming over something of great importance to them, and the rest of the world should stay out of their family business. And when Jack Bright got his latest call for a family meeting from one of the family members he was on speaking terms with, he could only think of just how bad of an idea that was. It had been quite some time since Bright saw the rest of his family, and he didn't particularly look forward to when they would meet again. In the time since then, Bright had been taking care of TJ, his younger brother whose story is nearly as tragic as Jack's. Don't worry, we'll get back to the events of the family reunion soon enough. For now, let's have a look at TJ Bright. TJ was a product of the cruel, brutal attitude the early Foundation took out on the objects it contained. Needlessly cold containment procedures that denied basic needs for human anomalies, pointless tests that often resulted in death, or worse, and a general lack of regard for decency or ethics. This archaic era would come to an end upon the formation of the Ethics Committee, a board formed in the upper ranks of the Foundation that would enforce a better treatment of the objects contained by the organization with severe consequences for those that disobeyed the new, more human doctrine. But in the case of T.J. Bright, there was nothing the committee could do. T.J., who had been given the designation of SCP-590 long ago, was an ordinary person who happened to have anomalous abilities, like countless others that the Foundation had dealt with before. He appeared to be permanently 16 years old, never aging or changing in appearance once during his time in containment. The abilities in question that had caught the attention of the Foundation were TJ's inherent power to cure illness. Physical, mental, injuries, and wounds, TJ could cure them all with just a touch of his hand, but at an unfortunate cost. Whatever injury TJ would cure, it would be mirrored onto his own body. A giant gaping wound could be healed by TJ, 
but the after effects of such, such as scar tissue and any lasting side effects, would later appear on his own body, leaving the boy to feel the pain of everyone he touched and healed. The early Foundation needlessly exploited the SCP-590's abilities in tests and procedures, testing the limits of TJ's body and its abilities. This, of course, was carried out without the knowledge of his brother, Dr. Bright, who at the time did not have enough pull or power within the organization to save his brother. He could only watch and hope that one day, SCP-590 could live a better life outside of his cell as T.J. Bright, and not a number on a placard to be experimented with so casually. The Foundation's experiments with T.J. sometimes involved the use of SCP-500, an all-curing panacea that would fully heal SCP-590 and bring him back to full health, a state that would later be reverted when the Foundation started their experiments with the boy once again. T.J. had endured immeasurable pain, and as a result had suffered a broken mental state over the years. As time went by and things within the Foundation had started to change, including Jack Bright's prominence, he worked as hard as he could to push through bureaucratic red tape and work out a solution that would leave TJ in a less torturous position. And when the time came, it was Jack Bright who made the call to have SCP-590 cure a variety of specific mental conditions that would leave the boy in a dulled state unable to fully comprehend the pain he endures, should the Foundation ever have to utilize TJ's abilities again. Bright's decision to do this to his brother was questionable, and a part of the doctor regrets it to this day. But at the time, it seemed like a more preferable option than having SCP-590 be fully aware of what was happening to him. Unfortunately, the idea that TJ's reduced mental capacities would prevent him from understanding what was occurring to him was a misunderstanding, and TJ was still more than capable of perceiving what was happening to him. And that was pain. He knew he was being hurt. He knew he wasn't loved. And even though his mind was unlike Bright's or those who experimented with him, he felt the same things they did. By the time of the reunion, TJ was fully in the care of Dr. Bright, Eventually, the Modern Foundation worked out that it was doing the poor boy more harm than good to keep him locked up in a cell all day. And Bright, who was now one of the most notable and important individuals in the Foundation, was able to pull enough strings to get TJ out of confinement. Now he could truly rest without worry that he would be exploited and abused, safe alongside his older brother. Inside the meeting room, all of the famous figures of the Bright family well, the ones that were alive at least, were there. Dr. Bright sat alongside TJ, who occupied himself with a coloring book and a set of crayons. From across the table was Mikhail Bright, better known as Overseer 05-6, a former Foundation agent who operated under the name of Cowboy. 05-6 was a hardened individual with a heavy interest in firearms and a whole lot of luck on his side. Mikhail and Jack, almost at the same time, both fired out remarks about how bad of an idea they felt this reunion was. The one who called the reunion was their elder sister, Claire Bright, whose aged body felt notably out of place among the collection of forever young Brights, whether it was Jack's body hopping, TJ's longevity, or Mikhail's use of SCP-006, the Overseer Council's fountain of youth, to keep himself young for an extended period of time. Also present was Yorick Elroy, Jack Bright's grandson. As the three of them discussed the state of Claire Bright's apparent aging situation, Yorick remarked that he thought she was involved with that incident at Site-23. This, Dr. Bright knew, was referring to an incident he'd rather forget, where a reality bender contained by the Foundation attempted to give the Bright family, himself, Mikhail, and TJ included, a happy ending where they would be cured of their ailments and allowed to live ordinary lives. Of course, this was just the product of a reality bend, and the fantasy quickly fell apart when the Brights realized what was going on. Jack rather not dwelt on what could have been. Across from York was Foundation agent Sarah Argent, one of the youngest members of the Bright family, who worked as an Overseer Council's Hand Sinister, a special title granted to an assassin used by the Council to sort out messy business for them. The previous Hand Sinister was none other than Mikhail Bright, whose pearl revolvers that came with the position now belonged to Sarah. Mikhail was growing impatient and asking how long it would take for the rest of the family to show up, the rest of the family being the Brights that weren't involved in the Foundation. 
the powerful individuals who had worked their way into various groups of interest and aspects of the anomalous world. While some directly opposed the Foundation and its mission and others were neutral, they were all brights, which meant their presence was necessary. While the two sides sometimes worked together, there was always an air of bad blood and poor trust between them. Dr. Bright, in particular, was not looking forward to the rest of this meeting. The first to arrive was an individual named Nobody, who the Foundation had a difficult time keeping up with. Nobody was a title granted from one person to the next, who each worked towards a greater plan that only Nobody knew the specific details of, leaving the Foundation completely unaware of the group's larger interests. Nobody's voice was impossible to source, and her appearance was even harder to pin down, but she was there. Nobody circled around the table, remarking that the other side of the family had sent her first to make sure the Foundation Brights were all abiding by the rules. At one point in time, Nobody did have another name, but in becoming the next Nobody, she left her previous life behind. The next to arrive was Claire Lumineux II, a human with electromagnetic abilities whose motives were largely unknown. When she pulled back the chair to sit down, sparks flew in the air, briefly startling the rest of the room. After that came David Blindman, a gruff, sunglass-wearing member of the Serpent's Hand, a group of anomalous individuals who worked to free anomalies from the confinements of the Foundation, who they call Jailers. Blindman was Mikkel's son, and possessed the anomalous ability to see into the future. He was the unofficial representative of the Unnumbered Brood, a subsection of the Bright family consisting of Mikkel's illegitimate children from his wilder days as a free-roaming Foundation agent, and a constant reminder to the overseer of his past. Naturally, Mikkel was less than pleased to see his son arrive. And then there was Evelyn Navon, who levitated into the room wearing a traditional hijab and dress. Evelyn was one of the original 13 founding members of the SCP Foundation, and matriarch of most of the Bright family. Unfortunately, Evelyn was kicked off the council for reasons unknown, but rumor has it that it had something to do with her terrible experiments as a genius geneticist, creating monsters by splicing the DNA of the ordinary and the anomalous. She sold her work to groups of interest such as Dr. Wondertainment or Prometheus Labs, who benefited from having such fine test subjects to work with. Her current activities are largely unknown, but as the rest of the family knew, they couldn't be anything good. The final member of the Bright family to enter was the only one who was trusted by all of them, and was a man of many, many names, who was most commonly referred to as Tamlin. Tamlin was a mysterious individual who existed for centuries, far longer than any other member of the family. He had something to do with time, but no one was quite sure of what it was that he did, but they all knew that he was important and that he was the only one who attempted to keep peace and balance between the various factions of the family. Tamlin took a mental count of the room, realizing that everyone was present and addressed them all, ready to explain why they were there. Collectively, the family came to realize that the one who called the meeting, Claire Bright, was not there. Tamlin solely explained that she had passed away, and he had called the family together in her steed to present a videotape containing her dying wish. The tape was concocted through Claire and Tamlin's time shenanigans, and featured a recording of Claire who, through Tamlin's abilities to travel through and control time, was able to respond and interact with the members of the family in the room. As morbid as Dr. Bright felt this was, he would make sure to treasure this final interaction with his sister. Claire's recording contained her will, and with Tamlin's help, she distributed gifts to the other members of the family, final remembrances she had collected from across the anomalous world for them to cherish. An egg with a universe inside of it for Evelyn, the literal sword of Damocles to hang over Mikkel's head, Jack Bright's first ever bottle of whiskey that he made so many years before, documents she entrusted to her daughter, Claire II. When it came time for TJ's gift, however, the boy suddenly grew serious and declined it. The recording of Claire understood and stated that if he didn't want it, then she would instead have Tamlin give it to someone who needed it. Dr. Bright could only wonder what it was that she had planned to give TJ, but it seemed like the boy's selfless nature had won again, and he was unable to accept it. After the gifts had been distributed, the tape cut out. Tamlin stated that this was all that Claire had recorded, and that she wanted her death to bring the family together once again, 
to remind them all that they were family. Claire's sincerity had brought the room to silence. Each member of the family engaged in deep thought. As Tamlin gave parting remarks, one by one, each member left. Mikkel was embarrassed by the ordeal, immediately trying to revert back to his overseer mindset, but he couldn't. Claire's loss was already affecting him. In the end, there was only Tamlin, who left a single blue rose on top of the VCR player that contained Claire's recording in remembrance of someone he felt almost understood him. As Dr. Bright left the meeting, he still felt conflicted about his family, but at the very least, he felt there was progress being made. After all, they had all been in the same room for more than 10 minutes without trying to kill one another. He glanced at the boy at his side, wondering if he made the right decision all those years ago. While that much and most of his job with the Foundation was uncertain, he knew one thing for a fact. He had to protect TJ. You would think the smell would be the worst part. And don't get me wrong, it was far from pleasant to say the least. That pungent odor, a stomach-turning scent like raw sewage. It wasn't just dirt and decay, no, it was far more disgusting than that. It had that awful metal tang to it. That meant when that awful stench crawled its way up your nose, it lingered, hanging at the back of your throat, choking you on the sickening reek that lay thick in the air like a foul-smelling fog. And yet, like I said, that was far from the worst part. What was? Well, even the sight of what had happened to him wasn't what made me feel unsettled. Hardly any of his body was visible, covered in that writhing, shifting cloak. But I could see it move, each tiny piece of the mass moving on its own. It made me imagine what it must have felt like to have all those little scratchy legs and pinchers, claws and teeth hooking into his skin. And that, the idea of what it would feel like. That was the worst part about seeing the vermin god. City life isn't really all it's cracked up to be. Ask anyone who lives in a big urban area, and they'll likely tell you the same. Those bright lights and tall spires reaching up to the clouds, they offer the promise of prosperity, opportunity, and even fame and fortune for those who are extra naive. But when they upped sticks, packed their bags, and moved here to start a new life, they realized that all along, they had been sold on a dream, a false fantasy that is just simply too good to be true. Of course, by the time they get here, it's already too late. And before they know it, they're knee-deep in debt, trying to keep up with paying rent on an apartment that's barely big enough for one person. If you aren't careful, a big city can swallow you up, sometimes literally. Never mind just desperately trying to make ends meet and keep yourself afloat. There's also plenty of danger to be found in the heart of the city. It doesn't take much for people to lose themselves in the darker parts of this metropolitan hell pretending it's a haven. And when they do, that's usually where my job starts. I've been working as a private investigator for coming up on a decade. My specific job title had gone through a number of rebrands and different combinations of terms over the years. Cassius Duke, detective for hire, then private eye and freelance investigator after that. And don't fall under the same sort of assumptions that most people do when they hear all those terms. Believe me, just like the city's promises, it rarely lives up to what you'd imagined it to be like. My life was never high-speed chases and gunfights, solving murders and tracking down crooks that robbed banks in clown masks. That was work for the real police, allegedly much higher above my pay grade now that I had quit. Most of the time I dealt with uncovering the various dirty little secrets this grimy city had to offer. More often than not, my job was working as either a spy or enforcer that anyone could hire. I followed around the rivals of wealthy businessmen, snapping photos of them with my camera to get any dirt I could that my more unethical clients would probably use for blackmail. Or I'd be warning stalkers to keep away from whoever they were causing trouble for, usually with a bit of gentle encouragement in the form of some pretty stern words and a rap on the knuckles of sorts. It was ugly work, but that suited just how ugly the underside of this whole city was. Some of my clients were often desperate people, folks who the ordinary system of law and order had failed. When that happened, when they had been turned away by the cops on the verge of losing any hope they had left, that was usually when they turned to me for help. Now, I don't work for free, of course. You get nothing for nothing. Everything's got its price, so on and so forth. But I wasn't looking to extort people, especially at their lowest moments. So, firm but fair, 
I'd charge them a little bit for my time. Maybe a finder's fee if I happened to come across some dirt that was really worth some extra cash. It was rare for me to take on a job pro bono, as it were, without expecting any pay for my services. But when this case landed in my lap, I felt obligated to do the job for free. It was another gray day in a gray city. A knock on the door interrupted me from my busy schedule of staring at the paint flaking off my ceiling. After I'd called them through, the person responsible for that knock came stepping cautiously into my office. He told me his name was Martin Jenkins, but that his friends called him Marty. Sorry, I, I don't really know how all this works, Martin admitted, making no attempt to mask how nervous he was. Well, why don't you take a seat first, I sighed. That's a start. Oh, uh, okay, he replied, awkwardly pulling up a chair and sitting down opposite my desk. So, Mr. Jenkins, what can I... Marty, he interjected. Mr. Jenkins, I repeated. What is it that brings you here? Well, someone said you might be able to help with my, um, problem? Martin said sheepishly. And what sort of problem are you having, Mr. Jenkins? I pushed for him to give me a straight answer. I didn't really have a lot of patience for anyone who wasted time just getting to the point. Uh, it's my brother, you see. The other, Mr. Jenkins, he finally confessed. He's been missing. It's actually been months now. A missing person's case is a police matter. I'm sorry, but you'll have to go to them. As bad as it felt turning the guy down at a time like this, I had my profession to protect. If I wasn't careful, the cops would come down on me like a ton of bricks. I'd already ruffled up some feathers in that area not long before. I'd taken a case wherein I'd accidentally photographed some corrupt officers accepting bribes. One of those pictures wound up on the evening news. There'd been a target on my back ever since. But Detective Duke, Martin began to say. Mr. Duke, I corrected him. I've already tried going to the police. They wouldn't ex even accept a, a missing persons case when I explained what happened to my brother. Go on. I said, reaching for my notebook and a pen on the desk. I left the city a while ago after my brother and I, Melvin, his name's Melvin Jenkins. We, we had an argument. And what was it that triggered this argument? I asked, dragging my pen across the page. It was, well, a lot of things, Martin sighed. Our father died almost a year ago. It wasn't unexpected, but Mel took it pretty hard. Then the doctors told us the condition Dad had carried a chance of being hereditary, so we both went to get tested. I didn't show any signs of developing it, but Melvin did. He took it as a death sentence, got very low, and started wasting all of our inheritance on every vice he could get his hands on. Drinking, partying, gambling, you name it, he was doing it. And this led to the argument? I probed. It did. I confronted him before I left town. I was mad that he'd been using all our dad left us for such frivolous and irresponsible things. Marvin continued his story, almost unable to stop now he started. He didn't want to hear any of it. Said he was going to die eventually anyway, so what was the point? Then I told him he was selfish, and that was the last time we spoke. When did you notice he was missing? As soon as I came back from out of town, he answered. I went to the apartment. Dad had left us that too, along with all the payments still due, and I found that Mel was gone. Apparently, he had bet in a card game and lost badly. I had no way of finding him. Nobody else knew where he was. Let me guess. I stepped in. When you went to the police, they said he's most likely living on the street, which would make him a lot harder to find. Martin nodded solemnly, clearly feeling guilty for what had happened. Although from where I was sitting, it was his brother's own misgivings that had created this situation. I went on to ask a few more background questions before asking if Mr. Jenkins could provide me with a photo of his missing brother. He obliged, handing over a printed picture. The moment I saw it, I offered to take the case for free. His brother, Melvin. I recognized him almost instantly. He was in his mid or possibly late thirties. Average height and build in the picture, far better shape and a lot cleaner than when I'd seen him. But it was that same guy, that much I was sure of. No amount of unshaved stubble or disheveled clothing could change that. I had seen him, seen Melvin, outside my building a few times, sleeping rough on the sidewalk. Every day that I showed up to start another day of work, I'd drop him a few dollars, anything I had in my wallet. At first, I told myself it was for good luck, so I didn't attract any bad karma for myself, but when I actually paid attention to how he was living, the gesture became what it should have been from the start. It wasn't about me or sparing myself bad luck, it was just about trying to help out someone who needed it when I was in a position to do him a small kindness at the very least. One night I'd just locked up my office and I was about to head home. As I stepped off the curb, head down, eyes on my phone, a truck came speeding down the street. 
I would have been killed instantly had a hand not grabbed me and pulled me back onto the sidewalk. Melvin had hauled me out of harm's way. He didn't say anything to me, and I failed to do anything more than just thank him verbally before heading home. So, I figured I owed him one. While I didn't tell his brother this, it had been a few months since I last seen Melvin outside my building. I'd always assume he moved on, or been asked to move by an overzealous cop. Of course, that meant figuring out where he was going was going to be tricky. Exactly the reason the police had turned Martin away when he'd asked them for help locating his brother. But I had a few connections that, even if they hadn't seen Melvin, might have at least heard something, or could know someone else that had seen him. It wasn't a lead yet, but it was a start. Dee was the head of the city's biggest homeless shelter, and a good friend of mine. So she became my first port of call. I showed her the photo of Melvin, and asked if he'd come to stay at the shelter recently. Doesn't ring a bell, I'm afraid. She looked somberly at the picture. Sorry, Duke. I wish I could be more help. Not on you, I replied, taking the photo as she handed it back to me. You mind if I ask around, see if anyone here recognizes him? Be my guest, Dee said. I spent about an hour milling around, asking a few down-on-their-luck folks if they recognized the man in the photo. A few of them mentioned they'd seen him around here and there, sleeping rough in a number of different parts of the city, but none of them could give me anything concrete, no definite location I'd be able to search next. That was until one of them spoke up. He was an older guy, bedabbled clothes and unwashed hair with a thick beard, who had been craning his neck to try and sneak a look at the photo when I'd been showing someone else. I seen him, the man, Clarence, said matter-of-factly. You recognize this man? I asked to verify. Said I seen him, he repeated. Looks different now, though. Well, that's to be expected, I replied. I don't mean he's gotten skinnier because he ain't been eaten, Clarence said in retort. I mean that he don't even look like he's human no more. But what does that mean? I questioned, looking back at the bearded man in confusion. That man right there stopped being a man. No idea when or how it happened, but last time I saw him, it was already too late. Nowadays, he's the vermin god. I didn't really have much of an idea of how to respond. Unsure if Clarence was pulling my leg and deliberately wasting my time, or if there was some truth to this bizarre urban legend. At any rate, it was the only real lead I had so far, albeit a tenuous one at best. So I pressed the old man to tell me where he'd seen Melvin, of this vermin god, as he kept calling him. There's an abandoned warehouse down on the waterfront, Clarence had explained. I knew the place he meant. It used to be a go-to for people who were sleeping rough. Lots of us used to stay there, but that's when the pests got bad. Pests? What kind of pests? All kinds. Rats, roaches, you name it. Then just we were having to deal with them, the company that owned the building sent cops down to clear us out, told us it was unsafe and we should move on. It was sitting there, empty for ages, so I decided to chance it, head down there and see if we could start using the place again. But when I went to look, he was there, waiting in the dark. And he wasn't alone. He ain't ever alone. They're always with him, all around him. I chose to ignore Clarence's attempts at unnerving me getting him to confirm once again that it was in fact Melvin he had seen. My next call was following up on this wild story, so so I hopped on to the next bus across town, huddled together with commuters, holding on to ceiling rails swaying with every turn of the bus like we were meat hanging in the back of a butcher's van. I walked quite a bit from the bus stop towards the docks. Most of the area was restricted, off limits to members of the general public given how hazardous it could be. I wasn't concerned. In my line of work, I usually had to get into places I wasn't supposed to be. Pulling a pair of wire cutters from my jacket pocket, I snipped through the chain-link fence that surrounded the warehouse Clarence had directed me to. The place wasn't guarded. After all, it was empty. Lifting up the wire mesh and slipping underneath through the gap, I grabbed my flashlight and headed in. The warehouse was well and truly deserted, previously used for storage, but now just an empty space that was being left vacant, wasted in its lack of use. All around was silence, occasionally broken by beads of water dripping from the skylight into a puddle on the ground. Suddenly I heard a new noise, a crunch of something being squashed under the sole of my shoe. I lifted my foot and shone my torchlight downwards, looking to see what I'd just stepped on. It was a cockroach, far bigger and fatter than any one I'd ever seen, smashed to pieces underneath my shoe. I stamped the rest of it off, a little disgusted as how everyone gets when they see a roach, dead or alive. That's when I noticed another sound, a low, dull buzzing. My initial thought was that it was electrical, maybe a generator that was still running. I started searching around for the source of the sound, 
thinking that if I could flip the switch, it might turn on some lights in here that would make searching for Melvin a little easier. Suddenly, as I turned a corner, the buzzing sound got louder. It wasn't just closer, it was angrier, more intense. What was worse was that I'd walked directly into a cloud of something, or lots of somethings. Tiny flies were whizzing past my ears, the noise of their wings so close it was almost deafening. Meanwhile, even more were zipping around my face, landing on my skin and rubbing their little germ-coated legs together. Waving my arms wildly, I tried my best to disperse the swarm, clearing a few of them away as I tumbled into the next room. My flashlight clattered to the floor as I crawled over to pick it back up, blindly swatting more of the insects away in the dark. That's when I saw him, the vermin god. With no light in the room, only the beam from my flashlight, I hadn't noticed it at first. The second the light fell over the writhing mass, it shifted. As a matter of fact, it didn't stop moving, not once. It was a seething assortment of vermin, mostly black rats, their fur wet with what I could only assume was water straight from the sewer. But there was more. Worms, huge spiders, thick roaches dropping off of the huge shape as it turned. It stood up, a mass of animals and insects standing like a man lumbering towards me. Creatures were falling off with every step, only to crawl back in and join the rest. I pushed myself back on the floor trying to get away from what I assumed to be a horrific monster, something controlling all the rats and vermin, making them form around it like a cloak of pure filth and decay. The stench of it as well, that foul, unclean smell hanging in the air and lingering at the back of my throat made me want to be sick. It was so repugnant that it kept me crawling back until my back was pressed up against the wall trapping me between it and the vermin god. It leaned closer, reaching out an arm covered in grime and cockroaches all crawling over each other. I turned away and closed my eyes, yelling out into the dark for anyone to come and help, a voice said weakly. I looked up at it, panting and shaking in fear. With trembling fingers, I lifted my flashlight higher, right up to the head of the vermin god. Beneath the mass of rats crawling over it and the bugs wriggling about below them, a pair of eyes glinted in my flashlight's beam. Human eyes. They were eyes I'd seen before. The same hopelessness behind them as when he used to ask for change outside my building. It was Melvin. That's when I started to see beneath the vermin coating his body, catching brief glimpses of his arms and chest, just as one rat moved, but before another slipped in and took its place. His skin was pockmarked with bites and scratches some fresh and still bleeding, others that had started to dry. Beneath the shroud of crawling insects and rodents, his face had gotten gaunt, coated in a thick layer of dirt. He wasn't controlling these things. If anything, the vermin seemed to be using him as some kind of host. Just as I edged a little closer to him, considering the idea of reaching into the mass and pulling Melvin free, one of the rats bit me. I dropped my torch at the pain of the tiny needly teeth piercing my skin and started to feel more of them crawling up my ankles. I turned heel and ran all the way out of the warehouse. By the time I was far enough away, the rats that had leapt onto me had crawled back off, heading back inside into their vermin god. Now go and check out SCP-1025, Encyclopedia of Common Diseases, and SCP-3760 Like a Doll's Eye for more sickening stories of other anomalous illnesses that are guaranteed to make your skin crawl. Or maybe that's just the rats you're feeling.